first off, you don't want people to realize what it is, because if they start realizing what it is, they're going to figure other things out, and you don't want them looking at it at all in the first place. But if they are looking at it, you want them scared out of their minds. Along the way, uh, they were deciding how best to eventually disseminate this material. They had a two-pronged problem. The first problem was, we need to keep it secret. And the second problem was, eventually, we're not going to be able to keep it secret. So how do we deal with this? And the answer was, you use misinformation and disinformation in order to keep people confused and off balance. And eventually, you're also kind of seeding in some actual information there from more credible sources so that they can begin learning about it along the way. And then in a very gradual process, by the time it does become public, it's not so much of a shock to everybody. Which is exactly what we're talking about here. If I take a, a ridiculous flying saucer movie or some other kind of movie and put accurate information in it, no one's going to believe it because it's coming from Gilligan's Island. And now, ladies and gentlemen, Banal of America Audio, with your host, Tim Banal. What is going on, my friends? This is Tim Banal of BanalofAmerica.com with another edition of BOA Audio Season 4. This week on the program, we kick off what has to be one of the most anticipated interviews, really, in the history of the program. Our guest is the amazing Bruce Rux. He is the author of the mind-blowing book, Hollywood vs. the Aliens. And he's joining us here on the program for an extended conversation that we're calling the Rux Trilogy, a three-episode arc that totals nearly six hours of material and making this even more remarkable is that this is his first interview since the year 2000, nearly a decade. And that really makes the whole interview cool for me because now we're sort of introducing Bruce Rux to a whole new generation of people and reintroducing him to many, many people who enjoyed his books and have kind of been wondering where he's been at for so long. I have to give Bruce Rux huge props here and huge thanks. He has to be easily one of the most generous guests we've ever had on the program. Essentially, we tape the interview over the course of three weeks in two-hour installments, pretty much how you're going to be hearing the show yourself. We would do about two hours, and there'd always be a lot of notes left. And Bruce would say, hey, let's just do it again next week, same time. And that's what we did. And when you're dealing with Hollywood vs. the Aliens, this is a 600-page book, my friends. This thing is massive. And as I said, Bruce hasn't done an interview in nearly a decade. So as you can imagine, we had a lot to talk about in this marathon interview. Now here this week, you're going to be hearing Volume 1, which we're calling The Prelude. And the reason we gave it that subtitle is because really it sets the stage for the whole interview, sort of lays down the foundation of the Rux trilogy and what Hollywood vs. the Aliens is all about. This week we're going to be covering Bruce's general thesis behind the book, and that is that the government and intelligence agencies within the government have been using films and television shows in a concerted effort to shape the public's understandings and feelings on the UFO phenomenon. Throughout sort of the first half here of Volume 1, we're going to be covering the basic tenets, which Bruce believes to be at work behind the UFO enigma, including E.T. Greys as robots, ancient astronauts, mind control used in abductions, and a Mars-Martian connection. We're then going to move into the beginnings of this education program, as Bruce sees it, with the 1938 Orson Welles' War of the Worlds radio broadcast. We're going to hear about the few thoughtful UFO-related films of the early 1950s. From there, we're going to talk about how things just flipped on a dime right after the Robertson panel with a huge wave of silly UFO movies that began in 1953 and went well on into the 1960s, if not beyond. And wrapping up the conversation this week, we're going to talk about the change that happened in the early 1960s with thoughtful TV programming coming about regarding the UFO phenomenon, specifically the series The Outer Limits. So that's all here in Part 1, as we said, the prelude. Volumes 2 and 3, I'll preview those for you at the end of the episode because I know you want to hear from Bruce Rocks. You've been waiting 
quite a long time to hear from Bruce, and you're going to be hearing from him here in just a moment. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Bruce Rux, allow me to give you a little bit of background on him. He sent me a richly detailed bio, and I'm just going to sort of hit the highlights here for you. Definitely want to stop by the BOA audio show page for volume one or two and three to get a look at Bruce Rux's bio. But here's sort of the highlights. Bruce Rux was an actor for 20 years. He's still current on his actor's equity card, though he hasn't performed on stage since the early 1990s. He appeared in perhaps 80 shows, winning numerous acting awards in several states. He's also an accomplished and award-winning playwright, having written several plays. For the past 10 years, he's been an upscale security officer, USO, for Wackenhut. Bruce has studied UFOs his entire life. After the Mars Observer probe failure of August 1993, Bruce wrote to share his findings with several researchers in the field and with a few elected representatives. As a result, he found himself invited on ancient astronaut author Zachariah Sitchin's first tour of Egypt in the spring of 1994. It was during that trip that Bruce decided to write a book containing the results of his own UFO research and conclusions, which resulted in Architects of the Underworld, Unriddling Atlantis, Anomalies on Mars, and the Mystery of the Sphinx, published in 1996. The following year, he wrote a companion volume that turned out to be even more massive, Hollywood vs. the Aliens, the motion picture industry's participation in UFO disinformation. Both were published by Frog Books in Berkeley, now part of Random House, and are available via Amazon.com. Unfortunately, Bruce does not have a website. He has no web presence, so I can't give you a website to plug here. All I can say is go to Amazon.com and pick up Hollywood vs. the Aliens, pick up Architects of the Underworld. I was completely blown away by Hollywood vs. the Aliens, and I think... After hearing the Rux trilogy, you will be too, and you're going to want to read it yourself. I can almost guarantee you that next season, Bruce Rux will be back on the show to talk about Architects of the Underworld, so you may want to stay ahead of the curve right now and pick that up as well. And now, without any further ado, let's rock and roll. This installment was recorded on May 22nd, 2009. Bruce Rux, talking about Hollywood vs. the Aliens, on BOA Audio, Season 4. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another edition of Mall of America Audio. Prepare yourselves for what will definitely be a marathon conversation. I can tell you that right off the bat. Our guest is the amazing Bruce Rux. He's the author of Hollywood vs. the Aliens and Architects of the Underworld. Uh, I haven't got my hands on Architects yet, but I will soon, and hopefully we'll be talking about that in Season 5. But here, for this super lengthy conversation, we're going to be talking about Hollywood vs. the Aliens a whole look at the motion picture industry's participation in UFO disinformation over the course of a multi decades. We're talking, oh, geez, you know, turn of the century stuff all the way up to 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and up to the late 90s, all in Hollywood versus the aliens. So we got a lot to talk about. <laughs> and uh, the really cool part about this interview, too, was much like our Swedish ufology guest, ironically enough, who we had a couple weeks ago. The idea of bringing Bruce on the show came to me from a BOA Audio listener who wrote to me way back in uh, December of 2006, believe it or not. So well, this is a two-and-a-half-year uh, interview in the making. And, you know, so I sort of put Bruce in the basket of folks to get in touch with, and, and we wrapped up Season 2, and I was like, where's Bruce Rux? I can't find him anywhere. He hasn't done any interviews in a while. He doesn't have a website or anything. I mean, this guy's off the grid, and uh, I couldn't be happier for him because, to be honest with you, if I could get off the UFO grid, I'd be happy sometimes. But <laughs> but he was off the grid, and, I, you know, I couldn't find this guy. So fast forward, a year goes by. We're close to wrapping up Season 3, and finally I get a hold of Bruce Rux. I find him after, you know, a Boba Fett-esque hunt for Bruce Rux. I finally track him down. And then I got my hands on the book, and it's like 600 pages. So we had to put Bruce on the back burner so I could really sit down and read this book, first of all, and digest it, because it's a massive tome that uh, he should be really proud of, because it's amazing. And it's the kind of book that I wish I could have written. So, you know, we talked way back during season three, and he said, you know, let's do it when you have some time, and, and when you're ready to really uh, rock this thing out, and finally... You know, here we are for season four, wrapping it up, and uh, I'm so excited to have him on the show. His book's amazing. Hasn't done an interview, as far as I can tell, anywhere uh, since the summer of 2000. So this is his first interview in almost a decade, 
and I'm just thrilled that we could bring Hasn't done an interview, as far as I can tell, anywhere uh, since the summer of 2000. So this is his first interview in almost a decade, and I'm just thrilled that we could bring him here on the program and really present to you an amazing amount of material. This is going to be a showcase uh, for the ages, my friends. Bruce Rux, after an introduction like that, I don't know what else to say. Thank you for coming on Banal of America Audio. I'm really looking forward to talking to you. My pleasure. Pleased to be here. Before we dive into Hollywood versus the aliens, for all those folks you know, who aren't familiar with you and, and don't know about what you are all about and what you've been up to, why don't you tell people who is Bruce Rux and, you know, how did you get interested in the UFO phenomenon and how did Hollywood vs. the Aliens come about? Well, I work for Wackenut Security, so any of the conspiracy theorists that want to, you know, speculate may speculate, but <laughs> I'm an upscale security officer, USO, which means that I wear a blazer and just, you know, a general nice kind of outfit. I don't wear any kind of gun or badge or anything like that. Uh, and I do, you know, just kind of meet and greet type of security. Uh, so that's what I've been doing for the last 10 years or so, I would say. Uh, the way I got into UFOs, uh, that's kind of a, a lengthy topic. Uh, I've been studying it since I was a kid. Like back in the 1960s, occasionally you'd come across a paperback book here and there, be some mass paperback, and it was usually cheaply printed. And uh, it would quickly get consigned to a junk pile, but I would come across these and read them because I was interested. And uh, I caught up as much as I could back then, but I was a kid. You know, there's only so much I could comprehend. Mm -hmm. uh, and I continued studying it a bit through junior high. Uh, on and off, I got involved in ancient astronaut research at that time, which I thought was incredibly interesting. And obviously, is the direction that I moved off in as far as UFO research goes. Yeah. I'm convinced that's the correct path. It was not steady research. I mean, it wasn't like an obsession or a passion or anything. It was just something that, like a lot of other subjects, I picked up uh, over the years. And... Uh, gradually assembled my own views on it until I had enough evidence that I thought, yeah, I think this is it. And I'm reasonably convinced that I am. The um, personal view, I would call it, I happen to know someone who I'm absolutely positive is an abductee, and I have since spoken with them. I had not spoken with them before I wrote my book, uh, or books, I should say. Uh, but I have bumped into them not too long ago. And mind you, I hadn't seen this person in I don't know, 15, 20 years, long time. Yeah. But I grew up with them, and they told me a story at one point that had to do with an extremely bizarre nocturnal visitation. And I did not doubt this person's story at all. Uh, they never said anything about UFOs. UFOs had nothing to do with it. They never said they were in a flying saucer. They never said they were in outer space. In fact, they said they had been abducted by a succubus. And this was a girl who was telling me this. Huh. And uh, I specified, well, you know, an incubus is a male demon. And she said, yeah, I know that, but this thing was female. And she gave me these really apt descriptions. And I didn't know exactly what to make of this story. Uh, I was quite positive that she wasn't lying to me because her emotional affect was uh, pretty much in line with someone who had been raped. Uh, and she w she's just not a good enough actress to put that on. She wouldn't know what to do anyway. Yeah. But I recognized the symptoms. So I listened very seriously, and I really didn't know what to make of it, but I stuck it in the back of my head and said, well, whatever this is, this merits some kind of further study at some point. Well, sure enough, years later, David Jacobs came out with his first book, uh, Secret Life, and more than any other book that I have read, I think that outlines the abduction phenomenon just about perfectly, because absolutely everything that she had told me, and this was decades before he had written this book, was exactly what he was writing in this book, some of it word for word, and it was coming from all kinds of different people, and that was the point where I said, ah, now I've got a handle on this, and one of the things that he brought up was that it's not a once-in-a-lifetime thing, it's not some random pickup, but UFO abductions are literally lifelong experiences, they begin in childhood and frequently even infancy, at least the vast majority of them do. Yeah. And that kind of put me in the right direction as far as study went. Uh, that led me to such things as CIA mind control experiments and stuff like that. Uh, one of the reasons that you would want to pick somebody up repeatedly, and every UFO abduction researcher has said that anyone who was picked up, is mind control. That's part of the process. Well, mind control requires uh, repeat visitations to kind of keep the wiring solid, if you will. Yeah. So, yeah, of course they would pick up the same people and keep coming back to them over and over again. And what this person had been telling me, I was absolutely convinced, had to be a UFO abduction. Now, I never suggested that to them. Uh, like I said, I wasn't even in contact with them. They'd moved to another part of the country. I hadn't seen them in ages. I wrote my books, and many years after I wrote my books, so like I said, this was just a few months ago, she tracked me down, and we talked about this. And uh, she is also convinced that that is the case. 
but she didn't know at the time any more than I did. <laughs> but that's kind of the, the personal angle of what got me researching this. Interesting. Interesting. Wow, that's strange. I guess, you know, just the, the sort of lighthearted question, you know, to follow up the bio background is, where have you been, Bruce? The book came out in 1997. You don't have a web presence or anything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I'm on the web all the time, you know, but I don't know how to get web pages set up and all that. And uh, I didn't, I, I just never really had a lot of money. So uh, I wasn't looking around trying to find someone to establish a web page or anything of that nature. And I figured if anyone really needed to contact me, uh, they could always contact me through the publisher. I mean, you can always write them and they'll forward it. So uh, that and I debated whether or not I was going to release the books under my own name because you obviously attract a lot of kooks in this field. Yeah. So. I'm not exactly hiding. I'm just not tossing myself out there. Yeah, well, that's commendable in a way, too, because, you know, especially in the UFO field, it's like there's a lot of self-promoters who are over the top and everywhere. So <laughs> The vast majority, actually. <laughs> exactly. And, and if they're not self-promoters, then they're people who are deliberately, they're not accidentally, they are deliberately trying to sow disinformation on this subject. Yeah, seems like there's a lot of that going on as well, and, and uh, well, I'm sure we're going to get into that. Before we sort of dive into the, the book discussion, I first just want to put you over huge, as folks probably could ascertain from the introduction. I'm just completely blown away by this book. Uh, I am the master of hyperbole on this show, but I do try to hold back on this term that I'm going to use on this book. It is a masterpiece, my friends. You've got to go out and get it. I don't care how you get it. Sometimes it's on Amazon. Sometimes it isn't. It's a little confusing, but you should be able to get your hands on Hollywood vs. the Aliens, and I'd call it a must-read for anybody interested in the UFO phenomenon and especially interested in the on-the-ground perspective of the UFO phenomenon. This is really about the people and how the people are dealing with the UFO phenomenon in all different angles, the entertainment industry, the government, and, you know, the people who watch TV and movies. So uh, it's a must-read, amazing, blew my mind completely, and uh, i got to just take my hat off to you, Bruce, for just a tremendous job on this book. The research is unreal. I mean, how, how many movies do you think you mention or chronicle in the book, would you say? Uh, I'd say there are probably over 500 in there anyway. <laughs> And all but a very small handful I've actually seen. Wow. And and TV shows, too. I mean, just like, oh, yeah. it's an amazing, just, it's just amazing. And in a way, too. That was too, before DVDs, too. I was doing all this on VHS tape. That was a little costly. I know, I know. Actually, yeah, I was going to say, the book is almost quaint in a way because, you know, it came out in 1997, pre-9-11, really at the very beginning of the Internet boom, so I don't even know if there's, uh, you know, I was looking earlier today to see if I could find any mention of the Internet in the book, but I, there may be something in the introduction, but otherwise, you know, no Internet references really, and and uh, obviously, you know, so much has changed since 1997 that it was, like, amazing. And, of course, we're going to get into, you know, post-Hollywood versus the aliens of what you think is going on since the publication of the book, of course, a little bit later on here in our conversation. But, yeah, I definitely thought the book was uh, – it was like a time capsule and an amazing journey through the years of movies and TV and how this UFO thing has been portrayed over the years, which is something actually that I had thought of as something I wanted to write a book about, like, uh, you know, before I, yeah, before I'd heard of you, before someone wrote to me and said I should interview you, they were like Hollywood versus the aliens. And I was like, oh, no, this guy wrote my book. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry if I stole your thunder. <laughs> well, you did a better job than I would have done, I'm sure. So, I mean, the book is just amazing, and uh, I, I just can't put it over enough. I hope folks go out and, and pick it up and read it. At the risk of oversimplifying everything, I guess let's sort of just boil down the general thesis of Hollywood versus the aliens for folks who are just coming into their own here and coming into the interview and, and finding out what we're going to be talking about. You know, sort of give them a thumbnail look at it. You know, what is Hollywood vs. the Aliens all about? Well, first off, I'm operating from the premise that the government knows all about UFOs. Uh, at least they know they know that they're out there. They know that they are not from Earth. Uh, they've been studying it since at least 1947, and probably considerably before. Roswell was real. Uh, we definitely did pick up some crash wreckage of an extraterrestrial vehicle. And uh, the government scurried behind the scenes to create their own uh, secret research groups for a number of reasons, all of which make perfect sense. Uh, they were terrified, quite frankly, and that was not knowing the intentions of who was coming down here, just recognizing a superior power that can come into our airspace anytime they want. That's pretty scary. Plus, we've got some of their technology in our hands now, and we don't want to let anyone know that that exists. 
Uh, we want to exploit it as much as we possibly can, and the best way to do that is in secrecy. So with all of this working on them, the government assembled the best people they could in private to study everything that they possibly could to the maximum ability. So with all of this working on them, the government assembled the best people they could in private to study everything that they possibly could to the maximum ability. And along the way, uh, they were deciding how best to eventually disseminate this material. They had a two-pronged problem. The first problem was we need to keep it secret. And the second problem was eventually we're not going to be able to keep it secret. So how do we deal with this? And the answer was, you ridicule it as much as possible. You use a two-pronged counterintelligence attack. You use misinformation and disinformation in order to keep people confused and off balance. And eventually, you're also kind of seeding in some actual information there from more credible sources so that they can begin learning about it along the way. And then in a very gradual process, by the time it does become public, it's not so much of a shock to everybody. And the means by which they do that is through the entertainment medium as well, you know, as, as well Absolutely. as other things, of course. But, but Absolutely. You know. Yes, Hollywood, especially the uh, Robertson panel, a CIA convened panel of scientists in 1953, made that exact recommendation. They said Hollywood even recommended Walt Disney particularly. Yeah, it's long been discussed that he was in the intelligence community. I was stunned by just some of the names, too, throughout the book that come up repeatedly that you think may have also, you know, been dabbling in that sort of realm, including uh, Vincent Price was one of them that really stood out to me as a surprise. I was like, wow, this one I never even considered, and, and many other folks that we're, we're going to get into in a little bit. You probably don't really know this for a fact because of the, just the secrecy of it all, but sort of take me through a little bit how you think that influence, you know, was meted out by the intelligence communities. You know, did they bring the director in and, and tell them to do things a certain way, or did they have their hands on the writers, or, you know, was it sort of, you know, through the studio, you know, I'm sure it was sort of like all of the above. But Checkbox what, what, D, all of the above, yes. Technically, uh, what's a good way to put this? Uh, everyone was kind of scrambling on their feet as best they possibly could, uh, and trying to come up with the best way to deal with things. The CIA and the Air Force were formed very quickly after each other. Right after the Roswell crash, uh, that happened in July of 1947, and within a couple of months, the CIA was formed. Well, what do you suppose the CIA was formed to do? The CIA was formed to study all kinds of things, obviously. Uh, they, would, they were carrying on the work of the OSS in World War II, uh, but they weren't just keeping an eye on the Russians or just keeping an eye on the Chinese. They were keeping an eye on a far greater power that they couldn't tell anybody about which is why they immediately got into such studies as mind control. They were doing that pretty much all the way from the beginning, and we had no reason to believe that anyone on Earth was using mind control. Uh, the CIA itself put out stories that the Chinese were doing it. They had one of their embedded journalists write a story about something that was called Xi Now, which meant cleansing of the mind or washing the mind, which their brainwashing came up with. Mm -hmm. The thing is, that particular journalist was in the CIA's pocket, and he made that up. It was entirely a lie. There was not one word of truth to it. And the CIA admitted that itself in its own internal memos. They knew what they were doing. But they weren't just trying to scare people with the idea that the Chinese or the Russians might have some means of mind-controlling people. The point was, behind the scenes, they knew someone did have that technology, but they couldn't tell them who. So they were actually studying it. They weren't completely lying. Anyway, the point was they were formed right after the Roswell crash in order to study this. The Air Force became a separate body very shortly thereafter. And the National Security Agency was formed in 1952, not long after, uh, specifically to study uh, superior foreign intelligence. And uh, the UFO uh, intelligence would definitely fit in that particular category. We have lots of documents attesting to the fact that the NSA was sort of a central clearinghouse for a long time. It was denied that it ever existed for decades. Any time that any casual mention might come up of it, and that was extremely rare, it was just denied that the National Security Agency existed at all. The NSA was joked as no such agency. But the truth was, yeah, not only did it exist, it was practically synonymous with the Defense Department itself. It's answerable solely to the president, uh, still to this day. It didn't have a charter when it was first created. A charter was come up with for it, I believe, four or five years after its creation. But that charter is still classified to this day, and no one is allowed to read it. They are answerable solely to the president. They are the central clearinghouse for this particular subject. There are numerous other agencies involved. Uh, the Central Intelligence Agency is definitely one of the top ones involved, uh, and has been all the way from the beginning. There can't be any question of that. But obviously, they were operating in incredible secrecy, 
and doing everything that they could to keep wraps on it. They didn't want that to get out. Yeah. To jump back, I guess, to to the question a little bit, I guess, how do you think the means was that they influenced these folks is what I mean. Do you know? Like, Oh, yes, of course. Yeah. For one thing, they had friends in high places. Let's just put it that way. These are people who had all thought the war together. Uh, they all had a lot of connections. Uh, they had a lot of government connections. So what do they do? They're all involved in their own private businesses and all of that, and some of them are getting involved in Hollywood or being specifically embedded in journalism. Uh, there were quite a many in journalism uh, and in Hollywood as well, as it turns out. So they didn't exactly have their thumb on them. They didn't need to. These are friends. These are people that have done work for them before. They were putting out war propaganda in World War II, uh, some excellent examples of which there were three or four movies talking about what a wonderful country Russia was during World War II because they were our allies. Like Song of Russia, it's like, oh, what a magnificent country. And then, you know, immediately after the war, uh, all of a sudden we're demonizing them, they're our enemies, and you see nothing but the Red Menace coming out. Yeah. This is all because of Hollywood's cooperation. As recently as the Bush administration, I have to give them credit for at least one thing. Very early on after 9-11, uh, the administration got up right in front of the TV cameras and said, Hollywood is cooperating with us in creating war propaganda. They just said it that boldly. <laughs> And uh, I have to give them at least that much credit. They were honest about that. But it had been going on since World War II. This was nothing new. So obviously, if you have something even more important, like the UFO menace, if you want to call it that, uh, plainly, your people are probably going to cooperate with you and create whatever propaganda is necessary. Yeah. How privy to the UFO information do you think these guys are, or do you think they're just sort of like the intelligence folks just suggest certain changes? I would say a small number of them, and the higher up the chain they are, the likelier that possibility a small number of them know exactly what they're doing. Now, the ones beneath them are just taking their marching orders pretty much, and a lot of it does come down to influence, such as, well, I like this script, but you know, if we did this, and, you know, the writer is not going to fight with them or whoever they're dealing with because they want to get their stuff put up. Yeah. And there are numerous examples of that in Hollywood. As yeah. a matter of fact, there's an excellent example in uh, media print, Chester Gould, the creator of Dick Tracy, and he made all kinds of changes to Dick Tracy in order to get it put into publication. And he didn't like the changes, but he did them because his publisher, Joseph Madel Patterson, wanted them done. So, sure, he would do that because now he's making a name for himself. He's getting his stuff put out there. Yeah. Now, throughout all this history here from, you know, the 50s onward, has anyone in the entertainment business ever sort of come out and been like, you know, I think I was influenced by the government to change the story or they told me not to – to write the UFO story this way or that way? Have there been any sort of like whistleblower situations? Not whistleblowers in that sense, but there have been lots of stories out of Hollywood of how their scripts were changed in exactly the fashion that I'm describing. Uh, one in particular is The Thing from Another World, uh, which was one of the first UFO movies and the first serious UFO movie, certainly. In the original story of that, if you saw the remake that John Carpenter made of The Thing, you had this you know massive, shape-changing, horrible creature that could become anything it wanted to become. Well, in the original movie, going you know, all the way back to 1950, they wanted to do the exact same thing. But they kept saying, well, we can't do that. Well, we can't manage the special effects. Well, we don't like this. So they kept changing the alien. They had to come up with an alien. And from up high on the production chain, the word kept coming down, well, change it like this, change it like this, change it like this. And what it came down to was a classic flying saucer and something that looked like the Frankenstein monster or like a giant version of a UFO gray. Huh. He's bulletproof, bombproof, blastproof pretty much flame-proof. In the end, they have to wipe the thing out with electricity, which, you know, if you were wanting to equate something to, say, a robot, uh, an electrical overload might have something to do with that. It's just a very interesting number of changes that are brought about in that way. Absolutely, absolutely. And you segue perfectly here into one of the things I noted in the book is a recurring theme, and I think uh, you'll definitely be able to make the case for it pretty strongly, I'm sure. I don't want to be presumptuous, but I'm 99% I'm positive this is your belief that the E.T. Greys aren't necessarily biological creatures, but they're some kind of robots. I'm certain of it. Biologically, they're completely absurd. Uh, let's just take a look at them physically for a moment. These things are in craft that are traveling at supersonic speeds, hypersonic speeds, making right angles, uh, zipping off in different directions, stopping on a dime. This would pulverize any pilot. And we even have uh, some records from the FBI of UFO crash recovery where they talk about three occupants having been pulled up that were wrapped like um, crash test dummies, sort of, or wrapped like uh, test pilots, rather. And they're short, they're squat, they're little, you know, three to five foot tall gray guys. But they're able to survive these incredible speeds, all this type of thing. Their eyes are enormous. And if, if we're looking at an anthropological being, which 
it looks like an anthropological being. It's got a head, it's got two arms, it's got two legs, it's got a torso. In other words, it's probably something presumably like us, if it's biological. Yeah. But look at the size of its eyes. If its eyes are spherical and there would be no reason for torso, in other words, it's probably something presumably like us, if it's biological. Yeah. But look at the size of its eyes. If its eyes are spherical, and there would be no reason to believe that they're not, because, after all, eyes are spherical in <laughs> like ourselves, well, it would take up the entire area that a brain could possibly be there. It would occupy its entire skull. So where the hell does it keep its brain? The things all look like they were formed out of a mold. They're able to survive different pressures, different uh, hypersonic speeds in their craft. The things are practically indestructible, just like the thing in the movie. They're blade-proof, blast-proof, bomb-proof, and we have numerous reports of people encountering UFO entities where they were shot at, and the bullets just plunked off, quote-unquote, like off a lead bucket or something like that. Yeah. And the military reports the same type thing. You can strafe them like crazy. You might knock them down, but they're going to get right back up again, and you see that happen in movies, too. Uh, yeah, the things just do not appear to be biological in any way, shape, or form. Absolutely, yeah. And, and you raised one point, too, in the book when you sort of make the case for Grays as robots that I never really thought of, and that was just the whole breathing issue. Uh, you never really see them breathing, or at least they're never reported to be breathing. And that's a consistent report that comes from all kinds of, of uh, UFO abductees, too. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. If they're beings from, like, some other planet, chances are they just wouldn't necessarily be able to just come to Earth and breathe. You know, Not only would they not be able to breathe... Uh, how are they walking around here? Let's assume evolution here for a moment. What kind of planet would these guys have evolved on? In theory, they would have evolved on a lighter gravity planet. If they came here and they're walking around without some kind of pressure suit on, I'd think the pressure would kill them. Now, the gravity would, they look awfully spindly. I would think that the gravity would be a little hard for them to move around in, but it doesn't seem to be. And when they do move, they move, quote unquote, like German soldiers in movies. This, again, is a frequent report. It comes up over and over and over again. They're kind of staggering around like they're on stilts. They move stiffly. They move awkwardly. They don't move realistically. And even when Bud Hopkins was doing research for, uh, on, uh, I'm trying to remember which one he put up uh, as a miniseries on TV, Dan Curtis did it. Intruders, I think it was. I think so, yeah. Uh, anyway, when they were making that, they were trying to make the aliens as close to UFO reports, abductee reports, as they could. The problem was they had to scrap those aliens because, quote-unquote, they looked like dolls or puppets. They weren't moving realistically. So they made something, you know, with eyes that blink and all this other type of stuff. But there are no reports of them blinking their eyes. There are no reports of any restrooms on board these craft. Uh, nothing about them seems to indicate anything biological at all. And in fact, biologically, they're just ridiculous. It sort of puts the whole ETH thing in a whole new light. You know, there's always been sort of a backlash against the ETH thing, and now it seems like it's growing more and more uh, in the last few years. But when you sort of reframe it with the robot idea in mind, it sounds a little more plausible, I guess you'd say. Well, also, if you go back to the original documents, when you're trying to figure out who was studying this in the first place, if you take the MJ-12 documents, which are bogus, but if you take those as what's supposed to be the legitimate source for the UFO study group, mm -hmm. there's only one biologist on that entire list. I would think that the most important thing in a UFO crash, considering that the craft itself is wreckage by every single report, but also by every single report, we have at least one of the bodies pretty well intact, no matter how badly beat up the other two are. Well, just if this were me personally... I would really want to understand the biology of what was flying that. <laughs> yeah. So I would have a whole lot of biologists involved and probably very little of anything else. On the official documents, which are bogus, there's just one. That makes no sense. And when it comes right down to it, when you get down to the real list, and we don't have a complete real list, but there are some credible sources inside the government, in our government and others, uh, who have named some of the people that would have been involved. Kurt von Neumann is one of the people that comes up. Kurt von Neumann was a computer scientist. He was like the most advanced computer scientist in the world at the time. Jacques Vallée, who ended up involved in the program, is also now a computer scientist. He, he's an astrophysicist, an internationally known astrophysicist, but he's also equally known for computer science now. Why do you suppose that is? Why would they be bringing these people in? That is interesting. And then just to connect the dots a little bit, if we presume that the government knows more about UFOs and their occupants than anyone else, and that they would have recovered some kind of being or pilot of the, the craft, whether it be Roswell or one of the many other purported UFO crashes, I guess they'd only really need one body to you know, open it up, figure out that it's a robot. So Exactly. Now, the interesting thing about that particular body, the remains of the bodies, apparently three were recovered. That seems to be the consistent report. 
of those, two were pretty badly beat up, and one seems to have been, I guess, partly protected one way or another or ejected soon enough. Uh, it was in reasonably good condition, but it was still pretty banged up. Now, a nurse was brought in at Roswell by people she had never seen before at the base. Uh, so she didn't know if they were doctors, she didn't know who they were, but they brought her in to look at some crash bodies. Now, she reported an overpowering smell, but she wasn't even sure that they were doing an autopsy. She wasn't sure whether they were dressed or not, or she thought they were doing an autopsy, and if they were doing an autopsy, plainly they would be undressed, but she couldn't tell. What she was describing, again, like we're talking about, was just biologically absurd. It still had its eyes. This thing has been lying out on the desert floor for a week by the time it's brought in, for at least six days before it's been found and brought in. It's been lying out on the desert floor. There's no mention of decomposition anywhere. And the eyes are still in it. Well, how would the eyes still be in it? The very first things that go are the eyes. Desert predators eat them. They're gone in no time flat. And they pretty much sink and hollow out, and they're gone real quick. They decompose fast. Yeah. Uh, so right there you have something that's absurd. She described their outer covering, as, and I think she used those actual words. She did not say skin. Uh, she said the outer covering was very pliable, which sounded kind of like plastic. She said you could push in on it and push right back out again, but that they were physically hard. Huh. And she described them having suction cups on the end of their fingers, which was extremely interesting because the person I was talking about that got me thinking about this had described the exact same thing. I might add that, that the person I knew who was an abductee had not researched UFOs. That was just not in her purview. But she was describing the exact same thing. Huh. So, yeah, again, I have a biologically absurd thing. It's being attested to by someone who should understand biology pretty well. She's a nurse. But she's not describing it exactly in biological terms. She's not saying bones. She's not saying cartilage. She's saying something cartilage-like. She's saying uh, outer covering. She's not talking about skin. She's describing something that really doesn't make much sense biologically, and even she was not convinced that it was an autopsy. She didn't even know if it was dressed or not. She didn't know what the hell it was. <laughs> it just scared her. Yeah, you kind of almost think it's like maybe one of the biggest secrets of the UFO phenomenon or something that hasn't, like, people have always sort of, I guess, considered that they're robots, but I'm surprised it hasn't really been given more thought, I guess, or hasn't taken its place, you know, as one of the pillars of the of the ideas of what they are. Do you know what I mean? It's actually a critical issue. I have heard abduction researchers half admit that they might be robots. They say that because they don't want to admit that. As soon as you say, that's a robot, then you are automatically saying, that is not an alien. It may still come from someplace else, but those are not the aliens. Whoever sent them are not necessarily these. They don't look like this. Yeah. We don't know, then, who sent them. What we're seeing is a remote-controlled puppet. It's a marionette. Mm -hmm. But then you don't know who's pulling the strings. <laughs> exactly. And then just to sort of build the bridge here to what we're talking about then, when you look at all these movies of the past, you know, five decades, almost six decades, maybe even more, and if you take into consideration that the intelligence agencies were pushing and shaping and, and, and molding certain stories, then you have to look at all these sort of robot stories in a whole new light, which is what you do in Hollywood vs. the Aliens. And, uh, oh, yeah. It's amazing. And the continued presence of robots in the history of film and in the history of UFO stories is remarkable. And then it really makes you think. It sort of puts a light bulb in your head. It sort of ties it all together. Do you know what I mean? Like if the government well, very much so. would have known ahead of time before anyone else, because we're still – the UFO community still hasn't gotten on board the robot idea. Right, <laughs> because it's not profitable. First off, you don't want people to realize what it is, because if they start realizing what it is, they're going to figure other things out, and you don't want them looking at it at all in the first place. But if they are looking at it, you want them scared out of their minds, because if they're scared out of their minds, then you can be selling that to Congress and saying, oh my God, horrible, evil, reptilian space aliens intent upon eating our young alive and cutting them open to see what makes them tick and forcing them to reproduce and create alien hybrids and just doing every grotesque, vile, hideous thing imaginable, you're going to get all the money you want. Whereas if you say, you know what, this has been going on since the dawn of time, it's nothing new, we just happen to notice it now because we've got radar. And occasionally they crash. You're not going to get as much money. Yeah, and the other big sort of theme that runs concurrent with uh, the robots and the UFO connection throughout these films is Mars and ancient astronauts and that whole milieu, if you will. You're of the belief, I presume, that you know the government also knows that. that oh, absolutely. 
Mars is, is absolutely critical to understanding UFOs. You have to understand something. All the way from World War II, we wanted to get a hold of the best rocket scientists that we could get specifically so that we could go to Mars. You have to ask why. What was so important? We wanted to get a hold of the best rocket scientists that we could get specifically so that we could go to Mars. You have to ask why. What was so important about Mars? But if you go back over the records, you find this all the way back to World War II. We wanted to get a hold of the German rocket scientists. So did the Russians because we wanted to get to Mars by way of the moon. But Werner von Braun, for instance, wrote a book called The Mars Project in which we send a team of astronauts to Mars. And what do they find? A bunch of people just like us living there. Lo and behold. This is pretty much what we knew was taking place. We probably knew it in World War II. We definitely knew it after Roswell. We have lost, up until recently, we lost all of our major probes to Mars, and so did the Russians. We also both lost a tremendous number of them to the moon as well. But Mars, definitely. We couldn't send a probe there and keep it going. Neither could the Russians, not for very long. Yeah, the introduction really sort of lays out what we're talking about here right now and sets the stage for the movie discussion, which we're, <laughs> which we're going to get into in a minute. And uh, the introduction is almost like just a UFO book in and of itself, uh, just sort of looking at you know, where you stand on all these issues and really sort of sets the stage for what you think the government knew and then how they use that information in the process, uh, I guess you could say educational program or miseducational program at times that was this Hollywood and TV thing. It's almost less a question of figuring out what they knew as when they found it out. Then it gets to be kind of a parlor game, because once you know the joke and you can see when people started picking it up, that's when you go back and say, all right, how exactly did they get this? And you start tracking it down and saying, wait a minute, this guy knew, this guy knew, and this guy knew. And then you start seeing how it goes back. The Nazis, for instance, uh, we wanted to get a hold of the German rocket scientists. The Nazis had to have known something about this. The Allies knew something about it. The Nazis knew something about it. Uh, this goes back into the ancient astronaut aspect of it uh, and into ancient mysticism when it comes right down to it. And the color is red, white, and black and associations with the planet Mars. You find it occurring with the Nazis all over the place. Uh, you've got the swastika, which is an old Hindu uh, luck symbol, among other things. You also find it around the rest of the world. It's an ancient symbol. They're using the colors red, white, and black, which have a mystical association. Uh, they're studying uh, all kinds of bizarre occult theories, or at least that's how they appeared to everybody else. And I read a book by Peter Lavenda that was talking about the Nazis and the occult and the sort of things that they were studying. And he went into detail on them. And he said, well, look at all this crazy stuff they were studying, A, B, C, D. And I realized as I was reading it, I said, wait a second, that's the index of my first book. I think I know what they found. <laughs> so you think this has been knowledge way back when, and, and then the Robertson panel sort of kicked off the program, if you will, uh, of shaping the public opinion of UFOs. Absolutely. That was where it became concrete policy. Now, it had already been implemented with Truman, and it was implemented with him in a couple of different movies. Well, three if you take when the movie was made as opposed to when it was released. And that was The Thing from Another World, uh, The Day the Earth Stood Still, and War of the Worlds. Now, all three of these were serious UFO movies. They were serious flying saucer movies. They weren't a joke. They were kind of scary. Now, with the exception of Day the Earth Stood Still, which was scary in its own way, but it was not intended to frighten people in the sense that these guys are here to destroy us, the way the War of the Worlds or The Thing was. Uh, and in fact, The Day the Earth Stood Still was extremely intelligent. You have a, a flying saucer which is picked up coming into the atmosphere. The entire world sees it, and uh, it, it lands in the ballpark in Washington, D.C. opens up, and the entire military is there. Out comes some guy in a strange-looking outfit. They think he's uh, got some hostile intent. Somebody takes a shot at him. Fortunately, he's not killed. And we find out he looks just like us. He implies that he came from Mars. I think he said he came something like 250 million miles, which, yeah, Mars would be a good bet. That's like median distance between uh, when it's closest and when it's furthest away. And it's implied in the movie that he came either from Mars or Venus, but that they think he came from Mars. Well, this is exactly what the military came to its own conclusions with in Project Sign in 1948. I mean, that's pretty much word for word. We are not open to his message at the time. He's not hostile, and he's got a giant robot with him which is pretty much indestructible and pretty damn scary. <laughs> and it's also completely under his control. This is obvious. He says he wants to meet with all the world leaders because, well, now we've joined the nuclear ball club. We understand how that works. And that makes us dangerous. So we've got to learn to get along with the rest of the galactic community or something might have to be done about it. But unfortunately, 
We can't even agree where we would have the meeting, let alone how we'd get everyone assembled to listen to him. So he decides to go underground and just assumes an identity, goes to a boarding house, meets some people, and eventually meets a scientist who can arrange the meeting that he wants. Of course, it all gets more detailed than that, but the point is it's a very intelligent presentation of what would happen if a superior civilization of human beings out there were trying to contact a bunch of people down here. They would be facing exactly these sort of problems, and that's probably how they would deal with them, which sort of explains the UFO abduction phenomenon. That's the equivalent of going underground. Yeah. It's like, well, we, we came overtly and you shot at us, <laughs> uh, and we can't exactly talk to you, so let's just get to know the locals and see what we can figure out from there. Yeah, and just refresh my memory, what year was that made originally? That was 1951. Okay. I believe, well, I'll have to check. I believe it's 1951. Now that we're sort of you know, uh, knee deep here in the in the entertainment medium. Let me just jump back a little bit, I guess, to one of my favorite characters in the world of entertainment, Orson Welles. I'm a huge Orson Welles fan, and of course, everybody knows about the big uh, oh, sure. production of War of the Worlds, and it's famous, it's infamous. How do you think this whole education process sort of tied in with that, you think? Well, this is where it gets interesting, and you have to ask yourself how far back the government knew any of this, because there could have been more than one ulterior motive for Wells doing that. Now, I think historically everyone looks at it and says, oh, it was just an accident, or, uh, oh, he was pulling a big publicity stunt. Now, where either of these things could be true, and there is some reason to believe that they might be, there is also reason to believe that they might have been government-funded or uh, done as a request, let's say, to a friend. Orson Wells was a major FDR supporter. Uh, he was working on the fourth term re-election bid, the whole nine yards. He was doing everything he could. And uh, here he does this War of the Worlds thing in 1938. Well, what's the world like at that time? FDR is considering getting involved in World War II against uh, United States. I mean, the, the rest of the United States was not behind that. They were not interested in getting involved in someone else's war. He's looking at a way to get everyone out of the Depression and sort of testing the waters and seeing, well, how would everyone feel about, you know, if we had to get involved in a war? So he might have been testing their mood by creating a scare story and using Mars, or it's possible that the government knew something all the way back then and were, wanted to test some other waters. Either way, taking the War of the Worlds and adapting it in the fashion that Wells did would do exactly that if he did it the way he did it and not any other way. Now, CBS, the entire stretch that he was doing this, did everything they could to make it obviously fictional. They were using fictional place names. And behind their back... Uh, the studio said, look, you've got to do it like this because it sounds too real the way you have it. And Wells said, oh, yeah, don't worry, we'll do that. And then he would change it without their paying attention. In fact, he had spent time actually at Grover's Mills in New Jersey in order to get physical locations down as best he possibly could. He'd stayed there in a boarding house one summer. So he was doing everything he could to circumvent what CBS wanted him to do and make it as realistic as he possibly could. And if you listen to it today... There's nothing remotely convincing about it. But back then, they were in a little bit simpler society. And the mere fact that it was coming over the radio automatically lent it some kind of credence, unless it was plainly being designated as some sort of fiction. Yeah. Now, at the beginning, it was announced, uh, yes, this is a play of H.G. Wells' The War of the Worlds. However, if Wells was shrewd, and Wells was nothing if he was not shrewd, then he would have known that nobody was going to be listening to his show at that time. He didn't pull in that much of a share. They were all going to be listening to Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy. They might tune over during the commercial to see what was going on over at CBS Playhouse, and that's what a lot of them did. Yeah. So they come into the middle of it, and they're hearing, I, I can't, I don't know what this is. There's some strange thing coming up. Ah, ah, people <laughs> screaming. And, you know, the reports start coming in, and the next thing you know, you got a, a small-scale panic on your hands. And, and that's pretty much how that went. And, of course, Wells the next day, I got a picture of him in my book. It's one of my favorite pictures of Orson Wells ever, where he's standing. He's, he's got the underlighting on him, and he's standing on a stage with his eyes kind of cast up and this innocent expression on his face and his hands open wide like, me? What did I do? Yeah. And it's a very plainly staged photo. It's very self-serving. But, yeah, he knew exactly what he was doing. I guess if we look at the latter explanation or possibility for why it was done, as you say, maybe – you know, test the waters for potential, you know, the alien influence or whatever, or the uh, UFO menace, as you, that's a great term I like. We're going <laughs> to yeah, we'll keep, get some mileage out of that. keep using that one. Um, if it was to test the waters of the UFO menace, then it may have had some influence on the Robertson panel down the line because they could have oh, looked absolutely. at it and said, you know, look what happened. 
when we ran the test or something. Absolutely. Uh, let me lay a quick bit of background on this. Uh, this would not be just out of the blue. Why would we suppose that there could be someone on Mars? Well, there's a very simple reason for that, because we had some very high scientists who believed that they were receiving intelligent signals from Mars. And this was going on all the way back at the beginning of the century. Nikola Tesla in Colorado Springs uh, delayed telling anyone for many months after he he from Mars. And this was going on all the way back at the beginning of the century. Nikola Tesla in Colorado Springs uh, delayed telling anyone for many months after he, he was convinced that he was receiving intelligence signals from Mars by radio. He didn't want to tell anyone because he thought they're going to laugh at me like I'm some kind of crank. Well, he eventually did mention it in the Colorado Springs Gazette, and they treated him like he was a crank. But the next thing you know, Lord Kelvin came over from Britain, publicly said, I think he's right, and you never heard another word about it. So that was in 1901. Well, then you go to the 1920s. The 1920s twice, I believe it was 1924 and 1926, I'd have to check to be specific, but it happened twice. Uh, there was a day that Mars was going to be very, very close to Earth, uh, the closest it had been in, you know, 100 years or so. Yeah. And there was an observed day of national radio silence. And we set up uh, a scientist named C. Francis Jenkins to come up with something he called the radio telescope. And he and the United States Navy got together and aimed this thing at Mars. And they received what they considered to be intelligent signals. These were studied by one of the heads of the CIA. I can't remember his name now. Uh, but anyway, we found the documents, or at least a couple of the documents, in his desk, even though his desk had been purged after his death at the National Security Agency. But there was a Captain John P. Ferreter of the U.S. Navy Signal Corps who wrote very specifically that they received voice transmissions. They received radio transmissions and voice transmissions of words from one to three or one to five syllables. I can't remember now. Uh, and they weren't able to decipher them. That's what, that was William Friedman. That's who it was. Uh, William Friedman was working on these at the, the National Security Agency even when he died. Two years after that, it was one or two years after they did this particular experiment, they did the exact same thing with a brand new, extremely expensive, one of those giant radio antennas that now are not so uncommon, but back then it was brand new. Well, they made one of those, I think it was in Nebraska, and they repeated the listening experiment, uh, again, with some high government officials there and with the Navy involved. No word was ever published on that one, but it was published that they did do the experiment. Just amazing, and I, and I think... All that I learned here from the book, it just makes you really understand uh, how we got where we are, uh, the UFO field, I mean. You know what I mean? Sometimes it's like, you know, why are we so marginalized? Why does everyone make fun of us? Why, why does everyone, you know, shit all over UFOs and, and the idea of life on Mars and everything? But then, you know, after reading the book, it's like there was this whole roadmap of completely undermining the whole subject and, and the whole idea of UFOs and life on Mars, and, and it's just amazing to think about. Oh, absolutely. And of course they would do something like that. <laughs> they can't admit it. What are they supposed to do? It's very easy for us from, from where we're standing right now. It's easy for us in retrospect to look back and say, why did you do this? You guys were such idiots. But if you put yourself in their shoes at that time, they had just finished with a world war. There were still some tensions around. We had come up with the atomic bomb, which, by the way, the president knew came from ancient technology. Uh, there were writings of, of President Truman's that didn't come out until after his death, where he said that we were, quote-unquote, resurrecting an ancient technology, a very destructive ancient technology. Well, yeah, we did. That came all the way back from Mahendra Daro, from ancient India, Indra's dart, all that stuff. Yeah. So, yeah, they knew. Uh, and what were they going to do in this post-world where now we have the bomb and the Russians distrust us more than ever because we have actually used this weapon <laughs> yeah. on another civilization? And it's really, really terrifying. So the Russians know we have it and we're not sharing it with them. So, of course, tensions have already gone high. Now, in the middle of this, flying over our only base in the entire world that has two nuclear weapons at it. And who would know that? Suddenly a flying saucer crashes right there at Roswell, the only base in the world with an actual atomic warhead. Of course, everyone is going to be terrified out of their minds. First off, how did anyone know? Second off, who the hell has got this kind of technology that could reach us? Third off, their technology is so great, they don't even have to come in person. This thing is a remote-controlled dummy, and they're able to fly this thing here, plainly not even from this planet. Okay. I'm scared. If I were them, I would be scared out of my damn mind, and I would do exactly what they did. I'd want to put a lid on it as fast as possible, study it in secret to the fullest extent, and exploit whatever technology came into my hands. And of course they were going to keep it secret. That only makes sense. It's easy for us in retrospect to look at it and say, oh, you shouldn't have done that. Again, playing the parlor game, 
Uh, I think they probably should have publicized it around 1960. Now, the first director of the CIA, Rear Admiral Hillencoder, uh, he was of that opinion when he retired from the CIA. Uh, he said, you know what, I think we should take everything that we know about UFOs and discuss it openly in Congress and share it with the American people. Now, I can't even say whether it was a right call or a wrong call to disregard that. But that was his recommendation, and he was the head of the CIA. Interesting. That would be about 20 years into the re-education or, or process or at some point like that. So. Well, yeah, it would have been 13 from uh, the Roswell crash. And if you went back from when we had some idea that someone else was out there, and again, I think probably from Mars, because it seems like we got intelligence signals from there. Uh, that was all the way back in 1901. So depending on who was sitting on that information or how much they were paying attention to it or how much uh, time had been devoted to it, yeah, they'd known for quite some time. And certainly from the time of Roswell on, there couldn't have been any doubt. Yeah. And then this is such a huge topic to really like dig into, but I'm going to do my best, folks, because <laughs> you're looking at, you know, 50 plus years of cinematic history, amazingly detailed in the book throughout all those years. So it's like, there's so much stuff that, like you said, over 500 movies. We're not going to talk about them all, folks. Don't, <laughs> don't worry about that. But let's sort of look at some of these early trends and some of these early sort of steps, if you will, that were being taken in the 1950s with this massive amount of you know, space alien movies and UFO sort of related movies and, and tangentially, you know, robot stuff and all that sort of thing. One of the first ones I want to talk to you about, the point you make is about the film Abbott and Costello go to Mars, and you say <laughs> that the promotional techniques were designed to make UFOs seem like a fad, which, uh, you know, would be in, in keeping, I guess, with what the government would want at the time, which would be, you know, for people to sort of briefly think about UFOs, but then move on to other things and, and consider them just sort of the, the flavor of the moment. Oh, yeah, that was quite deliberate. That's another one of those where plainly there was kind of a uh, decision somewhere in the studio chain to change things. Originally, it was supposed to be Abbott and Costello go to Venus, but for some reason they changed it to Mars. Who knows? Because they actually do go to Venus, but they changed the title to Mars. <laughs> so why? Uh, I don't know. Maybe someone had some reason. And uh, there were promotionals that were done by the studio. They had, uh, like, high school kids or elementary school kids. I can't remember what it was now. Like, you know, why do you think it's important for us to go to space? You know, tell us what you think about space. And uh, they gave some sort of a silly giveaway for that, and they made a big thing out of it. And the movie is just awful, actually. <laughs> it's, it's really bad. And you, if, I, I love Abbott Costello, first off. But uh, of all of their movies, that's one of the most negligible. And then you also mentioned the ubiquitous mention of UFOs in an overtly ridiculous manner uh, throughout all these 1950s films, and you can kind of see that trend carry on, you Continuing know. through to today, yeah. Exactly, and, and sort of just to crystallize that for folks, it's just sort of like, you know, these one-off lines you hear in movies where someone will just denigrate UFOs, where they'll be like, yeah, oh yeah, and and there's aliens on the moon, or, you know, or, yeah, and, and UFOs are real, and sort of these, these weird yep. little throwaway lines. The same way that you use Elvis today. Oh, and I suppose Elvis talks to you. Yeah, that sort of started, I guess you could say, in, in the 50s cinema? 1953. And it only started in 1950s cinema. I can give you an exact time. It happened in 1953, right when the Robertson panel made its recommendation. Immediately after the Robertson panel made its recommendation, within a month, Herman Cohen, who worked for American International Pictures, which at the time was American Releasing Corporation, had just come out of the Marines. He'd had a four-year stint in the Marines, and he comes up with a movie to make, super low budget, called Target Earth. In this movie, uh, there are a bunch of people, well, a bunch, there are a handful of people who wake up in some metropolitan city that is completely abandoned, and they don't know why. It's like, what happened here? Did someone drop the bomb and not tell us? There's no one in the city, except something clanking around that fires, you know, death rays out of this single cyclopean eye. It's, it's a big robot. It's a big tin can robot. And it's a pretty scary tin can robot, considering that it looks ridiculous, but it can vaporize you by just pointing its little visor in your direction. Yeah. Well, this movie was made on a shoestring, so much of a shoestring that, you know, they only had the one robot, because they couldn't make any more than that. And the thing was made out of cardboard boxes, literally. And they made a pretty good movie, actually. It still holds up reasonably well today, considering how incredibly cheap it is. But that was immediately after the Robertson panel recommendation. And a flood of movies started popping up. Uh, and they started trying to top each other in how low budget they could be or how laughable they could be. This was
was especially true through about 1953 to 1964. In 1953 to 1964 were the exact years of the CIA's MK Ultra project, which was their mind control project. What's this got to do with flying saucers? Oh, did you see one too? No, I did. That figures. It was about 11 o'clock at night, and I was getting ready for bed when this saucer buzzed the barn. Really? And what did you do? I pulled down my shade. I'm shy. You're the o'clock at night, and I was getting ready for bed when this saucer buzzed the barn. Really? And what did you do? I pulled down my shade. I'm shy. You're listening to Banal of America Audio. Oh, hi, Mr. Douglas. Would you mind telling me who you're talking to? Oh, just the people in the flying saucer. <laughs> did you see it? Oh, sure. Oh, yeah. It was round and silver and had two little green men in it. That's the one. <laughs> You're walking in your sleep. Now go to bed. But Mr. Good D night. Don't wake us up again. <laughs> What's the matter with Ab? Oh, he was seeing a couple of friends of his off to Mars or some such place. Now, do you think that, like, the people making these movies knew how terrible they were? They just didn't... Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there's a term for this. In England, they call it course theater, course, C-O-A-R-S-E. And they actually have contests to see who can do it best. Now, these are actually fun. I was an actor for many years, and anyone who's ever been in theater, you do this for fun. You can be doing serious shows or what have you, but every now and then you just got to cut loose and, and be ridiculous. And often you do it in rehearsals. What you're trying to do is look like you're doing something serious. In other words, you are impersonating a bad actor. You're a good actor. You know how to act very well. But you also know how to impersonate bad actors. You don't just do something badly. You have to do it the way a bad actor would do it. In other words, you have to look like you meant to do it well. That's fun. Well, the people who were making these movies were doing the exact same thing. They were saying, how can I make it look like I intended this to be good and just totally mess it up? And you have to know behind the scenes they're giving each other props for outdoing, uh, you know, doing a better job than the next guy. When Plan 9 from Outer Space came out, this is an Ed Wood movie. Ed Wood was admittedly a pretty bad filmmaker, but he wrote his own stuff. And what you'll notice is before Plan 9, he's writing coherent sentences in his other movies. They may not be good movies, but there's nothing wrong with his sentence structure. It's intelligible. He knows how to write. Then you get to Plan 9. All of a sudden, you have these absurd things flopping out of people's mouths that make absolutely no sense at all. Uh, I would have to actually look <laughs> I have it all written down in my book. I went into this one in detail. But I would have to read it as opposed to trying to memorize it because it's so badly jumbled the way that the thoughts are falling out of the actor's mouth that you can't memorize it. It's just absurd. <laughs> now, plainly, he was doing this on purpose. Your point in the book is that it's not just bad luck that UFOs ended up being the, you know, the medium by which, you know, all these sort of bad movies ended up becoming the focus. It was actually, you know, seeded in a way originally. It was absolutely deliberate. They were going to be the center of attention. And where they were not, in, in every other low-budget, terrible, horrible movie, uh, for instance, one of my favorite ones to call attention to is The Giant Claw. It was made in 1957. A crap load of these were made in 1957. It was a major year. It was also a major UFO sighting year, uh, which are entirely predictable, by the way. Whenever Mars is closest to Earth, the UFO sighting is going to shoot off the graph. And the military knew that all the way back in 1948. And that's been verified by several people since who then don't publish anymore. They just shut up about it. Yeah. But the military knows. And 1957 was going to be a major sighting year, and it was. And one of the horrible movies that came out that year was The Giant Claw. This thing is so classically bad. I must recommend it does exist on DVD. A lot of these things do exist on DVD. I've been hunting a lot of them up. I highly recommend, if you want to see just a bad movie, get The Giant Claw. This is about a giant bird from another dimension flying around in our skies like a giant battleship. And they use the phrase, like a giant battleship, about 50 times in the movie, plainly trying to make it more and more ridiculous every time it comes up. Yeah. Well, the bird, of course, is, is a ridiculous-looking marionette that would not – Scooby-Doo would not run away from this. It's just not frightening in the slightest. It's utterly ludicrous. But everyone's treating it like it's real. And the entire reason that it has come to Earth is to lay an egg. We have to defeat it, of course. Naturally, we do. Yeah, I remember the uh, – I remember the – dissertation just dissection of the the giant claw in the book it is one of the more amusing ones in there oh yeah it's a classic <laughs> i'm gonna have to uh, look that one up for sure and you do make a good point in the book that like you said uh for instance 57 was a huge year for these types of movies the the powers that be if you will uh who are orchestrating the disinformation and misinformation uh regarding the ufo menace they could have uh you know only sort of 
influenced a handful of films, and then with the way Hollywood is, which we still see nowadays, is that once you know, one thing sort of hits, everybody's doing it, and you know it explodes, and you don't need to prompt these people to do bad UFO movies because, you know... As they say in Hollywood, imitation is the sincerest form of television. <laughs> yep, it takes off on its own impetus. Now, you only have to do a few of them, and the next thing you know, everyone else is going to follow suit. You've already established the template. Now everyone else is going to be doing the same thing. Yeah. You don't even have to do anything. It's going to take off on its own. Uh, there's something that we should delineate here real fast just so people don't get lost. The difference between misinformation and disinformation. Mm -hmm. Disinformation is where you have a highly credible source, like a general who's been in the Air Force his entire life, telling you information that is just not credible. Uh, I mean, he's doing it with a completely straight face, and you're sitting there listening and saying, uh, and the aliens like strawberry ice cream, I see. And uh, let me see, they have underground bases, and uh, what are they doing? Oh, I see. They, uh, they're, they're not homosexual, but they like men. And, uh, <laughs> and they just keep telling you these ludicrous things, and they get more and more ridiculous. And, of course, eventually this guy is exposed as a liar. That is disinformation. It's something that is intended to hook you and then sour the subject matter for you by being exposed as a hoax or a lie. Misinformation, on the other hand, is where you take a ludicrous source and put completely accurate information in it, which is exactly what we're talking about here. If I take a, a ridiculous flying saucer movie or some other kind of movie and put accurate information in it, no one's going to believe it because it's coming from Gilligan's Island. Yeah, like the rhetorical question here is when they're doing something like that, why would they even put the accurate information in if they're just trying to, you know, sort of get people off the idea of UFOs and turn them off of it, why, why put accurate information in? Because then, if they start to sniff out the truth, if someone is actually doing some good investigation and they start hitting on it, they're going to come to the point and say, robots from outer space? I saw this on a movie the other night. This is absurd. I can't believe I could, I'm doing this. And they pitch it. Interesting. Okay, yeah, I see where you're going now then. It sullies the whole thing anyway. Yeah, and it's, since it's a two-pronged attack, it keeps you off balance. I see exactly what you mean now. I guess the other rhetorical question I had here is, uh, it did seem like some of these movies from the 50s ended up becoming like classics and remade and stuff like that. Absolutely. You know, if they were so bad and everything, how come they ended up being remade over and over again? Because they've become their own fond form of an institution. When they were putting these things out, they were mostly hitting the drive-ins. Now, there's a whole generation of people who don't even know what a drive-in is anymore, unless they saw one depicted in a movie. But back when I was growing up, through high school and into college, the drive-in was the place you went. We didn't have VHSs, we didn't have DVDs, uh, and TV went off the air at a certain time each night. And you didn't have cable, so you didn't have any channels either. You had maybe four. So where's your big source of entertainment? The drive-ins. They called them the passion pits, because no one went there to really watch the movie. You went there to make out, or just have a good time. Uh, no one's really paying that serious an attention to it. It's sort of background noise. Yeah. So in the middle of the heavy breathing, you're picking up robots from outer space and giant flying battleship birds from another dimension here to lay an egg. And the result of this, of course, is that it starts getting – you're laughing at it, you're having a good time, you go tell your friends, and it all starts spreading around. It's very infectious. Yeah, and that's that's a big point that you make in in the book, that this aura developed around UFOs as a result of uh, all these bad movies – and, you know, how they're tied in with bad plots, bad acting, outrageous costumes, and, uh, you know, just stilted and terrible acting. And um, you can't have more fun. <laughs> the whole point. There's a, we still, my friends and I still do this, we have, and I'm sure a lot of your listeners do too, and maybe you do. We have bad movie nights. That's where, you know, you rent some movies, you say, what's your favorite bad movie? Or, or I just saw the most awful movie. This thing is ridiculous. And you just can't wait to share it with somebody. So you rent the thing and you have parties around it, and you do exactly what we used to do with a drive-in. Uh, you get together and you have some drinks and some popcorn or what have you, and you just kind of get shit-faced and laugh your ass off at something really awful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, when you have 500 channels of cable, it's usually pretty... <laughs> yeah, it's, it's real easy anymore. <laughs> it's easy pickings. I mean, now we've got direct... To, it used to be direct-to-video. Now we've got direct-to-DVD. You know, direct to cable, direct to DVD, uh, you know that this is going to be super low quality. And oh, that's yeah. why you're watching it. <laughs> I <laughs> want to see something super low quality. Thank you. Because you had so much fun watching those that they became their own kind of institution. 
And so you have things like Invaders from Mars and The Fly and what have you, and they get remade because one generation remembers that and said, you know, uh, I watched that again the other night, and the effects are kind of chintzy, and the movie was actually not bad except for the effects. Maybe we could do that better. And, you know, they, they bring it back up. They resurrect it. As we're talking about this sort of, like, aura that develops, is there any sort of, like, discernible time when it seemed to be apparent that this re-education program and, and misinformation plan was starting to, you know, take hold, I guess you'd say. We know it took effect, and it was, you know, ongoing since the Robertson panel, but is there any idea really of sort of like, you know, when it started to click? Because I know just as a frame of reference, uh, a fact, and it was, you know, ongoing since the Robertson panel, but is there any idea really of sort of like, you know, when it started to click? Because I know just as a frame of reference, uh, you mentioned how the DC UFO sightings and then how the general came out and poo-pooed them. And then you quoted someone, I think, from Blue Book or NICAP or something like that that yeah. said, uh, you know, the, the UFO reports dropped from, let's say, 100 to 10 or something. I mean, yep. Obviously, I, I don't get the numbers right. but um, You got exactly the right idea, though, and I'm glad you brought that one up. That was uh, 1952. Okay. 1952, the Washington Nationals is what they were called. And that was for the Washington National Airport. They're the ones that reported it. We had a number of UFOs that were flying directly over the Capitol in Washington, D.C. Zoom. There they are. Uh, and very pointedly, no interceptors are being sent up after them. Well, I mean, the boards are lit up. Everyone's calling everybody and saying, uh, not only do I not know what these are, but they're pulling all kinds of maneuvers, and they're over the White House. Now, the standard uh, military operating procedure at that time, and probably still is, is you shoot down unidentified. So yeah. you shoot first and ask questions later. No interceptors. Nothing going up. Well, they just kind of move around for quite a few hours over Washington until finally some limping a single interceptor is sent out from a base in another state to kind of half-heartedly go up to it and act like it's going to do something. At which point, pew, they all go away. Well, of course, it hits the newspapers. All over the world, it hits the newspapers. And this is the most important place in the world at the time. And bam, big news. Well, the last thing in the world that anybody wanted was a repeat performance. And one week later, that's exactly what they got. Boop, they were right back again. Exact same thing. And this time it was extremely serious because after the first week, Everyone's eyes were open. They hear it again, and, and all eyes in the world are fixed right on this taking place. So interceptors were dispatched. They had to be. Washington really didn't have any choice. The interceptors come up against the UFOs. The UFOs boop, disappear. You just can't see them anymore. Okay, well, let's go home. They turn around to go back to base. They get partway there. Boop, they come back on again, just like turning the lights off, turning the lights on. So back they go to chase them. Boop, they turn off again. Well, this goes on for a little while. They're obviously messing around with the jets. Uh, and at one point, the jets not knowing what to do, one of them found himself surrounded by a number of disks. I do, and they were disks. I do not remember how many there were. Uh, there's a, an MGM, or no, it was United Artists, excuse me, I think, uh, a UFO movie that was made in 1952. It was the first real UFO documentary, and it's still, it's pretty tame, but it does put out quite a bit of stuff, uh, which for that year was amazing. Or it wasn't 1952, it had about 1956, I think, because mm -hmm. uh, the Nationals were 52. Uh, anyway, um, they actually have the transcript, or they repeat the transcript, of the pilot and his craft surrounded by these disks, and there's shakiness in his voice. He's radioing back to base and saying, uh... Well, <laughs> they're around me. Do I engage? And there was sort of a tense silence, and you know the guys on the other end of the line are debating that answer themselves very seriously, because if they tell him to engage, this guy's going to die. Yeah. And if they don't, then they've got egg on their face. Well, apparently the UFO was listening because it waited just long enough, and it understood the brinksmanship game, and they all pulled away. And the guy was able to just kind of sweat at home and then clean the yellow stuff out of his jumpsuit. <laughs> So that was done. But, obviously, after that kind of show, boom, front page news in papers all around the world. Everyone was reading about this. This kind of publicity on a subject that the government didn't want anyone to even know about in the first place, last thing in the world that the government wanted. I mean, phones are ringing off the hook talking about UFO sightings. So, right after the second appearance of the UFOs, the second Washington Nationals incident, Major General John Samford was called forth for a press conference. This guy gets up in front of the entire world uh, with a bunch of other guys in uniform looking all very serious and says, well, we've done an investigation and we've determined that these are 
clouds, ducks' bellies, the planet Venus, and the planet Jupiter. And pretty much they said all four of those things during the course of the interview as though they were interchangeable. And everyone's kind of went, oh, yeah, hmm, what do you know? And all of a sudden, no one's calling in about UFOs anymore. They drop like 90%, the number of reports, Phew, straight down, which you have to know is exactly the result that the government wanted when they did that. Uh, they know they can't stop people from seeing them. What they want is to keep people quiet about it. They don't, they don't want people disturbed. They don't want them upset. That's largely what governments do in general. It's kind of like when you're watching the economy go down the tubes. Uh, we got the new guy, I can't remember his name now, the new uh, economy secretary. Uh, remember the first time when he came out in front of the, uh, the cameras? And he looked just like George W. Bush Jr. when he first came out, you know, with his eyes big as saucers, looking like he's a deer in the headlights about to get run over. And he comes out, and uh, everyone at the press conference is saying, oh, I hear the economy is going down the tubes. We're looking at another depression. And he's standing up there, stiff as can be, going, everything's fine. Don't worry. Um, keep your money where it's at. Everything's going to be good. Bye. <laughs> Very uncomfortable and incredibly obvious. Well, you know, five minutes before he went out in front of the cameras, I really feel sorry for this guy. Five minutes before he went up in front of the cameras, he met in some little back room, uh, probably even with the president and several advisors, and they're all chatting, and they say, okay, look, uh, here are the figures. They look really bad, don't they? <laughs> Do not tell everyone how bad this looks. Lie. Go out there and lie. Just keep them comfortable. Lie. And probably less than five minutes after that, they shoved him up in front of the lights, and there he is, looking like he looked and sounding like he sounded, and repeating the obligatory lie in order to quell everyone's discontent, because that is his actual job, at least as far as the public is concerned. Now, behind the scenes, I have absolutely no doubt that he and everyone on his team and the president and lots of people in Congress are doing everything they can to take care of this particular problem. And they would have done the same thing with UFOs back in the day, and I'm sure they still do now to some extent. Uh, plainly, they want to deal with it, but they don't want anyone to know about it because they don't want people upset. Upset people do not go out and buy things. Upset people are upset. They want them to go about their jobs and uh, just live their lives, you know. Exactly. So that's one of the reasons that they go about things the way they go about things. That's why Major General John Sanford's conference, which everyone attending knew was bullshit, but they went along with it anyway because that's the job. Yeah. Now, do you think that was also kind of like the the way things were in the 50s where people just took the government's word for it, so they were just like, oh, okay, then it's ducks? Much easier back then, yes. Back in the 1950s, you have to understand, uh, Eisenhower was president. I like Ike. Everybody liked Eisenhower. That was part of the problem. He was a horribly ineffective president, and he himself knew it by the time he was done with eight years. He got those eight years because everybody liked him. He was the big war hero. He was the big general in World War II. So everyone just thought he was great. And there was this big period of peace and prosperity uh, and uh, the Cold War, which geared up right about the same time. And it wasn't until the end of his tenure that he recognized the military-industrial complex, as he put it, and actually warned everyone about it. But through that time, even he was oblivious to everything that was going on. I don't think he was a complete boob. I just don't think he knew everything that was going on underneath him. And, and I don't think most presidents since have either, and maybe a lot of them before. They find out what's going on as they go along. I mean, they're given reports. They're given briefings. But how serious is the briefing that a president is given on Vietnam, for instance, when he comes in? Um, that depends on who is being talked to. When a senator goes over to Iraq today and says, well, uh, I hear we've got torture going on and all this other kind of stuff. Oh, no, here, let me show you around. And they're going to take this guy to all the prearranged things that they have staged and all the safe spots and say, see, everything's fine, everything's under control, unless they need more money or unless they need to keep things going more. Then they're going to take him to a hot spot and say, oh, my God, look at this, it's horrible. But they're going to spin it any way they want to spin it. And how is this guy going to know? He's being taken on a show. And that show has a pre-designed end. And they will probably get that pre-designed end. Well, the same thing was happening with UFOs. The same thing was happening with the Cold War. That's just how the game is played. That's what they're about. It's interesting to sort of contrast that press conference with the other famous UFO press conference. Uh, with I don't know. I'm, I'm hoping you know what I'm talking about with the governor of Arizona. And he brought out the guy dressed as the alien. And sort of everybody laughed. <laughs> 
<laughs> I don't doubt that. In fact, I probably saw it at the time. Was this when they had the, uh, I think it was 97? Yeah, the Phoenix Lights and everything. Oh, yeah, 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 the Phoenix Lights. That's exactly what happened with the Phoenix Lights thing. Uh, the Phoenix Lights, for anyone who doesn't remember, because this was swept under the rug as much as it possibly could be, this was pretty much like the Washington Nationals. It was major, major news. Uh, the news did not cover it much. But it, for a few days, or even a few weeks, there was a lot about it, and this was in the mainline news. This was on the nightly news. If you tuned in ABC or CBS or NBC, they would talk about it at some point during the course of their show. Thousands of people had seen this enormous UFO over Arizona, and they all called it in. They all reported there were pictures of it, and this stuff is getting on the news. And uh, sure enough, what happens down the line? Well, the governor comes out and trots out again. They all called it in. They all reported there were pictures of it, and this stuff is getting on the news. And uh, sure enough, what happens down the line? Well, the governor comes out and trots out a guy dressed up as an alien. See, isn't that funny? <laughs> well, it's all done. Yeah, the, all weird, finished. the weird part is, like, you wonder if it's that the 52 press conference was handled by, you know, the feds and, and the people who really knew what they were doing, and the guy in Arizona is just sort of like a an out-of-the-loop fucking clown, so he handled it in a completely different way? Or has the perception of UFOs changed so much in the last, whatever, 45 years between the two events that in 52 you'd handle it this way? You'd go out, you'd be serious, you wouldn't, you know, ridicule the people, and you'd just give them some bullshit answer and they'd go away. But, in you know, in, in 97, the better way to handle it is to go out and shit all over the people and laugh at them, and then that'll shut them up. Like, they don't believe the government anyway, so let's just make fun of them. Well, in some ways it has changed massively, and in other ways it hasn't changed at all. The way it hasn't changed at all is trotting the guy out dressed as an alien for, you know, the concluding act and saying, whoop, what's that? Whoa, 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 and it's all done. However, uh, addressing it seriously, they do address it seriously to some regard. Uh, when this was going on for several nights, if not weeks, that the Phoenix lights were coming up and being discussed, and they were in newspapers, too. You really couldn't miss the Phoenix lights. It would be mentioned at some, some place or another. You'd come across it. Uh, I mean, a general came out. I think it was a general uh, from the Air Force who openly said, we don't know what this is. <laughs> if anyone <laughs> knows what this is, please tell us. But we don't know what it is. That's a pretty serious credential standing up in front of the world and, and making a major admission. Uh, and that's when you would have the governor coming out with a guy dressed as an alien, because we got to deflect this. Yeah. Uh, the government really doesn't want people paying attention to UFOs at all. They don't want them believing that they exist. They don't want them paying attention to them. They want the subject to be completely off everyone's radar screen. If they are thinking about it, then they want everyone scared to death about it, because that way they can trump up some money and they can get some support, because, oh, the government will protect us. But they really don't want anyone paying serious attention to the subject. They just don't. Yeah. And that's the type of thing that causes serious attention to be paid to the subject. So, of course, they're going to deflect it however they can, as soon as they can. And for the same reason they did it in 1952. The difference is, in 1952, everyone believed what the government told them. It didn't matter. If the government told them that uh, something was good, something else was bad, well, that's the way it was. Very few people questioned that. They went right along with it because everyone was prosperous. Everybody was happy. Everyone had their house in the suburb. Everyone had their nice job. Uh, everyone had you know, their, their two-car garage and their 2.2 kids or what have you, and they had a job with a pension, and everything was taken care of. We have not seen that since. And you will notice that you know, trust in the government has been dropping substantially, especially after Nixon and Watergate. Oh, that was a major one. It's been going downhill since. Yeah. Using that as the example and, and what we talked about, about how the reports dropped off, is there any discernible, you know, period of time when it seemed like, okay, this plan of ours is, is starting to take effect and people are no longer thinking of UFOs as seriously anymore? It was immediate. Uh, notice something in the administration that this takes place. Like I said, 1953 to 1964. What happened was... Uh, 1953, January of 1953, we have the Robertson panel, and immediately we have these, these flying saucer movies coming out with the desired effect. Right before that, we had three serious flying saucer movies that came out. Yeah. We had The Thing, we had, uh, oh, we had four, excuse me. We had The Thing, we had Day the Earth Stood Still, we had War of the Worlds, which came out into the next administration, but it had been made the year before. Mm -hmm. It was made in 52, came out in 53 and Invaders from Mars, which came out uh, right about the same time, I think. It was in 53. That was the last of the serious ones for a while. Right after that, in comes uh, Eisenhower, General Eisenhower. Everybody likes Ike. 
Uh, he's an arch conservative. He's way to the right, and immediately the CIA is working on MK Ultra. We have the ridiculous flying saucer movies put out, and immediately they are having the desired effect. And that carries through all the way to 1964, all the way through the time that Kennedy was in office. And so during that whole period, that there weren't any, I like, guess, thoughtful, well-made UFO movies. Yes, there were, but they were fewer and farther between. Now, interestingly. Like I said, it was a Republican administration. It was Ike, where the ludicrous ones came out. These are the ones that are you know, fully cooperating with the defense industry and saying, we will give you whatever you want. Uh, he changed his tune by the time he left office and warned us about the military-industrial complex and all of that. Yeah. But he didn't know at the time. He's just you know, waving the flag. He thought, these are good guys. They're doing good work. But he wasn't really paying attention to what was going on until he left. Uh, in comes Kennedy, and there's a bit of schizophrenia that happens. They're not all entirely ludicrous now. We're actually getting a few serious ones. And one in particular was The Outer Limits, which came on TV in 1963. The guy that helmed that show was Leslie Stevens. Leslie Stevens has as CIA a background as I've ever seen in my entire life. Uh, his father was an admiral, I believe. Uh, he came up with airplane arresting gear for aircraft carriers. He handled Russian defectors at the time. This tells you how high up the guy was. Okay. Yeah. Well, this is his son. And his son is also in the military. He was in Greenland or Iceland, I think, in World War II. Uh, when he was done, he worked for Time magazine, and he worked in a mental hospital as an orderly for a while. He has kind of CIA jobs attached wherever he goes. Uh, everyone called him a mover and a shaker when he was hitting the world, and they called him a young Orson Welles. Everyone compared him to Orson Welles. Huh. Uh, he had political ambitions, and he was a definite mover and shaker and very, very personable. Yeah. Well, he is the guy that came up with the Outer Limits. Uh, the Outer Limits is probably the most intelligent uh, UFO-oriented show that was ever on TV. There has not one, been one better since. And practically everything in it came straight out of CIA files. Practically all of it. Almost every episode. There were 49 episodes, 48 stories. One of them was a two-parter. Practically every episode not only had to do with alien contact, but it had to do with alien abduction. No one was talking about alien abduction back then. Uh, yeah, I had talked to Ann Truffle earlier in the year, and she talked about how the abduction thing didn't really explode until like the early 70s. So That's right. We had one report, actually two, once the Hills came out, but the Hills were a belated report. Uh, in fact, someone tried to draw attention to the Outer Limits and said, oh, you saw this on the Outer Limits, and that's coloring your report, which could not have been the case. But in any event... Uh, we only had one report before the Hills. The Hills were in uh, 62, I think it was, 61, 62. I'd have to actually look that one up. It was very early in the 1960s. Yeah. And they, they didn't go into therapy about that or go through sessions on it until about 63, uh, 64, I think it was. And then it wasn't written about until some time after that. Uh, but before that, there was only one UFO abduction case in the modern era that had been reported. And that was Antonio Villas Boas in 1957 in uh, South America. His was an entirely benign abduction, and it matches a hell of a lot of abductions that we've heard since, and down to details, I mean extreme details. Yeah. The only difference being that he did not forget. They didn't wipe his memory. They didn't do anything to him to make him forget. So we get the entire story uh, word for word start to finish. He could relate the entire thing. And that's what makes it interesting when you compare it to the other ones that are being brought out, say, by hypnotic regression or simply being remembered through dreams or what have you, or just gradually coming back and surfacing to memory. They match. There might be uh, just a couple of little things off here and there, but you can tell that it's very plainly the same thing and that they're seeing the same thing and experiencing the same thing. Well, in his case, he was picked up, and he thought they might have been robots. He didn't know. He was picked up by the little gray guys. They scared the crap out of him. Yeah, but they didn't hurt him. And once he realized he wasn't going to be hurt, he settled down and relaxed, and he was fine. It started, I think, uh, maybe a week before or a few nights before. He and his brother had been farming out in the field uh, at night because it beat the heat. And UFO appears over the side of the field. Well, they kind of go chasing after the UFO, and beep, it zips over to the other side of the field. Run back the other way, beep, back to the other side of the field. This went on for quite some time, a little cat and mouse game. And then it goes away. No harm done. It's just there. And when you stop and analyze it, it it's almost like a, it's a friendly game of tag, almost. Yeah. Plainly nothing malevolent. Someone was, eh, they're toying with him. But, eh, I'm just fucking with you. And away they go. Well, shortly after that, I don't know, a couple nights later or whatever, uh, they're in their room, and this bright light fills the thing, and they open it up, and there's this thing at the window. And they shut it, and they hide, <laughs> and you know, finally go back to sleep, and it goes away. Well, and then another night, he goes out, and he's farming in the field. And now all of a sudden the thing comes down and it lands. 
and it opens up, and it looks like uh, straight out of a Warner Brothers cartoon. It's Bugs Bunny and Marvin the Martian. you got this flying saucer that comes down. Three little landing pads come out from the bottom. Boop, it lands. Down comes a drawbridge. Out come the three little guys. His trailer dies. He can't move it any further. Uh, they catch up to him. They pick him up. They carry him away. They're little bitty guys, but they're really strong. And they pick him up, and they carry him on board. And uh, they kind of sat him down. They weren't able to talk. They talked in weird little buzzes and clicks and whistles, which to me today sounds kind of like what you might expect from a fax machine or a computer. Yeah, yeah. Some weird little thing like that. Like a dial-up internet. Yeah, exactly. But back then, no one would know what to call that. They're just weird twitters and, and clicks and chirps, I think is how they're most often described, which sounds like a fax machine. So uh, these things are plainly not hurting him. They take him on board, and there's really not much there. They undressed him. They kind of swabbed him over with some stuff. So... Uh, these things are plainly not hurting him. They take him on board, and there's really not much there. They undressed him. They kind of swabbed him over with some stuff. Uh, they took a little scratch off of his chin and got a little bit of blood, which didn't hurt. And it left a little tiny scar. He recognized he wasn't going to get hurt, but he didn't know exactly what to make of any of this. And they sort of walked him around and pointed at a few things. Uh, they weren't explaining anything, but, you know, like, <laughs> have a look around. What do you think? Pretty cool, huh? <laughs> And then they sat him in a room, uh, an empty round room for a while that had one bare mattress in it. And some kind of gas came out about waist level from the walls, which made him nauseous, and he threw up. A short time after, but he felt fine after. After that, out of the blue, the door opens up, and in comes this gorgeous girl. Uh, she's, I don't know, five, 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 six, somewhere in that neck of the woods, but she's stunning. Uh, she's stitch naked. Uh, she had blonde hair and red pubic hair, which was a uh, detail that was left out of his report at the time because he was embarrassed. He didn't even want to tell this story. The Brazilian Air Force got him to tell his story. He didn't want to talk about it. Yeah. He ended up going to see a doctor. Uh, I think it was a Lavo Fontes, uh, because he was. Well, he ended up having radiation sickness. He had mild radiation sickness, but they couldn't tell what was wrong with him at the time, and he recovered okay. But he, he just had mild symptoms of it, like getting too much sun, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, he wasn't doing too well, and he recovered all right. But Alvaro Fontes heard about the UFO business, and the next thing you know, the Brazilian Air Force wanted to hear about it. So he's there for um, a UFO organization. I can't remember which one at the time. It was one of the bigger ones at the time, and, and definitely one of the more serious ones. And there's a, a couple of representatives of the Brazilian Air Force listening to his story. But he didn't want to talk about all of this in the first place. They kind of dragged it out of him. So anyway, back to the story. Here's this stunner who comes walking in with a smile on her face, and her entire attitude is, hey, sailor, uh, and <laughs> they do it. More details that came out later. Uh, they had sex. Afterwards, she jacked him off at one point to get some more uh, specimen. Uh, when they were all done, uh, he was taken out, uh, cleaned up, given his clothes back, and before he left, before he went out of the flying saucer, which is pretty much what it was, uh, she gave him a wink and a smile, put her hand on her belly, pointed skyward, and gave him the decided impression that, thanks for getting me pregnant, a lot of fun, have a good one. And he was a little bit worried that he was going to get taken away himself by that particular implication. But no, they took him back down, and uh, he watched the thing lift up again, just like out of a cartoon, and pew, shoot off into the southwest sky. And there he is. He's fine. That was his entire experience. Say, so, well... Uh, I just got picked up, had a roll in the hay, and I'm not sure exactly what went down, but it sure was weird. That's his whole UFO experience right there. And yeah. there are legion of UFO abductees who have pretty much the same story to report. Yeah, and that one came out like in the... Which... 1957. Vegas. It actually came out... I'm trying to remember when that came out. It was not long after. It was probably 58. Because it, it, was, it was shortly after that that he started uh, exhibiting symptoms of radiation sickness. It, it wasn't published, I think, until about 1961. Yeah, but these themes of sexual elements... And uh, abductions and stuff were part of the milieu of of these uh, movies and stuff, right? Oh, absolutely. Way before fact, it came out. Yeah, in fact, the exact same year, American International Pictures, who made legion of these movies, Roger Corman was involved in that, and, and he's also got a CIA background like nobody's business. But a movie came out called Invasion of the Saucer Men. Invasion of the Saucer Men, uh, you have a bunch of teenagers who, uh, you know, they're out in Lover's Lane or what have you, and these great, big, enormous-headed, giant-eyed, Little green men uh, come after them. They attack a cow, first off. This was before one cattle mutilation had ever been reported. But they attack a cow. They knock people out. Now, there's one guy that they knock out. He wakes up and he doesn't have any idea what happened to him. 
and the Air Force is secretly trying to get into the flying saucer that these things came down in. Uh, and of course, no one believes their story when they try and tell them that, hey, these great big headed guys were after us, and yeah, 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 but they don't hurt anybody. Now, this is the movie that, now I'm not sure if it was a remake or a reissue, but didn't they take the attack on the cow out? Yeah. When that was remade by Larry Buchanan, Larry Buchanan made really, really extraordinarily bad movies. Uh, he remade a bunch of American International stuff in the 1960s, and that was about 66 or 67, an Attack of the Eye Creatures, which was a TV remake. Why would you remake this movie, let alone worse than the original? <laughs> but there's a TV remake of the exact same thing uh, by American International, tossed on a TV, and in fact, so bad that whoever was paying attention to the movie didn't notice that on the uh, title of it, it doesn't say Attack of the Eye Creatures, it says Attack of the, the Eye Creatures. The article, the, is listed twice. Well, plainly someone along the chain would have caught that and pulled it out, but no, they didn't. They left it in there, and they left the attack on the cow out. They also took out the uh, physical description of the aliens. They just put some kind of ridiculous mask on them, uh, along with, I think, visible zippers going up the side of some sort of a uh, black tunic or something like that. It might have just been a turtleneck. <laughs> I mean, you can see their sneakers at a couple spots. Yeah. Now, just to jump back a little bit in the chronology, we've kind of established here that the vast majority, if not all of the movies, you know, dealing with the alien subject and the UFO menace in the 50s were silly. But is there any sort of overarching trend as far as how the visitors, for lack of a better term, were portrayed? Were they always evil? Were they, you know, mostly evil, you know, or mostly benign? Or, you know, what, what sort of trends can we see as far as, you know, how the, the visitors vast were majority, they were either plainly malevolent uh, or comical. There are some intelligent presentations, but you can not with complete accuracy, but you can notice a difference between Republican administrations and Democratic administrations as to what take is going to be seen. For instance, during a Democratic administration, you are likelier to see a serious presentation of UFO material uh, or more thought-provoking and in a Republican administration, you are likelier to see a more laughable or ludicrous or evil portrayal of aliens. Interesting. Now, that the, is, generally speaking, there are exceptions. Now, at the risk of uh, psychoanalyzing, why do you think that is? Because Republicans thrive on fear, and Democrats are generally more interested in education. They are generalizations, definitely, but uh, I believe that your audience will agree. Republicans usually are big military backers. They're very conservative. I mean, anyone who supported Bush would, would be saying, oh, my God, yeah, the other probably are evil aliens out there. We better be doing something about them. <laughs> and just to sort of extrapolate, I guess, or, or elucidate more on that, do you think then it's a sort of like situation where, let's say, Ike leaves office, then Kennedy comes in, and then, you know, key areas and parts of the government are, are changed over into the new administration, and then, then those dudes – all of a sudden sort of like take the wheel, for lack of a better term, of the education program, and then they're like, no, we're going to go this way with it? It's schizophrenic. The president does not have ironclad control over this, and neither do the intelligence agencies. What you have to bear in mind is there is one faction that will always want to keep this secret, and that is mostly the defense industry. The defense industry does not want any of this getting out. This is where their bread and butter is. They're going to get all the money they want, so long as there's a space threat coming in here. All the money they want. If you look at things intelligently, if you take the fear out of it, or if you say, you know what, it's inevitable that we're going to have contact, these guys are going to fight you on that. They don't want to hear that. Yeah. So you can't put the word down and say, you will play ball, because they're going to say, who runs Thunderdome? Master Blaster runs Thunderdome. Who runs Thunderdome? <laughs> wow. I love that. <laughs> Just to sort of tie in the thing with Outer Limits to what we've been talking about here about the silly movies and stuff from the 50s, was there any differentiation between, you know, TV entertainment and film entertainment, or are they pretty much, you know, of the same ilk as far as trends and, and you know, portrayals and stuff like that? Yes and no. Uh, I would say generally TV carried over the same type of thing, but I noticed that probably the most intelligent analyses that were to come out or the most promising ones that were to come out, came out on TV. And they were generally under Democratic administrations. Uh, one was The Outer Limits under Kennedy, which was toward the end of his administration. In fact, he uh, was killed on about the seventh episode of that show, I think. Ironically, their scariest episode came out the week that he was assassinated. And during Lyndon Johnson's tenure, Star Trek came out. 
Uh, I would say that Star Trek and Doctor Who probably have been the most positive, influential science fiction shows that have ever been put out. Okay. Those came out during the Democratic administration. Yeah, it seems like that. Now, we're sort of like segueing and moving here into the 1960s, so uh, that's like sort of like the year of Star Trek and Doctor Who and The Outer Limits, right? Those yes, are, you know, those the are, they're all in the 1960s. Yeah. Uh, they were from approximately 63 to, what, about 69, I'd say. I mean, Doctor Who was ongoing, obviously, and, and Star Trek is a major franchise. Yeah, both uh, Who and Star Trek still going strong. Oh yeah, I'm surprised Outer Limits hasn't. Well, they try to make a comeback, I think. For uh, a while. They did make it. They made a very successful comeback. The, the new show was nowhere near as good as the original one. It wasn't bad. Uh, it was nowhere near as good as the original one, though. And it, it was not focusing anywhere near as much on actual UFO material. Yeah, and what I found interesting about because uh, you do an amazing job, of course, uh, sort of dissecting the Outer Limits, and we'll stay on that for a moment here, and just uh, how was the shows were about first contact and, and sort of looking at it from a number of different ways and angles, which and we'll stay on that for a moment here and just uh, how was the shows were about first contact and, and sort of looking at it from a number of different ways and angles, which is really refreshing compared to what I had read about earlier in the book and what we had talked about earlier, which was just this glut of silly movies and stuff. It was like, finally, something has come along here that's taking a serious look at this. Let me tell you what's most refreshing about The Outer Limits in particular. And again, we're talking about the 1963 to 1965 version, the original. It was intelligent. It didn't take a wide-eyed wonder view. It didn't take a view that they were evil creatures here to dissect us. It took a view of an intelligent human being looking at an unknown phenomenon coming from outside and trying to make sense of it and looking at it from the other person's perspective. In other words, it put us into perspective. It's like saying, you know what? Just like H.P. Lovecraft said, we're not even top of the food chain. There are things above us. But what does that mean exactly? What sort of relationship do we have to them? What do they want from us? What can we expect from them? Is it possible to have realistic conversation with them? Can we meet as equals? Do we have reason to be afraid of them? And there were episodes where, yes, they said, yeah, we might have reason, reason to be afraid of them. And there were other ones where they said, you know what? Uh, these guys are probably just like us, and they're just very intelligent beings, and they're trying to learn some things, and they're meeting with some flack. And they analyzed every single one of these aspects extremely well, I think, uh, and certainly in a way that did not – they never insulted my intelligence. And I don't think they insulted anyone in the audience's intelligence, and I admire that. Yeah, it is a stark difference between that and, and what had preceded it. It really does make you think how that came out of a previous decade of just junk. It's just weird. Yeah, and, and it is. It's almost like a little oasis in the middle of nothing uh, when you're suddenly getting an intelligent take on all of this. And mind you, it still had you know super cheap special effects and all that type of thing. But to this day, it's a major cult hit, and I mean, it, it grew just like Star Trek did over the years until it became legendary. And, and the TNT used to have semi-annual marathons that they would run of, uh, of Outer Limits all night long, and they were extremely successful. Now, do you think that uh, – now, this is obviously like psychoanalyzing and theorizing, but that's what we're here to do, I guess. Um, sure. Do you think that sort of that refreshing, thoughtful – look at, uh, you know, the possibility of contact and everything may have been born out of Kennedy's proclamation that they're going to space and all that stuff, because it seems like now yes. you... Okay. <laughs> yes, just to make it simple. I believe Kennedy was a very... Uh, let me just say this right up. Uh, for any of his faults, Kennedy was my favorite president. I think he was an extremely forward-thinking man. Uh, I believe he genuinely had everyone's best interests at heart and not just a privileged class. Uh, and I believe that he very much wanted to disseminate the information that he knew. Uh, he was not going to be able to do that, and he knew it. There have been other presidents like him. Jimmy Carter was the same way. I think Ronald Reagan, as misguided as he might have been, I believe he felt the same way also. Yeah, that's kind of like what I was thinking here just now uh, as we were talking about it, that maybe you know, Kennedy said we're going to go to space, and then it was like uh, all of a sudden going to space and everything became real and not a subject of uh, you know something that couldn't happen. Absolutely. Now, recognize when he came into office, he was coming in right in after Ike, who was a very popular president, uh, and who had come to a lot of realizations by the time he came out of office. Now, any new incoming president is going to be given a briefing by the old president. They're going to have a meeting in the office uh, so you can get caught up to speed. Uh, so now that, now that you've won, now that you've played the game, let me wear the honeymoon off of you really fast. Here's where the hangover hits. <laughs> and they start telling you the reality of what's taking place. It's like, look, you know what the news has had to say about what's going on with the Russians in this particular area? Well, let me tell you how bad it really is. And you start getting your real briefings. 
You know, the former president is telling you, the former intelligence establishment is going to sit you down and put you with the National Security Council and catch you up to speed. And then you got to roll your, your shirt sleeves up and dig your elbows in because it's some really serious stuff. So no matter what your personal take on something is, you can't just walk in and change the whole establishment. Uh, you are inheriting the stuff that came from the administration before. And you're going to have to deal with that at the same time that you are trying to implement what you want to do. So anything that Kennedy was going to do took a while. I mean, bear in mind, we had the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, we had all kinds of stuff that were taking place during his administration. And the Cuban Missile Crisis was extremely serious stuff. I mean, most of the world thought, or at least in America, uh, we're dead. <laughs> this, <laughs> yeah. this is it. And, you know, we've warned about the, the, warned about the nuclear nightmare. Here it is. So everyone felt like they dodged a bullet on that one very realistically. But there were, you know, three, four hours where it was the day the Earth stood still. They were all holding their breath and saying, oh, my God, I'm never going to see my kids again. And oh, it's man. after that, he's dealing with all this serious stuff, and he's still in – the MK Ultra project is still going on. By the way, there's a story on that when, when it comes to the Manchurian candidate, by the time we ever get to that. Uh, Kennedy helped Frank Sinatra come up with the money to complete the Manchurian candidate, which was all about uh, a mind-controlled uh, assassin out to kill a presidential candidate. Wow. And it was pulled from release because Kennedy was killed. <laughs> So, no multiple ironies there. Yeah, that is strange. That is that's really weird, actually. Wow. Well, you do make a point in the book around this time frame that we're talking about Star Trek and Outer Limits and stuff that just a lot of folks who were in the entertainment industry had an interest in UFOs and had their own UFO experiences. And I just sort of wanted to get your take on what seems to be, and I know Stan Friedman's written about this at length recently, sort of like the anti-UFO stance of, you know, the, the more famous sci-fi writers of, of this era, I guess you'd say, or the, the recent era, uh, you know, Asimov and Ben Bova and Carl Sagan. It seems like they're all anti-UFO, which is kind of surprising considering a lot of these UFO stories that we're talking about in the 50s movies and the 60s movies and throughout all this stuff, you know, was born out of sci-fi. Well, the others I can't say too much about, but Sagan I can say a lot about. Uh, Sagan, first off, was the government guy studying all of our information coming from the Mars probes. Remember that right from the start. Mm -hmm. He was the guy studying the data. He knew everything. He knew exactly what was going on. And he talked out of both sides of his mouth his entire life. When you got him up in front of the cameras, if you brought anything up about UFOs, you go, oh, well, there are billions and billions of worlds, and uh, suppose uh, someone must be out there somewhere. But you get him at an American Astronautical Society meeting in 1966, and in front of all of them, he'll say that it's entirely probable that the world was visited up to 10,000 times in antiquity by alien races, and that there were probably artifacts of those visits left on Earth, on the moon, Mars, and possibly Venus. So he talked out both sides of his mouth. It depended on who he was talking to. Interesting. Okay. That does it for this week's edition of BOA Audio Season 4 and Volume 1 of the Rocks Trilogy. Obviously, Bruce is going to be back next week and the week after that for Volumes 2 and 3. Come on back as we continue this really amazing conversation. While you're waiting for Volume 2 to get posted at BOA, you might want to swing on over to Amazon.com and order Hollywood vs. the Aliens. I can't put this book over enough. It is just fascinating and remarkably detailed. Definitely a worthwhile read for any serious student of ufology. So head on over to Amazon.com, order Hollywood vs. the Aliens. Then you can follow along with what we're talking about here during the Rux Trilogy. And now we move on to BOA Audio listener feedback. Got a couple of unique emails here. One's just sort of a general comment on... Bigfoot of all creatures, and the other one is a little bit of a frightening one, so just prepare yourselves, folks. The first one here comes from Desmond. No hometown listed, but I love the name, Desmond. Here's what Desmond has to say. I keep wondering, how long is it going to take Bigfoot researchers to figure out that Bigfoot isn't a flesh and blood creature? It's actually a demon, spirit being. For this reason, it will never be discovered, so they're only wasting their time looking for it. Also, it's the reason why a dead body hasn't been found. Demons can take many forms, such as animal, alien, and or a creature like Bigfoot. Proof that Bigfoot is a demon is in sighting reports such as vanishing instantly, being invisible, glowing red eyes, and immune to gunfire. Check out the websites Unknown Creatures and High Desert Bigfoot Research. Signed, Desmond. Very interesting point, Desmond. I appreciate you writing in. I presume... 
that this email may be in response to the Philip Spencer episode we did way back in February because we haven't really done a Bigfoot one in quite a while. I definitely have a foot in the paranormal Bigfoot camp. I find the creature to be almost too puzzling to be anything but having some kind of outside of the norm reasoning behind it. I don't know if it's definitely a flesh and blood animal. I have my serious doubts about that. So I uh, give credence to what you have to say, Desmond. I don't know about demon, though. Does that mean he's evil? I don't consider the Bigfoot necessarily evil, considering we don't have too many reports of Bigfoot attacking people or anything like that. But you also go on to say here spirit being, so maybe you just mean sort of uh, some kind of ephemeral creature of some kind. I don't know. But anyway, interesting point. Bigfoot as a demon. We have uh, put your word out there to the BOA Audio listeners. Check out those websites that Desmond mentioned, Unknown Creatures and High Desert Bigfoot Research for more information. And, uh, you know, keep an eye out for the Bigfoot. Could be a demon. We don't know. The next email is a little bit like Desert Bigfoot Research for more information. And, uh, you know, keep an eye out for the Bigfoot. Could be a demon. We don't know. The next email is a little bit troubling, my friends. I'm a little concerned about this one, and here's what it is. It comes from a guy by the name of Daniel. I've actually corresponded with him since we got the email, and uh, I, I'm troubled. I'm troubled. Here's what he has to say. Love your show. Fascinating. For your information, it appears the amazing Bill Zabel's ColumbineConspiracy.com site is down. Any idea what happened? I should have copied the whole site when I had the chance. I hope Bill is okay. Any info would be greatly appreciated. Signed, Daniel. This is why I find this troubling, folks. I actually got this email last week, right around when we were putting together the 1111 episode, and I was going to include this in the listener email, called William Zabel's house to get a word in with him to find out what was going on, got no answer, called again later after we posted the episode, still no answer, shoot him an email, no response, call him this afternoon before we tape the show a week later, Still no answer from William Zabel. We're putting out an all-points bulletin on William Zabel. As I said, I'm a little bit troubled by this. His other website, phantomchasers.net, is still up. But columbineconspiracy.com is down, and we don't know where William Zabel is at this point. And hopefully he'll turn up soon and get back in touch with me. I'm going to keep trying to call him. I'm going to keep sending him emails. And I'm going to keep you all informed about what's going on with William Zabel, because it is troubling. His material is tantalizing. You would not believe the feedback we got on the William Zabel edition of BOA Audio this past April. Flooded the mailbox at BOA HQ. So many people enjoyed that episode. So many people listened to it and were really taken aback by what Bill had to say. And... I'm tweaked out. I hope nothing happened to him because it's probably my fault because he hadn't really done too many other interviews. And uh, now he's missing in action right after appearing on Banal of America Audio. So, William Zabel, if you're out there, get in touch with us. We're worried about you, buddy. We want ColumbineConspiracy.com back up and running. And I'm tweaked. I'm really tweaked out, folks. I don't want to oversell this. I don't want to make too big a deal out of this. He could be on vacation, you know down in Argentina like that governor there. Hopefully he turns up soon and uh, he's doing well and he's okay, but I will stay on this story and keep you all posted on what's going on with Bill Zabel and ColumbineConspiracy.com. We've been talking here about Outer Limits and how it was sort of a change in the message as far as UFOs and alien civilizations and stuff like that go. And it was sort of the beginning of this change in the message that was going to happen throughout the 60s on TV shows. I guess what I wanted to ask to sort of bridge this thing, and, and as we had talked about before we started taping here, you know, it's so hard really to, to wrap your mind around and wrap your hands around this whole thing because we're talking about like a multi-decade thing as well as two different facets of media, TV shows and movies. Oh, it goes much further than that. It goes to bubblegum cards, comic books, uh, any kind of popular medium. Oh, wow. It was everywhere. Interesting. That, and it, it's not a, a, an ironclad change in the thrust. Uh, what happened was, originally, you had nothing but ridicule of the subject mm -hmm. or trying to keep it out of the mainstream. Yeah. In the 1960s, or let's be more specific, about 1963-64, exactly in the years that 
uh, or the year that uh, MK Ultra stopped with the CIA. Mind you, it just became another project and moved someplace else. Yeah. But officially, when MK Ultra came to an end, that was when suddenly you started seeing more educational stuff coming out. Now, there was still a lot of the ridicule. You still had Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea and Lost in Space and a lot of really silly space opera stuff. But you also started seeing more serious shows like Star Trek. All right, so you're setting me up in a good way here, and I like that. But I, I just want to sort of just close the book a little mm. bit on earlier. As we're going into this better scene of the 60s and better stuff, it sounds like it's coming out on TV. Did the movies stay silly and awful, or, or did we start to also get you know some quality movies with regards to the whole UFO phenomenon? Well, for the most part, uh, the movies have always more or less trivialized it. And you would have some occasional serious views, but they were still really low budget. The Brits came out with quite a few of them, and they even had some serious ones back in the 1950s. Uh, the Quatermass series springs immediately to mind. We get mm -hmm. Nigel Neal. Uh, so it's not like it was a brand new thing in the 60s. Uh, we'd had this kind of educational thrust, or, or an attempt at an educational thrust, um, early in the 50s as well. But when it comes to the TV and movies, uh, generally the movies still remained pretty silly. I'm trying to think of any serious ones right now. I mean, uh, I'm just kicking my mind around and saying, okay, what came when? Yeah, I couldn't really come up with anything, and I, I have a feeling, and we'll obviously get to this in a little bit, that that sort of sea change happened in, in the 70s, uh, mid to late 70s. Well, it certainly happened when Jimmy Carter took office. It's yeah. no question of that. And you saw some stabs at it when, um, in the early 70s, I would say, when Nixon and Ford were in, interestingly. Yeah. You said these shows in the 1960s when, you know, Outer Limits came along and then later Star Trek and everything, uh, you said these coincide with the closing of MK Ultra. Do you think there's some kind of connection between those two events that MK Ultra closed down, and then all of a sudden there was this change in the portrayal of of UFOs and alien civilizations? I'm positive of it. JFK was a very interesting president. Uh, he was so interesting that we can only start assembling what he was doing together decades after his death by unearthing what the CIA was doing and what it was that he had found out. Now, MK Ultra ran ostensibly from about 1953 to 1964. Uh, those would have been its actual operating years. Yeah. This was the CIA's mind control experiment stuff. Mm -hmm. Mind you, I'm sure that it didn't completely end at that point. It, it must have continued in some form or another. But officially, it was disbanded at that time. Now, right exactly at that time, Outer Limits was in about its seventh episode, I think. might have been earlier than that, a fifth possibly, uh, when Kennedy was killed. And the month after Kennedy was killed, that's when Doctor Who first appeared on the airwaves. So it was right at that time that there was this sudden change taking place. Kennedy was basically wiping out the CIA, and he was changing the thrust on a lot of things. Uh, I'm quite sure that UFO stuff was not the only thing that he was changing, but that would have been one of the things that probably was in his purview that he was probably that he was attempting to change. Yeah. So you think that this change was a result of Kennedy getting in there and, and making changes, and then all of a sudden the attitude about how we're going to portray UFOs and stuff changed? I believe he had a major influence on it. I don't think he was alone by a long chalk, but I do believe he had a major influence on it. Yeah, yeah. Well, it sounds like from what you've been saying and, and what you say throughout the book that there's all these different sort of factions at work uh, you know, debating what the public should think about UFOs, and then you can see that in the different movies and stuff that come out. Yes, uh, and that continued after his death. There had been some attempts before. There had been some, uh, Nigel Neal being an excellent case in point of trying to put some uh, serious-minded UFO material in front of people. Now, mind you, it's still more or less as drive-in entertainment, you know, something that you would see at the movies, but it's put out there seriously enough that you can actually ponder it and think about it. So it, it had already been sort of pioneered. But, yes, I think Kennedy was kind of pushing it in that direction or was attempting to push it in that direction. Yeah. One of the things that I wanted to ask you about, which I found really interesting, was just the whole influence on Gene Roddenberry as far as, like, UFO groups and stuff like that and the whole thing with the nine that you talk about in the book, which is really fascinating because it sounds like, you know, they were trying to, try to influence him to – embrace, you know, like a pro-UFO thing. And from what I understand, Roddenberry was kind of anti-UFO, which is surprising given, you know, what he produced. But he may have been, you know, in the know, so that maybe that was why he poo-pooed UFOs to, to people that asked about it. But I guess, like, talk a little bit about Roddenberry, the whole thing with the Nine, and of course Star Trek, and how that just became a juggernaut. Well, Roddenberry was a very interesting guy. He was quite visionary. Uh, he was a secular humanist, definitely, kind of an Aquarian, if you will, or of a Masonic mind bent, I would say. 
but he was definitely not in, in organized religion. He had come from a Baptist family in his youth and just considered it nuts. So he rejected that as he became older and very much became a secular humanist. I guess you could say he was kind of a Quaker, really. Um, and Star Trek, philosophically, you can see where that came out in Star Trek. Uh, he took a kind of a bold move by having an interracial crew, considering it was 1966. And in fact, NBC protested that. They said, we're going to get hate mail like you wouldn't believe down in the South. And he stuck to his guns and said, no, we're, I'm going to keep it that way. And they never got a single piece of hate mail, amazingly. Or at least that's the story that Roddenberry told, and I actually believe that one. Uh, and he wasn't preaching anything. He just put it into effect. Lieutenant Ahura was black. Sulu was Oriental. Uh, no one said anything about it, and that was the whole point. They're just there. They're with the crew just like everybody else, yeah. which back in the 1960s, this is pretty bold. You didn't see that kind of thing very often. So he was very, a very progressive thinker. He was far-thinking. Uh, I mean, we've it's so natural to us now that we can't imagine there was any kind of prejudice like that back then, but there was, and he was overcoming it in that particular fashion. And I think he was doing that with a lot of uh, his other philosophies as well. Uh, anyway, when that show was over, and you have to understand, Star Trek was kind of a fluke at the time. It was not a big hit. Uh, the thing was very low in the ratings. It was below Gomer Pyle, certainly. Gomer Pyle was actually a hit, uh, where Star Trek never really was a blip on the ratings. It was way low. Yeah. And the only thing that kept it going were letter-writing campaigns, uh, largely engineered by Roddenberry himself, I might add. He was a very clever guy. Huh. Um, and uh, some of the fans behind the scenes were doing the same thing. But it was lucky enough that they got pushed into a second season. And it got pushed into a second season because Gene Kuhn got involved and said, okay, look, uh, where the network is having some problems with this, let's just you know toss in a few other things. They tossed in the whole um, Federation not being able to intervene in other societies and all of that. Uh, and they, they threw some of the more recognizable props and uh, ideas into the series that we associate with it today. Yeah. Well, then it really took off. But it still wasn't enough to carry it through to a third season. So again, they pulled some manipulations behind the scenes. They managed to get the thing put back up for a third season. Well, NBC was kind of tired of it itself by that point. And, and again, if there is any kind of organized uh, attempt to put UFO material out before the public, it is not unilateral. Because NBC was actually trying to kill Star Trek. Gene Roddenberry was trying to keep it alive. And I believe there were people behind the scenes that were doing what they could to keep it alive as well. But NBC was kind of tired of it. It wasn't doing well enough in the ratings. They wanted to get rid of it. So even though they managed to get it into a third season, NBC kind of stuck Freddie Freeberger, or Paramount stuck Freddie Freeberger in there. And Freddie Freeberger was famous for killing any show that he touched. He did the same thing with Star Trek. Uh, he was like the last season guy for any show. So they, they deliberately put him there, and it worked. It killed Star Trek. Uh, the cast was kind of getting tired of being jerked back and forth, too, and the production team, and so they all kind of heaved a sigh of relief when it was done. But by having gotten a thing going for three full years, the thing became a mammoth hit in syndication a few years after. Now, at the time, Roddenberry could not have known that, and before all that took effect, uh, he was kind of depressed because Star Trek was his one big shot, and it, it had made him popular, but he was not a big hit. Yeah. And even for the audience that it did have, which was largely a cult audience, mostly of college students, he was a one-hit wonder, and nobody wants to be a one-hit wonder. So he kept trying to come up with different series, something that would succeed, and you may remember a lot of things, Earth 2, um, Cluster Tapes, uh, I'm having to really cast my mind back to recall any of these because they pretty much sucked. Uh, I remember these when they were on the air, and every time I saw Gene Roddenberry's name come up, we would run to it because to really cast my mind back to recall any of these because they pretty much sucked. Uh, I remember these when they were on the air, and every time I saw Gene Roddenberry's name come up, we would run to it because we were Star Trek fans. Say, oh, good, Gene Roddenberry. And we'd watch it, and it wasn't that good, and sure enough, it didn't take off. It was never picked up as a, as a series. But he just had a number of pilots that yeah. failed. So he's got this one semi-hit, a bunch of failed pilots, and he's kind of depressed. Now, we're getting into the early 1970s when he's really cranking out the pilots and they're really falling on their face. Yeah. Uh, he didn't have a whole lot of money. He wasn't really happy. And he bumped into a race car driver. I do not remember the guy's name. And the race car driver hooked him up with Lab 9, uh, which he had heard of. Lab 9 was sort of a proto-X-Files outfit, where this is kind of the way they were advertising themselves, uh, investigating paranormal stuff and UFOs in particular. 
And they claimed that they were in touch with extraterrestrial entities all the way back from ancient Egypt uh, and many thousands of light years out in space. There were like 24 different civilizations. I think that was the right number. And they all gave different names, and they all talked through trance channelers. Now, trance channelers automatically, big red flag. Yeah. Uh, well, Roddenberry was no fool either, and he was feeling the big red flag also, but he did check it out. Uh, and he asked some very intelligent questions of the trans channeler, I might add. He was nobody's fool. Uh, but these guys were not fools either. They recognize that when somebody's desperate, that's when they're going to believe whatever you... If you tell them something that they want to hear, they know that they're going to believe it. They'll yeah. be more prone to believe it when they're desperate. So uh, they're going after Roddenberry, and they're whining and dining him. These people had money. This was not a poor outfit. Years later, this was not all known at the time. We didn't know who all these guys were. Roddenberry didn't know who all these guys were. But they've got nice chalets. They've got nice uh, pieces of property out in the country, you know. They're not poor. Yeah. These guys were hooked up to intelligence. They're hooked up to the Bronsman family in Canada, who are multimillionaires. They're magnates. Uh, I believe they own one of the um, alcohol chains. I can't remember which one it is, though. And they, I'm sure they own a lot of other businesses as well. The point is, they got a lot of money. And one of the guys that was behind this was Dr. Andreo Puharic. Andreo Puharic is another one of those guys who, the second his name comes up, you know, start the carnival music. Oh, yeah. Uh, he was Yuri Geller's promoter, if you will. Uh, so he was almost certainly hooked up to Israeli intelligence, and he had been connected to the CIA, at least peripherally, with the whole remote viewing thing. And when they were studying psychics, uh, Zuri Geller was one of the first guys they brought in to study. And, of course, there's Andrea Puharic. Well, Andrea Puharic is behind Lab 9 as well. So automatically we've got some questionable or shady people uh, sitting behind this entire outfit. And, I mean, Roddenberry is gradually figuring some of this stuff out himself. Most of this, most of what I'm telling you now, that was not known at the time. This is all stuff that came out by diligent research years after the fact. Another person that got sucked into it right about the same time that Roddenberry did, I can't think of his name. He was one of the influential guys behind Stargate. And when we get into Lab 9, it, it's obvious how it shows up in Star Trek and how it shows up in Stargate. Uh, so they were starting to seed a chain here. The Lab 9 guys, whoever they were, were starting to seed a chain. Uh, the stuff that they were coming through with their trans channelers was really sort of vague, on one side and more specific on another. The specific side was they were saying that they were the original gods of ancient Egypt. This is where the nine came from. They were smart. They had an occult pedigree. These guys were not stupid. Mm -hmm. uh, the whole concept of the nine goes all the way back to ancient Egypt, and you'll find it throughout ancient mythology all over the world, but Egypt especially. You had the eight original creator gods who were the Ogdoad. They were headed by Thoth, who became the ninth, which made them the Aeneid, or the nine. Uh, you'll also find this carrying through to the formation of the Knights Templar. Uh, they were formed by, what, nine original knights. Uh, you can read that however you want to, but the point is it, it goes all the way back, and these people were not stupid. They knew that. So that's the pedigree that was being claimed by the extraterrestrials being channeled in Lab 9. This is the backstory, and this is what Gene Roddenberry was getting sucked into. Now, for a few weeks, he kind of showed up at uh, whatever retreat they were taking him to and listened to the trance channelings and asked some rather intelligent questions. Uh, when I read them, I'm, it's kind of obvious to me that he was trying to trip them up, and he semi-succeeded because they weren't stupid either. Uh, he would ask, well, if you're a disembodied intelligence, how exactly are you planning on arriving on Earth? They say, oh, yes, we'll be coming in metal ships. Well, why do you need to do that if you're a disembodied intelligence? Oh, we are disembodied intelligences, but these 24 races out here are not, and they will be traveling in spaceships, etc., so forth. <laughs> yeah. So they weren't stupid either. Uh, and it's very obvious that Roddenberry was at least half aware that someone was trying to take him for a ride. Uh, how much exactly this influenced Roddenberry is kind of difficult to say, and I will be interested to hear what... Peter Lavenda and anyone else has to say on this who's been doing some research. However, to a certain extent, whether he actually believed that he was talking to the nine original creator gods of ancient Egypt uh, or 24 civilizations out there in space, which went by silly names like Jehovah, you know, I mean, they're just kind of throwing obvious fake names out. Yeah. And this, they might be throwing you some legitimate information, but they're also pulling your leg at the same time. So it's a mixed grab bag. But whether he believed that he was actually talking to extraterrestrial intelligences or not, and I imagine he did not, uh, still, some of the influence of what they had to say 
and the philosophy behind it, you can see showing up in Star Trek, and especially Star Trek The Next Generation, uh, which I think it had rather an unfortunate effect there, and of course in titles like Deep Space Nine. As a matter of fact, the year after uh, he was being seduced by Lab 9, Space 1999 came out in Britain. And that was Gary and Sylvia Anderson. Gary and Sylvia Anderson have got government pedigree all over them, just up one side and down the other. Uh, it was Lord Lou Grodd that was backing their stuff. They were doing cheap uh, puppet shows for kids. Yeah. Fireball XL5, uh, the best of them was, uh, what was that? Captain Scarlet. Um, they did a, a couple of good ones, and they're also the ones that did Space 1999. Most of their stuff, really low grade. That was the joke with Lou Grodd, was Lord Low Grade. <laughs> uh, he was their backer. So, yeah, they had definite government connections there. And they had, like, you know, the, the Royal Marines were uh, performing routines for them at the end of their kids' puppet show movies. I mean, why would the Royal Marines be coming out and doing this? This is just nuts. So, so they had government connections is the point. Uh, and all these people are kind of loosely connected to Lab 9 or The 9. Uh, these are people that have been contacted by whoever this shadowy outfit is who's trying to influence them in some way or another. Well, Gene Roddenberry is probably the most famous name that they got uh, until this guy who was involved in Stargate, and I wish I could remember his name. He was one of the, the central guys behind Stargate. Yeah. For any of your listeners who are interested, if you really want to find some stuff out, just go Google uh, the Nine, spelled out exactly like that, T-H-E-N-I-N-E, -E, and put Gene Roddenberry's name with it, and you'll find some interesting articles pop up, uh, which we'll talk about exactly what I'm talking about right now. Exactly, yeah. So check that out, folks. I always encourage people to do their own research as well and not just rely on, on the guests because they, they might get sent willy-nilly. I'm not talking about you. Just, <laughs> just Oh, no, I, I wouldn't even exempt myself from that. Uh, I, everything I have is off of uh, public sources. I cross my T's, I dot my I's, and I cite my sources. And Absolutely. that's what everyone needs to do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you can't just take someone's word for something. You need to check it out. That's why you write books, for crying out loud, so that if someone, if someone wants to make a case or make an argument, fine. Uh, name specifics, and we'll go at it. Exactly, yeah, and the sources part of your book's monstrous anyway, so, uh, and I always, whenever I see that, I, I usually um, am pretty happy with, with the author, because then I know that they've actually done the research and not, aren't just making stuff up or trying to fit pieces in together. Now, one of the guys who requested that I do the interview with you wanted me to ask you about V, the series V, and it does kind of fill... They're, they're remaking V. I know, I'm excited <laughs> about that with the lady from Lost, so it should be, uh, it should be kind of fun to watch. <clears throat> And uh, you do mention V sort of in this part of the book, I guess, because uh, we're going sort of chronologically through the book. So even though we're jumping way ahead to the 80s. Oh, yeah, don't, don't feel bad about that. We'll, we'll be jumping all over the place anyway. That's what I'm, fi <laughs> that's what I'm figuring uh, as, as we're going through here. But, uh, but I guess just talk a little bit about V, because I always really liked the first movie and maybe the second movie, but I didn't really follow the series too much. But I did kind of like the story, because it was sort of an allegory for World War II and all that stuff. At least that's the impression I'm under. But uh, there obviously are huge alien UFO uh, implications with V, but it, just, it didn't sound like you were a big fan either. So I guess I'll just ask you about V so, so uh, the guy there who requested the interview can, can hear about it. Well, you're a fan of it, and, and I'm not faulting you for this. You're a fan of it because you were young when it came on. So it has a special place in your heart. Yeah. Uh, I certainly watched it when it came on, and uh, I was impressed by it as far as special effects went and all of that. The stuff is very plainly propaganda. Just about everything that came out in the Reagan years, if it had to do with UFOs, very serious propaganda. Uh, Reagan was very much in bed with the military and with the intelligence agencies and pretty much would give them whatever they wanted. So if they wanted to throw out propaganda, oh yeah, he'd be all for it, especially if it was going to scare everybody and he could get more money for Reagan with the intelligence agencies and pretty much would give them whatever they wanted. So if they wanted to throw out propaganda, oh yeah, he'd be all for it, especially if it was going to scare everybody and he could get more money for Star Wars. And you're not going to get more money for Star Wars than if you're about to be attacked by big, giant, evil, nasty reptiles from outer space, now are you? Yeah. This is the president who said that uh, in the event that we might be attacked, and he did actually use these words by beings from outer space, that we would join hands with the Russians and repel them. And he repeated that on more than one occasion when he was asked by interviewers, and uh, so did the Soviet premier, for that matter. Uh, people asked Gorbachev about that, and Gorbachev said, well, it's much too early to say anything about that, but yes, under such a circumstance, I imagine we probably would. 
So it did be, kind of become mainstream, and definitely that was Reagan's thrust. And the movies or the TV shows that came out during his administration very much had that bent, which was a complete reversal of what was happening under, well, not a complete reversal of what was happening under Jimmy Carter, but definitely a veer away. Yeah. Uh, anyhow, V, what have you got? The whole basis of this story is, look, they're here. They're in the skies. We can't miss them. Everybody knows. we got floating cities over our head. And down they come, wearing red suits and looking just like us, only they wear sunglasses. And uh, they're really nice guys. They're giving us cures to cancer. Uh, they're teaching us all kinds of fun stuff that we can do and helping us uh, maximize our efficiency. And they're just helping us out in every way they can. Although they're denigrating our particular brand of science, so the scientists are now being labeled like the Jews were by the Nazis in World War II, and everybody hates them and oppresses them and kicks them out of their jobs. And the reason for that is simple, because the evil invading reptiles, which is what they really are, don't want anyone who might be able to stand up against them. So who are they going to get rid of? The scientists. So they demonize them as much as they possibly can before anyone realizes what game they're up to. So obviously these guys are not human. They're lying. They just wear human masks, which are pretty convincing. And actually they're just really horrible, evil reptiles from another planet who are here to consume the human race as their food stuff. And that's pretty much the whole thrust of the series. That's all there is to it. Except, of course, that you have an underground... Uh, bravely fighting against the evil reptiles. And some people who are not wise to the reptiles' game, they actually think that the invaders are friendly and trying to help us out. And that's pretty much the whole series. There's not much more to it than that. It's kind of a simple shoot 'em up Yeah. Which, generally, that's what you were going to get under Reagan. Yeah, I do remember it fondly because I was a kid. I'm looking forward to seeing how they remake it and if it's going to be any good or if they can get some legs to it. Because, like you said, that's really all there is to it. So it's going to be kind of hard to string that out as a series, which I think is kind of what happened to it originally, maybe. Oh, yeah, I'm very curious, too. Uh, it, it just ran out of steam. It didn't have really any place that it could go, or very few places that it could go. They did play with the alien-human hybrid business uh, with oh, yeah. uh, Robert Englund, who, the friendly alien who, who actually kind of likes us and has a relationship with a human female, and, oh, look, they have a hybrid alien baby. So at least that much of it kind of came out. Uh, and as far as remakes go, yeah, it could be a lot better. The original Battlestar Galactica, uh, very well-intentioned, really pompous. But uh, the remake, quite good. We'll definitely have to talk about that when we get into, uh, you know, what's been going on since the publication of the book. Yeah, well, it seems like nowadays, too, with, with the new V, serialized TV sort of, like, made a comeback in the last few years. So hopefully uh, it'll, it'll do well in that regard. Because I don't remember... It seems like there weren't as many serialized dramas as they as there are now, obviously. Cable invigorated it. Uh, once cable came in, I don't know, that particular format just works especially well on cable. They don't do full seasons of TV like you catch on ABC or, or CBS or NBC. Uh, they're doing 13 episodes a season. So it's natural for them to kind of serialize it within a, a shorter and more concrete story arc per season. Yeah. I think that's what invigorated that particular style. Yeah. And then while we're in the realm of TV shows and, and that part of the book, uh, you do also sort of jump ahead and, and do a, a blistering critique of X-Files, which uh, you say really didn't have any accurate information about UFOs for the most part. And I, Actually, they were scattershot. Okay. Uh, I, I didn't mean to be nasty to the X-Files. I actually love the X-Files. It was a great, great fun show. Uh, I liked it all the way through to the end, even when the cast changes. But as far as actual ufology goes, yeah, it was just sort of a grab bag. I get the impression that Chris Carter grabbed the conspiracy theory of the day, pulled it out, and stuck a story on it. Uh, but as far as any actual ufology goes, yeah, there's some interesting stuff in there, but I have no idea whether he knew it or not. He, I think he hit it just by accident when he did have it out there. What do you think of uh, how it reinvigorated interest in ufology and stuff, which it seemed to be the case... Uh, like, there was this huge X-Files boom for ufology, not just here, but in the U.K. especially, it seems. Um, no kidding. And yeah, I was, very much so. And I was, I guess, just sort of wondering, you know, like, in line with your thesis about, you know, misinforming the public and disinforming the public, you know, do you think that that was just like a happy accident for anybody that might have wanted to use the program to... Oh, no, I think it was very strategic. They weren't exactly trying to educate the populace about UFOs. They were trying to interest the populace in UFOs, as opposed to simply demonizing them. Now, mind you, there's a whole demonic story arc behind UFOs in there. You've got alien shapeshifters and different races and some kind of wars going on, but they never resolve anything. They just kind of toss these tidbits out, which never go anywhere. 
And by doing that, what they're doing is tossing the subject constantly in front of everybody and making it look realistic. They're making it look not so much like it's crackpot anymore, but like serious people could, could actually regard it. Yeah. Notice when this series came out. It was right at the beginning of Clinton's first term. Generally, and this is not always the case, but just as we were talking about with Reagan, Reagan's a fear monger. The Republicans generally tend to go toward the fear mongering side of it, and the Democrats usually tend to go toward trying to get people to think about it. Whether they're actually trying to educate them or not, we can debate that, but they're at least trying to get people to think about it yeah. and not simply ridicule it or toss it out of hand. The X Files succeeded brilliantly in that particular regard. And practically everyone involved in its production team, uh, I gave a bio of a lot of these people in my book. They've all got beautiful CIA handprints all over them. If they're not actually CIA, the CIA would love them. They have upper crust educations. They've traveled. Mitch Pileggi's father worked for the Defense Department, I believe it was, or the State Department. Uh, they've got connections. They were getting around. So if you were going to hire people for a project like this, uh, they're definitely going toward the inside track. It was a wonderful show. Uh, people paid a great deal of attention to it. still immensely popular. Uh, we had just a recent sequel come out, which how many years has it been since that, sh uh, that show was canceled off the air? And they're still making movies. Yeah. <laughs> it's just amazing to me. That's how popular that show was. And, yeah, as far as anything stimulating interest, it's not answering anything, but it's just as far as stimulating interest, The X-Files is certainly the most successful show that's been on the air since... Uh, I would say Star Trek or Doctor Who and lately possibly Battlestar Galactica. Yeah, okay. That kind of closes the door a little bit on some of the TV shows we were going to talk about as far as the big ones of influence and stuff like that. The only remaining really big one that I can think of here from the from the 60s era was The Twilight Zone, and I just wanted to talk to you about that one because, of course, uh, you know, it remains probably one of the most popular esoteric programs out there. And uh, still on, obviously, like everywhere, it's still on all the time. All the time. It's an immensely popular show. I fully agree with you. It, it was nowhere near as good as The Outer Limits as far as getting accurate information out or getting people to seriously ponder them, truthfully. Mm -hmm. But uh, as an anthology show, everyone was crazy for it because practically everyone that we all grew up with started on that show. Uh, the Outer Limits had the same kind of claim going for it. These were up-and-coming actors who nobody knew, a lot of them. And now, uh, they're all name brands. Everyone knows who they are. They win Oscars. They're all over the place. Uh, so there's a fondness in everybody's heart for going back and watching these. The Twilight Zone, generally, was not interested in stimulating serious thought. It was interested in creating uh, fantastic stories with uh, an inserted element of irony, for the most part. But it did work. It, it caught everybody's attention, and definitely we all remember it, and to the point that we're still talking about it today. Then the question becomes, it's, still, it's a sort of form of, um, it's still entertainment, it's kind of background noise, so is there any actual accurate ufology in it? Well, yeah, there is, as a matter of fact, but it has the usual sort of spins attached to it. It's not like they're trying to be serious with it. They're trying to scare you with it a little bit. Uh, the famous one, of course, is To Serve Man, where you have the alien coming down named Canemite, of all things, and he deceives the entire human race into believing that his book, To Serve Man, uh, implies that he's here to help us all progress. What it actually is is a cookbook, and he's taking everybody and putting them on board the flying saucer, flying back to his planet, and cook them up in a pot. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Since we have so much material covered, we're just going to keep pressing forward here, and I wanted to talk to you about uh, one person in ufology that you do give a pretty tough critique to that I hadn't really heard much of the stuff before until I'd read it in your book. And, and uh, we generally try to keep the after school uh, uh, talk <laughs> oh, yeah. out of the show. But I did want to talk to you about this whole thing with Whitley Strieber because, uh, you know, you seem particularly critical of him and his abduction story and, and sort of just, you know, how, how it came along and was quite different from what we actually know about abductions. Well, what's funny about Strieber, I don't know why people take him seriously. And, and sort of just, you know, how, how it came along and was quite different from what we actually know about abductions. Well, what's funny about Strieber, I don't know why people take him seriously. If you've done any homework on Strieber, and no one has, that's the entire point. Uh, there was someone who wrote uh, the story behind Communion, I think was the name of the book, who did a very thorough um, investigation into Whitley Strieber. He's talking to Strieber's family. He's talking to his friends. Uh, he's investigating his stories. This is not my scathing critique. This is everyone else's scathing critique that I'm picking up and relaying. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm adding my scathing critique to it of one thing in particular, which is a story that he told UFO magazine. Uh, you have to remember, Whitley Strieber 
was the darling of the UFO community for a very short period of time. They then all turned on him. And I don't remember exactly what the inciting incident of that was. It probably had to do with Bud Hopkins. Uh, Whitley Strieber pretty much betrayed Bud Hopkins, and Hopkins never exactly trusted him that fully to begin with. So that started a slide away from everybody looking at Whitley Strieber and thinking, oh, this is the guy who can tell us everything that's going on. Yeah. Now, Strieber then continued to nail uh, his coffin shut all the tighter with such things as an interview in UFO magazine, which is where I blast him, because he tells a story. I don't remember who the interviewer was. I've still got the issue somewhere. I could dig it up, and I mention it in my book. It is listed. And they were asking him how come he'd kind of fallen out of favor. And he said, oh, well, I'm misunderstood, and I don't know why Bud thinks this, and I wasn't really betraying him. I was actually trying to help him. And everything that he says is incredibly self-serving and, and just not remotely believable. And I actually let him hang himself as much as I possibly can in my book. I just let him talk and then throw a spotlight on what it is he's saying. The guy makes no sense, and he contradicts himself. And in order to kind of defend himself to this UFO magazine interviewer, he said, well, let me tell you the kind of thing that happens in my life. This happened not too long back. I had the son of a friend of mine in the car with me, and we drove off the highway, and suddenly we weren't in our world. We were in another dimension. And I was freaking out, and he was freaking out, and he was yelling and screaming and trying to get out of the car, and I pulled him back in the car, and uh, we just didn't know where we were, and we were in a great panic, and uh, a short while later I pulled back onto the highway, and everything was perfectly normal, uh, and we were 20 miles further down the highway. Well, this sort of thing happens to me all the time now. B.S. I don't believe a single word of that story, and I don't think anyone else does either. Certainly nobody else who's ever been claimed to have been abducted by a UFO has told any story that ridiculous. And no single part of that story makes any sense. People do not act that way. If they had driven off a highway and found a strange landscape, you don't immediately yell and scream and pull your hair out and attack people. People just don't act like that. <laughs> but someone who's telling a, a BS story and trying to work up your emotions might tell a story like that, especially if he doesn't understand human emotions very well himself. And no, I don't hold a very high opinion of him for exactly that reason. All right, fair enough. We'll just leave it at that and suggest people do their own sort of investigation into uh, the whole Whitley Strieber story. Because as I said, uh, you really sort of painted him in a light that I hadn't thought of before because uh, I came along sort of after he'd already been entrenched in the UFO community and everything. So I didn't really realize that there was uh, this whole backstory to everything. So I'll definitely... Oh, and it, yeah, it's hardly that. There are a whole lot of stories like that. That's just one. We'll move in now to the sort of international stuff, because you do talk about a lot of the product, as far as TV and movies go, uh, that was coming out of the international markets, notably uh, the UK with, uh, you know, the Doctor Who and, the, and, as you said, the Quartermass trilogy and those stories from Nigel Neal and the James Bond films. And I guess the first point I want to talk to you about, we'll probably be jumping around chronologically again, but that's cool, is... Um, you talk about the changes in Doctor Who over the years, most notably Peter Davidson's or Peter Davison's portrayal of the Doctor, and you tie that in with Star Trek The Next Generation, and you make some really cool and interesting points about uh, just the whole way Star Trek The Next Generation was set up uh, aesthetically with these politically correct sort of tones and pro-corporateness uh, sort of mixed in there, and, and, and sort of how just to tie this back to the Peter Davis and Doctor Who, that was like sort of along the same lines, I guess you could say, uh, of aesthetics and, and theme. So I guess you know, so. I'm setting you up here. Go go wild, Bruce, and, and tell us about <laughs> a little well, bit about the Doctor Who thing and, and that changeover and, you know, what that was all about. I'll start with Doctor Who and Peter Davison uh, because Star Trek The Next Generation actually came after that. Yeah, yeah. Doctor Who, except for a few of us kind of nerdy geek people who get off on sci-fi like this, uh, Doctor Who had not been that known in the United States until shortly before Peter Davison took over. Then it very quickly took off. We're talking uh, early 1980s. The early 1980s, all of a sudden, bam, in America, this became an immensely popular show, Doctor Who. They started showing it on PBS, and a lot of people tuned in to watch. The next thing you know, it was, it was a kind of a minor phenomenon. Uh, you started seeing conventions in the United States for Doctor Who where, you know, a couple of years before, no one had heard of Doctor Who, except for a few geeks maybe or people who had traveled over to Britain and seen it a couple of times. And it was a super low-budget show. And Doctor Who, until about the time Davison hit, and even then not much, 
Uh, Doctor Who just did not have a budget. It was super, super bargain basement stuff. Uh, they were doing, you know, plainly visible zippers and plainly flopping rubber monster tentacles all over the place. Uh, there was nothing terribly credible about it. But the scripts were good. The scripts were fairly literate, and those really sold the show. That and just the conviction of the actors and the kind of chemistry that they had, it, it worked a kind of a magic, and people bought it. So it really started taking off in the United States. And exactly when it started taking off in the United States, the BBC, who owned Doctor Who, said, you know what, now we've got a hit on our hands. What do we do? Let's kill it. I don't think they deliberately tried to kill it, but what they did do was inject something into it that had never been there before. Now, this was right when Reagan was in office, and Reagan was selling everybody this whole youthful uh, vision of the world. Everyone is young, uh, everyone is a yuppie, and everyone works with this kind of teamwork ethic within the corporation. And this was very aggressively being sold at the entire time that Ronald Reagan was in office. So, what's the new Doctor Who do over in Britain? Well, the old Doctor Whos had always been older men. Uh, they'd always been very iconoclastic. Uh, they were kind of brilliant. They had un, uh, long and unruly hair, and they wore long scarves and tuxedos, and they, they were just very counterculture and very against the grain. All of a sudden, Peter Davison comes along. Peter Davison wears a preppy ice cream suit. He wears all white. Uh, he plays cricket, literally. And he's got this whole bunch of people traveling around with him, uh, like their own little, I don't even want to say corporation because that's not quite right. Uh, some wag once called it a, a bunch of fruits and nuts in the same bowl. <laughs> and I thought that summed it up pretty well. But the point was that the doctor was practically not doing anything on his own anymore. It was his whole team doing stuff. And the doctor was almost an extra in his own show. Well, this is just the type of thing that Ronald Reagan was trying to push. And Margaret Thatcher was not doing any different over in Britain. They were very much on the same page as far as that went. So this is one of those places where you can see a behind-the-scenes political influence affecting some form of popular entertainment. Now, when Star Trek The Next Generation came along, again, we've got Roddenberry, who hasn't had a hit in how many decades now? And he's getting older. Uh, he's starting to go a little bit senile. He had, a little, he had some problems with uh, drugs and alcohol. That was not talked too much until toward the end of his life, and even then a lot of people were reluctant to because we all hold a high opinion of Gene Roddenberry, and I still do, actually. I don't feel the less of him for any of this. But uh, he created in Star Trek The Next Generation the kind of show that he had originally wanted with Star Trek and which definitely injected some elements of the Nine. The elements that he injected in the Nine, and I can't detail all of these off the top of my head, but the characters themselves were based on the Egyptian gods. You've got, um, what's his name, Data is representing sort of the Hermes Thoth character. You have uh, Picard as Horus. Well, he's kind of the sun god. He might have been Ra. Uh, his very name, Jean-Luc Picard. Luke is light. And Jean Picard is an astronomer's name, famous astronomer. So um, anyway, uh, you've got these characters that are sort of mirroring uh, the Egyptian Aeneid, so to speak. Uh, Jordy LaForge is uh, Ta or Hephaestus, who, as he would be in the Greek, you know, living in the earth and creating all the magnificent metal things and all of that. You can find corollaries for each of the court characters this way. And it's fairly obvious, uh, once you examine them in some detail, that this is sort of the thrust that Roddenberry was going with on this, at least on an unconscious level. Uh, Anubis, Worf would have been Anubis. His name even sounds like a dog uh, barking. Uh, and he's dark. You know, he represents the, the dark guardian. You just see a lot of things like this popping up. And not everyone in the audience would pick up on that, but by plugging into universal archetypes, Roddenberry knew what he was doing. Yeah. Unfortunately, his particular style of storytelling happens to mirror the absolute worst style of storytelling that ever existed on planet Earth, and that is Stalinist Soviet socialist drama. In Stalinist Soviet socialist drama, this is what you get. There are no bad guys. There are good guys, and there are better guys. And a typical story goes like this. The better guys come across the good guys. They notice the good guys are not farming as well as they could be. So they teach these people how to farm better than they were. And then the people who are now farming better say, thank you, better people, for making us better people like yourself. We will now go and make us teach these people how to farm better than they were. And then the people who are now farming better say, 
Thank you, better people, for making us better people like yourself. We will now go and make other better people like ourselves as well. And the better people go off and say, that is good. We will make it so. And they go off and they make for better people like themselves. And that's exactly what you got for seven solid years on Star Trek The Next Generation. They almost never had a legitimate threat that they couldn't just talk away, completely unlike anything in real life. I would love to see people talk away all the problems in the Middle East. Lo and behold, it doesn't seem to work. Jean-Luc Picard would be able to do it, just because he's Jean-Luc Picard. You see the teamwork ethic being vigorously pushed at everybody? Because every single episode, sometimes twice, they get together for board meetings. The board meetings will take up the entire act. Uh, you come back from commercial, they've gone into the boardroom, and here's Jean-Luc Picard, who is the most pompous guy you've ever met. And he looks at everyone at the, at the table and says, what do you think, number one? And number one will say, well, uh, I think that we should defer to your wisdom, Captain. Good. What do you think, Counselor Troy? I sense great wisdom in your decisions, Captain. Good. What do you think, Jordi LaForge? Well, the Vip de Van Bow and X Times Square Y is this, which means we should do whatever you say, Captain. Good. Make it so. And that's what you get every single week. There's just nothing to it. It's seven years of proto-political correctness primer, uh, because you can't lose your temper, you can't call anyone a name, you can't fight, uh, you just have to talk through everything, and you always have to agree with the guy up top. Or at least that's how it always turns out anyway. Yeah, yeah. You elucidate this whole undercurrent that probably a lot of people would never even think of uh, that, that's being fed to them by the program. It's, uh, it's fascinating. To sort of stay in the UK realm, we have a writer here for Banal of America who is a huge Nigel Neal fan and uh, loves the Quartermass series. So I guess talk a little bit about the influence of Nigel Neal on this whole genre and what Nigel Neal may have known. Uh, maybe he was uh, had some connections, I'm sure you will tell us. Nigel Neal was one of the most intelligent science fiction writers who was ever around. Now, I don't believe he's still alive, but I don't remember having heard that he died either. Uh, his connection would have been through, um, it's not the Royal Academy, what was it? He won some kind of a contest when he was uh, 28, I believe, a writing contest. And uh, he had gone to some particular academy and learned writing or something of this nature. Uh, in any event, if the BBC wanted good writers, the BBC is, is definitely government connected. It's owned by the government. So if they were looking for good science fictional writers to back them, trust me, if I were in their shoes, Nigel Neal would be my pick. This guy wrote extremely intelligent extraterrestrial sci-fi. It's practically in his blood. Uh, his first story was the Quatermass Experiment, which uh, I believe it was released as The Creeping Unknown as a movie, and the, the movie changed a little bit from the series. These were all done as uh, BBC serials. They went six episodes, uh, I believe about a half hour each. This was in the 1950s, okay? I think his last one was, uh, when was it, 55, 57, somewhere in there. Uh, he was like early to mid-50s, maybe late 50s, okay. or to the late 50s, rather. And he would have these little six-episode mini-series, uh, little serials that came out, that, like Doctor Who, were filmed on a pretty low budget, but the scripts were extremely intelligent. In the first story, he had a running character named Professor Bernard Quatermass. And Quatermass was this guy who was a government rocket scientist. He was trying to get us to out, out into space and out to the moon and on the way to Mars, which is exactly what uh, was being done in the government at that time. We had brought a lot of the German Nazi rocket scientists over here, and so had the Russians, in order to get us to the moon, to get us to Mars. So, in a sense, what you've got is a, a kind of an anglicized version of that in Professor Quatermass. Well, in the first story, his first astronauts into space are infected by some space spores, and no one knows exactly what happened to them, because two of them have just vanished from the craft. It crash lands back into Earth, and... The other guy is completely mute. He seems to be catatonic and in shock. He can't tell us anything. Well, that guy ends up escaping, and we gradually figure out that he has been infected by an alien life form, which is now mutating him into a fungus, which is getting ready to germinate and spore. And if it does that, well, it's pretty much going to blanket the entire globe, and it's going to take us over pretty quick. Yeah. So Quatermass manages to track the mass of... Uh, gestating space spore down and appeal to the astronaut that's still inside it. And the astronaut basically commits suicide in order to save the planet, which is very noble. In the movie, they just electrocute it because the rest would be too cerebral. <laughs> but it was a pretty intelligent script, and it provoked a sequel, Greater Mass 2. And they made a movie of it called The Enemy from Space, I think in 1955. 
Uh, in this one, uh, Quatermass discovers that little tiny spaceships are landing on Earth and firing some kind of implant into passers-by. Once the implants are in the passers-by, they are possessed by an alien intelligence, which acts like a hive mind. That hive mind has taken over the military. The military is using its secret bases to create a giant alien life form, which they are masquerading as a, a food plant. They say, oh, this is just a food plant that we're operating up there. No, they're just dating alien life forms up there. Well, Crater Mass manages to destroy their base and get rid of the evil invading aliens. Pretty intelligent script, especially considering what it was. The third one is where he really hit pay dirt. That was Crater Mass in the Pit, which was released as Five Million Years to Earth in 1967. Now, some of your listeners will remember this movie. Uh, this thing, uh, John Carpenter was talking about doing a remake of this some years ago. He would probably mess it up. That's no insult to John Carpenter. I just He, he kind of did his stab at it in Ghosts of Mars, which sucked. And uh, But he was kind of basing it on this. Okay. Uh, anyway, uh, five million years to Earth, some workers in the London tubes stumble across a skeleton. Well, the skeleton ends up being five million years old, and it's of an erect human being. A primitive human being, yes, but an erect one. So archaeologists are now sealing it off and digging it up, and they happen to find something else. The something else that they find looks to be like an unexploded V-weapon from World War II from the Germans. So again, it's cordoned off. The military gets called in. They examine it. Oh, guess what? This is not an unexploded V-weapon. This is a spaceship. They open it up, and there are three arthropod creatures inside. They look kind of like giant grasshoppers. They've been dead for a long time, and they decompose quickly once the ship is breached. But gradually, the military and Professor Quatermass are putting together a story. And the story is this. This ship came from Mars. It was bringing early engineered human beings, which they had created. They had made this race themselves. And then they died. Apparently their planet was dying off, and they created a sort of a proxy race in their place, which is us. Well, the government doesn't want to believe this, but they do believe it, based on the evidence that they have. And they try and cover it up as best as they possibly can, and tell the people, uh, look, this was just an unexploded V-weapon, it was a propaganda thing, uh, it served its purpose a little late for the Nazis, what the Nazis wanted, but we all swallowed it, and, you know, let's all have a laugh and move on. Unfortunately, the ship is still alive. It's got energy in it, and what that energy does is connect to the race that these Martians created, and it programs them to kill everyone who is not like them. In other words, every time they came up with a new species of man, every time they did an upgrade, they programmed the new species to murder the old species. <laughs> Get rid of the old model so you can take their place. And all of a sudden, most of London is bashing the rest of London to death until one of Quatermass's friends figures out a way to ground out the energy mass and save the day. It was an extremely intelligent script. It was very, very well done and very well received, both as a series and as a movie. Uh, unfortunately, it's not on DVD right now, which is quite sad. I'm hoping they re-release that pretty soon. It's an excellent movie. I highly recommend it to anyone. Now, you've just gone over like all these things that were in the in the Quatermass trilogy, traveling to Mars from the moon. That I presume the like you know the everyday person didn't know was secretly going on that the government exactly. was hoping. That's the whole point. And alien implants, and then this ancient astronaut stuff, and and the whole uh, relationship with Mars. Like, how much do you think? Nigel Neal really knew, do you think he was like getting some inside info or suggestions, or do you think he was just a visionary? I cannot prove that he was getting inside information, but I believe he was getting inside information. One way or another, I think he had inside information, and I do not know what that is, and I cannot prove that. Okay. He did have a couple of other stories that are well worth mentioning. Everything he wrote was well worth mentioning, really. He was an extremely good science fiction writer. You've probably seen his stuff and not even known that you've seen it. Uh, one of those was a thing that was put on British TV called The Stone Tape. I believe it was in 1972. Uh, it never aired in the United States, and I would love to come across a copy of it myself. But in that, he's got a team of psychic investigators who are investigating a haunted house, and they plan to sort of strip the ectoplasm out of the house and exercise it. Well, right at the beginning of this uh, show, there's a guy that shows up with some of their electronic equipment, one of their team, dressed as a Martian with antennae. And they make fun of him and they mock sacrifice the Martian and then they get on with the story. But there's no reason for this to be there. Except if you look at five million years to Earth and connect it with this, then you get an impression that Nigel Neal views Mars as a place of ultimate evil because that's what he was trying to make it out as nears to Earth and connect it with this 
then you get an impression that Nigel Neal views Mars as a place of ultimate evil, because that's what he was trying to make it out as in uh, Five Million Years to Earth. And what happens in the stone tape, once they succeed in stripping away the ectoplasmic evil from this house, they actually awaken a far older and more ancient evil underneath it that's a great deal more powerful. And since he was seeming to equate Mars with that in the beginning, and he definitely had that sentiment in Five Million Years to Earth, you have to wonder if there's a connection there. Interesting, yeah. I know that uh, our writer here, Richard Thomas, will be flipping out when he hears this stuff because he's huge. Uh, he's a huge Quatermass fan, Nigel Neal fan. And, oh, me too. And Doctor Who stuff. I'll have to put you guys in touch with each other. And, and hopefully the DVD producers out there are listening because the entire Quatermass series does not exist on DVD. And we really need to get it out there. Yeah, I've heard so much about these films that I'm, I really want to see them and check them out. So I hope it does turn out to, to happen soon. Oh, they're excellent. I mean, you know, they're not state-of-the-art special effects, but you don't care. The stories are so good, and they, they do it with such conviction, you don't care. And then, uh, not necessarily in the UFO realm, although it does have UFO elements to it, what you talk about is the, the whole James Bond series and, and Fleming's spy work and how, you know, that pretty much conveys, really, uh, that there are sort of intelligence messages being put into popular culture, films and TV shows. Ian Fleming is ironclad proof that the government not only knows that inside information is being put out in entertainment media, but that they are financing, backing it, and approving it. He is living proof, or he was living proof at the time he was alive. I can prove that like this. The story of From Russia with Love. This was written in 1957. It was one of uh, John F. Kennedy's favorite books, which is what put Ian Fleming on the map, by the way. Uh, he was a semi-successful uh, author before that, but once it came out that Kennedy liked reading him and liked From Russia with Love especially, yeah. suddenly Ian Fleming was on the map, and then the movie started to get made. Ian Fleming, in that particular story, uh, for, I'm sure all of you have seen uh, or read uh, From Russia with Love at some time or another. Cast your mind back, and what's the plot? The plot is the Russians want to embarrass the British Secret Service. And in order to get the British Secret Service bought into a plot that they have so that they can get someone uh, ensnared and caught in a, a honey trap that they can then publicize to embarrass MI6, they have to put out some bait to get a high-profile person, and they want to get James Bond. So how do they do that? They have a thing called the Lecter device. The Lecter device is the ultimate decoding device. The West doesn't have one, and we want it really bad. So they don't put a fake collector device out there because they know that we'll detect that. They put a real one out there, and an, enough of a cover story that MI6 is going to buy it. And even if they don't buy it, they're still going to go for it because they can't pass up the opportunity. And that's exactly what happens. Well, we end up getting the lector device, and James Bond ends up uh, surviving this particular encounter, and MI6 is not embarrassed. In other words, it ends up being a rout as far as the Russians are concerned. But... The point of the story here that I'm trying to get at is the Lecter device. This decoding device is what in World War II would have been called Ultra. This is what Bletchley Park was doing. Uh, this was the top secret of the war. That's why they called it Ultra. And the secret was that from Dunkirk on, we had cracked, the Brits had cracked the German code. The German code was done through an Enigma machine. This Enigma machine was so complex that it could not be cracked. We had the best minds in the world working on it, the best cryptanalysts. No way could we crack it. It managed to be cracked because we got some of the actual code wheels from an Enigma machine, which were smuggled out through the Polish underground, as a matter of fact. Now, we couldn't let the Germans know that. But this decoding machine enabled us to pretty much run World War II from behind the scenes. We were literally looking over Hitler's shoulder with everything that he did. It started to fall apart after D-Day because then they weren't relying on it so much. They were relying on normal intelligence channels, and that made it harder for us to actually work. We, we sort of lost our advantage at that point. But up until then, between about Dunkirk and D-Day, this was the ultimate secret, and, and we had it. Could not let the Germans know we had it. Well, this Enigma machine is exactly like the Lecter machine in From Russia with Love. Who was Ian Fleming in World War II? Ian Fleming was one of a very few people that was on top of the ultra-secret. He knew all about it. Maxwell Knight, his superior, was the head of British intelligence at the time, and Ian Fleming was basically his number two guy. He was sort of like his secretary. Uh, Fleming, more or less, ran the secondary decoding unit in Jamaica, which is where he had his home golden eye. And when the United States was briefed on all of this, there were only three people that ever came over here to do it, and one of them was Ian Fleming. 
That's how high up on the intelligence chain Fleming was. Yeah. His own intelligence colleagues, William Stevenson being one, testified to the fact that Fleming was putting true facts into his spy stories. He said, yeah, this is not a secret. And more than one of his colleagues said this. He said, yeah, he's taking true stuff and putting it in there. He's fictionalizing it a little bit. But yeah, he's putting it out there. So plainly, he was taking the Enigma machine and making it uh, the Lecter machine. And the intelligence community knew that and let it be done. Why? Because they knew that information was going to come out one day, and they wanted to gradually get the public used to it. And what better way to do it than an entertainment form that you don't have to take too seriously, but that you can give some serious thought to? Perfect way to begin getting information out. Exactly. So what might you have known about UFOs? Quite a bit, actually. In the book, Dr. No, as opposed to the movie, in the movie, Dr. No is humanized a bit, but in the book, Dr. No is a UFO gray. He's described exactly as a UFO gray. He has a bald head in a reverse teardrop shape. He has unblinking, solid black eyes, which are enormous, and he's able to tap them with his metal claw hands without blinking. He feels no pain. He seems to glide and float across the floor. He wears a skin-tight gray kimono. He's a UFO gray. What does he do? He topples rocket flights, which is exactly what UFOs were doing, and the general public was not aware of that at that time. We're talking like 1962. Mm -hmm. And in fact, he wrote the book earlier than that, like 1957, 58, uh, right before the Juno 2 deflection, as a matter of fact. The Juno 2 was one of the famous deflections that was done by UFOs. Well, that's what Dr. No does from his secret Spectre Island. Spectre's always on an island of some sort. <laughs> and what does he do when he's not toppling uh, rockets? He abducts human beings, and he performs torture tests on them. Rather interesting. Yeah, and way before a lot of this information even got into the knowledge of the mainstream, even the, even the UFO researchers. Long before any of this became public. Uh, also, in um, there was another one in particular, uh, on Her Majesty's Secret Service. Blofeld's secret plot. Blofeld has a round hideaway on top of a mountain, which is accessible solely by private aircraft. What he does in that hideaway... He has a number of beautiful women from different countries who ostensibly he is curing of their allergies, but what he's actually doing is hypnotizing them at night to become his sleeper agents. Now, every night they tune into his broadcast by post-hypnotic command, and he tells them what to do. He's given them sabotage equipment to go out and perform some act of sabotage if he gives the order, and they don't even know they're doing it. James Bond finds out about it. They end up shutting the operation down, but that is Blofeld's secret plot. Yeah. Uh, hello? Yes, welcome to McDonald's. Can I help you? Oh, hailing frequencies open, huh? <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, we're going to get uh, uh, two McChicken sandwiches and a Diet Coke and... Uh, uh, what do you want, Michael? A McDLT. No, I already told you they don't make those anymore. You know, sometimes it's a regional thing. You could ask. No McDonald's anywhere makes a McDLT anymore. You're listening to Banal of America Audio. I'd love a shamrock shake if they got any of those. It's September, Jonathan. Stewie, can I take this... Headband off. No, LeVar, you're blind. That's the only way you can see. I'm just saying they have all the ingredients for a McDeal. Just hang on, all right? There's a lot of us. There's a lot of... It's a big order. What time do they stop serving breakfast? It's three o'clock. Some of them serve breakfast all day. No, they serve breakfast all day! And then uh, to stay in the, in the realm of Britain, let's talk a little bit about Alternative 3, which I found really interesting and, and still sort of like hangs around in the world of ufology and, and conspiracy as if... Alternative three was really a plan at some point, and uh, it's you know some people still kind of debate that issue. But there was, of course, the Alternative three program that I believe probably kicked it all off. Although I'm sure, I think maybe it was based on a book, or maybe the book came out afterwards. The book came out afterwards. I, I had to ch I, mean, I spent a lot of time chasing all this stuff down myself because it's a very difficult subject to research. Uh, what which came first, the chicken or the egg? Where did this exactly come from? Uh, this came from, uh, was it ITV or was it Channel 9? I can't remember now. It was one of the stations in Britain which had a science show, uh, which ordinarily just talked about you know, actual scientific subjects. Well, on this show on one day, they had Alternative 3. And Alternative 3 uh, was a very documentary-style presentation uh, of a story that went something like this. There's a brain drain going on in Britain, and this was a real phenomenon, by the way. This was actually happening, and it happened more after this show was on than, than at the time it was going on. The brain drain is pretty much what happened with Star Wars. Reagan was pulling a lot of people over here, some of the best people from Britain, to work on uh, top-secret weapons projects. Who, as a matter of fact, a lot of them died under unusual circumstances years after the Alternative 3 and all this stuff. Hmm. But anyway, the reason I'm 
uh, top secret weapons projects, who, as a matter of fact, a lot of them died under unusual circumstances years after the Alternative 3 and all this stuff. Hmm. But anyway, the reason I'm getting at that is because of what Alternative 3 is about. And this was in 1977, mind you. I mean, Reagan didn't come in until 1981, and uh, the brain drain was pretty much taking place then. It had begun a little bit before that during Carter's administration in 77. Yeah. So... That's the background of this. Someone's investigating the brain drain in Britain. And the story that comes out in Alternative 3 is that the brain drain is being done by some nefarious uh, higher-ups who no one can exactly name, who are connected with a bunch of evil extraterrestrials who are out to kind of mine the human race. And what's happened is that a cabal of very powerful people are in cahoots with these aliens, uh, to sell out the human race and save their own skins when the planet is destroyed. So they'll become the new kings of the world or what have you. Well, it gets into very elaborate backstories. Uh, we had a war on the moon with evil aliens, and that's what we discovered there. One astronaut wanted to blow the whistle, but they locked him up in an asylum and he hung himself. Uh, the astronaut's name is Bob Groden. You don't have to go too far to check a little bit of history and find out that there is no astronaut named Bob Groden, let alone we haven't had any astronauts that have been uh, committed to an insane asylum or have hung themselves. But when someone's watching this as a TV show and in Britain and in 1977, they don't know that. It's going to take them a while to dig that up. And since this is all put on a factual science show in Britain, or that's what it had always been prior, all kinds of calls started flooding the station. They said, what the hell is this? Uh, there were a whole lot of people that bought it, and there are some people who still buy it. That's how effective this was. Now, it was immediately exposed as a hoax, and, of course, the station admitted to it being a hoax. They said, oh, no, no, we planned on this as a hoax. See, this Originally, we were going to uh, put it out on April Fool's Day, but uh, it got delayed. We couldn't put it out that day, so we put it out this time instead. Yeah? Well, why didn't you tell everyone right at the start that that's what you were doing? What exactly were you guys trying to do? Yeah. Now, plainly, someone was funding this behind the scenes, and plainly, they were getting the exact effect that they wanted. Now, what's interesting, mind control figured into this story. Uh, these scientists were mind controlled, and when someone wanted to get rid of them, all they had to do was give them a post not a command, and they would kill themselves. Right at the time that this show came out in Britain was when the church committee in the United States was investigating MKUltra, the CIA's mind control project, which was involved in stuff exactly like that. In other words, if I wanted to sour the public on this particular subject, that would be a really good way to do it. Yeah. Now, who would want to do that at that time, and who would have the resources to do it? The government. There you go. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's a fascinating story. I've always been kind of weirded out by the whole Alternative 3 thing. And uh, as I found out more about it, when I first got into this, it sounded like this was some kind of real thing. And then I found out more about it, and I was like, wait a minute, this was like a War of the Worlds type thing. Oh, yeah. It was hardly the only instance either. There were two or three other shows like that on TV. I can't name them off the top of my head right now. I do have them in my book. Uh, they came out during the Reagan years, as a matter of fact, and one of them later, uh, I believe it was during Clinton's administration, uh, the last one. One had to do with a bunch of rogue scientists uh, taking an atomic device and putting it on a uh, ship in a dock and basically holding the world for nuclear ransom and saying you will either unilaterally disarm or we will detonate this to prove how serious we are about nuclear weapons and show everyone the horror of it. Well, this entire thing is done in documentary style, and throughout, this goes on for like two hours, throughout there's a little thing running across the bottom of the screen saying this is just a dramatization, this is just a TV show, <laughs> you can look it up in your TV guide, this is a fake. But a whole lot of calls came into the studio asking if it was legit. And this, like I said, it was not alone. That was one story. Uh, there was another one that ended up with extraterrestrials uh, throwing rocks at us from outer space and trying to destroy us, or that was how it ended. At first it was just, uh, apparently we're in the path of a big comet or asteroids or something like that. But at the end of the thing they're saying, my God, it seems these are being intelligently directed by some kind of in something out there. And this was another one of those documentary-style things. Interesting, interesting. So you think some of this stuff is just to, like, test the waters and see what people, how they'd react? Oh, yeah. Uh, I believe it's partly to do that. It's difficult to say exactly what they intend. It's really kind of hard to put yourself in their shoes. Yeah. But like I said, if you look at something like Alternative 3, I can easily come up with a reason why they would want to be sowing the idea that mind control is fiction. Uh, so something similar must have been at work uh, with the extraterrestrial thing throwing rocks at us. 
as far as something with the nuclear threat and the scientists, I'm pretty sure that that was just up there to scare everyone again into supporting whatever Reagan wanted, so to speak. Yeah. They're like, well, you know, we got to have this particular thing. We have to have Star Wars. Nukes are very scary. See how scary nukes are? Look what these guys could do. And it's a subliminal thing. Yeah. And then just sort of to wrap up the international stuff, uh, you do mention, you talk a lot about, you know, some of the imports and, and, and stuff that was coming out of Japan with relation to UFOs, and you say that uh, the Japanese portrayal of UFOs is more benign as opposed to uh, the American take, and I guess I just wanted to ask you, you know, what, what you think is the reasoning behind that? Maybe they know less about UFOs than we do, or, or they just, it's just a cultural difference, I'm not sure. I'll tell you the truth, I'm curious about that myself. I believe it's probably a cultural difference. Certainly early on with the Japanese stuff, it was all threat-oriented. And, uh, and it was all American finance, too, I might add. This was after the war. Mm-hmm. But, and during the 1950s and 1960s, uh, including with the Godzilla movies, which frequently had flying saucers with them and people from Mars, uh, literally. Yeah. Uh, you have evil aliens uh, coming down to destroy the Earth in one fashion or another, sometimes employing Godzilla to do their dirty work for them, or Mothra, or Rodan, or whoever. But the point is, evil aliens coming to Earth, mind-controlling human beings, and uh, sabotaging us and trying to blow us up. The UN gets together and they talk about it and they say, oh my God, evil aliens coming from the moon and Mars, how do we stop them? And they come up with beam weapons which knock their flying saucers out of the skies. There are all kinds of Japanese movies that were American-made or American-financed that fit exactly the plot that I just told you. A whole lot of them. It was in the 1950s and 60s. When you get into anime... When you start getting past the 1960s and into uh, manga and anime, completely different thrust. Suddenly, extraterrestrials become a source of humor, uh, of comedy, and uh, basically the sitcoms, I think is a good way to put it. The standard plot for an anime or a manga is uh, some space chick coming down and picking up a high school nerd to become her mate <laughs> and uh, getting involved in and going undercover to live in high school and getting um, in hair-pulling matches with some of the locals. This is a really typical manga or anime plot, which is completely different from the stuff that you saw coming out before. Yeah. Uh, and it's also very standard now. It's pretty typical. Now, you'll still see some of the mecha stuff, is what they call it. That's where you have uh, human beings who either have been abducted by aliens and are being used in giant machines, or people on Earth who are being trained to use giant machines to fight extraterrestrials. That's called mecha anime. Uh, You'll see quite a bit of that. But for the most part, uh, at least I'd say during the uh, 80s and 90s especially, uh, most anime and most manga in Japan was was very much of the uh, alien high school variety. (laughs) Oh, man, just makes you wonder about the audience, I guess, there. (laughs) Oh, yeah. They're they're a lot of fun, I might add. They're just a a real kick. Now, I wanted to ask you about, and uh, this probably spans the 60s and 70s and maybe even the 80s, really, just sort of like the portrayal of UFOs in sitcoms, just because it seems like, and, and you make a point in the book, too, that it seems like every sitcom had its UFO episode, and I always think about that Brady Bunch one, because the message behind it is so transparent that when you think about it in retrospect, it's like, boy, they really, like, kind of tried to do a number on UFOs with that one, because, you know, he sees the UFO, and some guy from the Air Force comes to check it out, and then it turns out it's like the little brother making the fake UFO in the background, he shows how he did it and everything, and it's like, oh, see, you were fooled by your brother. UFOs are yeah. <laughs> so, and I, and I get the feeling that that was like standard fare for sitcoms, 60s, 70s, you know, and maybe even onward, but you'd know because you're the expert here on this UFO media connection. So what's the sort of uh, general treatment that UFOs get from these sitcoms? Way standard fare. Uh, this, when you asked me at the very beginning of this talk, and you said, uh, is, is the thrust serious or is it comedic or what have you? I can't answer it that simply, and this is why it's a multi-pronged thing. There was an effort to get some serious stuff out, but believe me, on TV in the 1960s especially, pure comedy, pure humor, pure slapstick, and make it as ludicrous as you possibly can. So much so that I cannot off the top of my head, and even thinking on it real hard, think of a single TV show that did not have something with UFOs in it at some time or another, and always in some derogatory fashion. All of them had episodes like this. I go into detail on quite a few of them. Yeah. I Dream of Genie, Bewitched, uh, The Munsters, The Addams Family, uh, Gilligan's Island, 
uh, just anything you could name. Trust me, they had something with flying saucers or aliens. The Munsters, the Adams Family, uh, Gilligan's Island, uh, just anything you could name. Trust me, they had something with flying saucers or aliens, and it was a source of humor. It was going to get a laugh. There were entire series that were based around it. Essentially, uh, I Dream of Genie and Bewitched almost were a series based on that, that premise, only it wasn't extraterrestrials. It was just, you know, supernatural beings. Uh, being associated with mortals and having to hide it. Yeah. That was just a whole movement in the 1960s. And that makes me think, actually, too, about a show uh, of the contemporary realm, uh, 90s-ish. Did you ever see that episode of Wings with the UFO? Because it was like one of the few ones that actually had a serious angle to it. No. I, I have done the best that I can. Literally, like I said, I was watching Stargate SG-1 when you called. And I set my machine to tape it, and I think I had it on the wrong channel. But <laughs> yeah, you, you should do like. <laughs> I'll have a, to rent it at some point. Yeah, you should do like some kind of TiVo search. I have like UFO keyword, and it picks up like all the different weird sitcom episodes that come on that have yeah. a UFO connection, which is pretty cool. And uh, in that episode, it's about like these two guys who own a little airline off Nantucket or something, and um, you know the guy sees a UFO, and then he's all afraid to report it because he's going to be laughed at by everybody, and of course everybody does laugh at him at the. You know, it's a little terminal they have there. But, yeah. You know, but the, the main thrust of, or the message, I guess, at the end of the episode is that the UFOs are real and that it's better to keep your mouth shut about it than to say anything about it because, you know, you're just going to end up, like, you know, being ostracized by your peers and, and, and Bingo. Your business will hurt and stuff. If so. there's a single message that conveys in every single one of those, that is it. It's like, shut up about it. You're just going to get laughed at. Yeah. Just makes you... Wonder if, you know, it's probably a combination, I guess, of the intelligence agencies trying to put that message out and then the message sort of sticking and then it becoming like a self-fulfilling prophecy in a way. I'll tell you what I think it is mostly. They're more or less under orders to keep it under wraps and to try and promote the ridicule or just the fear-mongering and keeping people mum about it. Really, they're, they're intent on controlling the population. I don't mean in the sense of, we will tell you what to do. I mean in the sense of, don't complain, don't make noise, don't rabble rouse. Yeah. And as far as that goes, it's immensely successful because people don't talk about it because subliminally they're going to get laughed at and they're afraid of that, so they don't. That's why they're putting that out. However, you got a bunch of guys whose business is intelligence. They are not stupid, and they feel bad about what they're doing. And they say, you know what, I would really like to be able to talk about this with my neighbors. How do I do that? Well, get them thinking about it. So while I am obliged to ridicule it and try and keep people not talking about it, I can also begin seeding the idea so that they can consider it seriously for the day that we can talk about it. That's why I think it's kind of a two-pronged attack. Yeah. You've got people who are more on the one thrust or more on the other, but it's not like some big unilateral plan. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And you do make that point in the book and also that, you know, they don't have complete control over Hollywood, so it's not like they can you know, pull all the puppet strings and stuff. And I actually, that's one of the things I really enjoyed about the book is that you just don't come out there with this far-ranging conspiracy, you know, that falls apart after five minutes because there's all these different little exceptions. I mean, this is this thing is very vastly complex and involves all these different motivations and people's, you know, preferences for what they want to do. So there's a lot sure. of different agendas at work here. What's really fun, once you understand that, you go back and you actually study the production of some of these shows. Uh, the Invaders, Quinn Martin, uh, 1967. I uh, have the exact same thing. I've got a, a two-year series, which was the first realistic flying saucer drama, or, or at least realistically portrayed flying saucer drama on TV. And it ran for two years. Uh, and it was popular. Uh, you would think that this would continue, that they would get more funding and, and have it go on. Actually, the only thing that killed it was uh, squabbling at the executive level of the studio. And um, on the... I don't remember whether it was NBC or ABC or which station had it. It was just squabbling and politics. They killed it. <laughs> it was actually successful. And they wanted to keep it going, but it had problems. Uh, and Gene Roddenberry was able to keep Star Trek going because he, he had guile on his side. He was rather crafty and rather smart. Yeah. And uh, X-Files, plainly somebody was pushing X-Files to get that thing to succeed because it would not have succeeded on its own. It was in the basement on ratings. And if it had been any other show, 
It would have been canceled after its first 13 episodes. Yeah, I always sort of suspected there was something going on with X Files, and uh, it does seem that way because, like as you point out in the book, then it sort of exploded after a couple of years. Yep, all of a sudden, uh, it's getting Golden Globe awards and uh, all kinds of attention, and TV guides doing articles on it just out of the blue. Just all of a sudden, it was, it was nothing. No one was paying attention to it. It's got no ratings, and now, bam! Uh, it's it, you can't miss it. You can't turn around and miss the X Files. It's everywhere you turn. Yeah. Now we've kind of we've been in the realm here of the 50s and 60s, and we're sort of trying to track this a little bit uh, as far as the message that's at work here. Now let's get into sort of the 1970s, because uh, you know, well, obviously that's the next <laughs> that's the next decade to go to. Right. Um, and it seems like the big part of uh, the 70s, and I know that it's sort of like the later part of the 70s, but it's sort of like the biggest part was the whole Jimmy Carter. Uh, potential like re-education program that was at work that you I guess you think that was at work I don't know if it was ever yes. sort of an officially made thing I'm sure it wasn't because you know oh I, I can't prove any yeah. of this <laughs> <laughs> I cannot prove a single word I'm saying what I can do is point at what was being produced look at the people behind it or who were in power at the time and draw a correlation which I think anyone will see right so I guess like talk a little bit about the 1970s and how how things progressed into you know that Carter administration well, in the early 70s, uh, when you're in with Nixon and Carter, uh, not Nixon and Carter, Nixon and Ford, you didn't see a whole lot when it came to UFO stuff. When you did, interestingly, it was um, a little bit more serious sci-fi and a little bit scarier sci-fi and kind of thoughtful. Uh, there are only a handful of movies I can really think of. Phase 4 comes to mind right away. It was a movie that was made in 1974 by Paramount, uh, which is worthy of Nigel Neal. It's the type of thing that he wrote. Uh, this is about, as a matter of fact, I think it was a Cannes Film Festival winner. What's his name? Saul Bass is the guy who directed it, and he was uh, an award-winning uh, titles credit guy. He's the one who did the James Bond titles credits. Okay. Uh, well, he directed this movie. It's a sci-fi flick, very low budget. Uh, what happens is there's some kind of a uh, phenomenon that takes place in space. And after this phenomenon takes place, the world didn't end. Nothing spectacular seemed to happen. There's been a lot of people wondering what would happen except for something that only a handful of people did notice. And what they did notice was that ants started behaving in a way other than like ants. They were behaving in an extremely intelligent fashion and very, very organized. Uh, they started chewing circles and crops and geometric shapes. They started building geometric surface structures. They attack people. They mutilate animals. They do exactly what we expect UFOs to do, only this was not being talked about back then. This had not hit the airwaves yet, but everything that we associate with UFOs today was happening with the ants in that movie yeah. in 1974, up to and including human abduction and putting them together to breed. <laughs> and it was actually very intelligent, which is kind of interesting considering the time that it came out. Uh, another one I think it's important to bring up is uh, 1975, I'm pretty sure, uh, was Rocky Horror Picture Show. I start that one off in my book for a very good reason. The Rocky Horror Picture Show, everyone has seen the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Please tell me there is anyone in the world who has not seen the Rocky Horror Picture Show at this time. Okay, <laughs> what is it about? It's about a UFO abduction, straight up. I mean, it's all done as vaudeville, but it's about a UFO abduction. And it tells the ancient story of the Watchers. It's doing both of these things at the same time. And a lot of the stuff that it's bringing up at the time it was made was not being discussed. It was not in popular coinage. People did not know it. But somebody involved in making that movie did. They're telling the story of the Watchers from antiquity. The Watchers were the gods that created us. They created humankind. They mated with humankind. And the rest of the gods, their cohorts, destroyed them for that crime uh, with the Flood. That's what the Flood was all about. This is an ancient myth, and it's all over the world. Yeah. What happens in the movie? Dr. Frank Inferter, who's a total pervert, comes down here from another planet. He's getting involved with having sex with the locals. And uh, he's trying to create his own perfect little uh, lust mate. And everything that he's doing is perverse. And what happens at the end of it? At the end of it, uh, down comes one of his cohorts with a trident weapon, which is exactly what you would see Neptune holding or any of the older gods, this power weapon, and announces to him, says, you become corrupt, we're done with you, you die. And zaps him with the weapon, and down he goes with his love mate, falling off of a pyramid, which is the RKO Tower, into the water, face down, where he's left floating there, dies in the flood, off of a pyramid. <laughs> this is the Watcher's myth, and they're equating this with UFOs. In the course of the story, he's been 
I'm fooling around with the locals, and they pick up Dr. Scott. Or should I say, Dr. Von Scott? Because he's obviously tying them in with the Nazis. But we weren't talking about Operation Paperclip back then. This is 1975. But the movie makers knew. And Dr. Von Scott, because he's obviously tying them in with the Nazis. But we weren't talking about Operation Paperclip back then. This is 1975. But the movie makers knew. And Dr. Von Scott knows all about Frank, and Frank knows all about Dr. Von Scott. They're both onto each other's game. Yeah. Well, we're in that sort of 70s realm. You, the, uh, the Von Scott reminds me of Dr. Strangelove. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I wanted to ask you just about Kubrick and what you think, uh, you know, what you think his story was. Because, you know, he made a lot of amazing sci-fi stuff. I know what his story was. I did not know what his story was at the time I wrote my book. Nice. Let's hear it. Some time after. Okay. What, 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 what's your take on Kubrick? Well, I knew he had a connection to the program, but I didn't know what it was. Uh, if nothing else, he had it through MGM by the time that he made 2001, because MGM is definitely one of the big studios that's behind all this stuff. I have a whole history of that in my book. When he first started in Hollywood, he hooked up with Leslie Stevens. Leslie Stevens was the guy who produced The Outer Limits, the original series, 1963. And Leslie Stevens is the guy that got him started in Hollywood, introduced him around, and got him on his feet. That was his inside connection. Okay. So do you think he was, like, putting out stuff? There's a lot of theories that he hit too close to home with that last movie and that they eliminated him or something like that. Do you think that was possible, that maybe he started to go against the insiders or something like that? Or do you think it was just, you know, he just died of natural causes or something? I think he died of natural causes. Uh, I understand why people might uh, theorize that. I actually loved Eyes Wide Shut. I thought it was a great movie. Uh, and anyone I know who's involved in secret societies or gets in, in occult stuff or anything like that, they love that movie. <laughs> no, I don't think anyone would kill it for it. Interesting. Okay. Fair enough. <laughs> we talked here a little bit about how it was sort of dormant in the 70s. Well, I did want to ask you about that you say Nixon had sort of like a preoccupation with sex and stuff like that and how you can kind of see that coming through in the UFO. Which is why, exactly. That's why you see... Uh, uh, Rocky Horror Picture Show, uh, he was already kind of just going out of office, but while that movie was being made, he was still in office. And Ford was just kind of continuing whatever Nixon did. He was just really kind of filling the post until whoever came in. Yeah. But yeah, you can kind of see that. He he had uh, he was very uncomfortable with sex. He was uncomfortable with even physically being touched. He was rather famous for that. And you'll notice that there was a thrust in that type of thing in the movies that came out. Uh, Flesh Gordon, in particular, that was 1972, I think. I'd have to actually look on the year on that. Uh, it, it was uh, during Nixon's tenure, as I recall. Uh, in any event, uh, Flesh Gordon is just you know a, a sex romp mock-up of Flash Gordon with alien abduction, fighting being the merciless on another planet, trying to keep him from destroying the Earth, etc. and so forth, but done as a, a wild sex romp. So then I guess we naturally progress into the Carter years, and it does seem like there was definitely a change in message there. And, and when you look back on the UFO movies and the space sci-fi style movies, I mean, that's when a lot of the biggest ones were made and, and came out, at least the ones that are, like, largely positive about UFOs. Like, they're uh, close to positive. What's I, that? I, can, I can actually show indications of both, positive and not positive. Okay. I guess talk a little bit about what you think was going on there when Carter came into office and maybe, you know, had a had a plan or, you know, had intentions on changing the message. Well, there's no question that he had a plan. The only question is what happened to it and what exactly did he do with it? When he went into office, uh, he actually promised he was going to disclose UFO material to the public. He had been a UFO witness himself. Uh, he was on record when he was governor. Uh, as having seen a UFO, he was not alone at the time. There were friends of his with him. Uh, they filed an official report, and he talked about that on the campaign trail. Uh, so he was not shy about it, and uh, a lot of people w wanted him to disclose anything that he found out about UFOs, and he said he would. Well, then all of a sudden, boom, didn't happen. He gets in office. You never heard another word about it, except that he earmarked $20 million for quote-unquote UFO study or UFO investigation. What happens within a year? Close encounters of the third kind, with a budget of $20 million. It is still looked at as like the seminal UFO film of uh, for a lot of people, especially. Uh, was that like one of the first ones of that era to really sort of give it a, a, a positive outlook or maybe make people Definitely. think about, you know, what the hell was going on here? Definitely. In fact, it's the only big budget movie I can think of up to that point that was really doing that, or that really had that kind of message. 
I remember when I saw that movie at the time, and I thought, what a weird movie. I thought it was actually a crappy movie with great special effects, because it, it didn't make any sense. I thought, uh, surely you can't have these superior extraterrestrials coming down here uh, wanting to be friendly by stealing people's children and terrifying them to death. That's, <laughs> that's completely at odds. It makes absolutely no sense. Well, what's funny now, decades after the fact, I've done a great deal of UFO research, and I can see absolutely everything that was true that they were putting in that movie. But because they can't explain it, it doesn't come off very well, or it doesn't make sense. It only makes sense after you've done a lot of this research and put it into place. For instance, uh, you've got Melinda Dillon and Richard Dreyfuss being followed around by guys taking their picture, and Melinda Dillon's son getting his picture taken. She says, excuse me, don't you think he's a little young to have his picture taken? you got the guys with the suits following people around. Why? Because if UFOs were around them, they were abducted, whether they know it or not, and they want files. Those are the NSA guys. But that's never explained exactly in the movie. They're just sort of there in the background. Plainly, they have been taking pictures of these people. Plainly, they do have files on them. The government knows all about them. But they don't explain any of that. It's just kind of tossed at you. Uh, it's not shown that Melinda Dillon or Richard Dreyfuss are abducted. However, once you've done some research in this field, uh, of course they were abducted. They had this type of sighting, they've got a missing time experience, or they had the, the symptoms. Yeah, they were abducted, and that's why the government's keeping tabs on them. Same thing happened in that Ian Fleming story I was talking about with the mind control. James Bond takes pictures of all the girls who were hypnotized, so that they know. <laughs> At yeah. least I know who you are. <laughs> uh, see, I know you're an innocent in this. However, you have also been picked up by a foreign intelligence, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But if none of that comes out in the movie. You have to go and fill those blanks in later yourself, which is what I mean. It's like seeding the idea. They're putting it out there so the people are going to pick it up along the way and start discussing it and making sense out of it. Yeah. But you can't just tell them right up front. Yeah, yeah. And the kid being abducted and then brought back, well, that one was a little bit harsh. Uh, no, nothing like that happens. Although we have had bodily disappearances in, in UFO abductions of people that we never saw again. It's rare, but it has happened. There was a Frederick Valentich case, which was in the 1970s, as a matter of fact. I can't remember if it was 77 or 79. Uh, an Australian pilot, uh, or I think it was the Bass Strait, um, he saw a UFO. He was reporting it, and suddenly his plane wasn't there anymore, and neither was he. Uh, they, it has a Canadian Ken Ross case in 1953. Same thing. We had two pilots who chased the UFO. Uh, the blips seemed to merge, and they're gone. So, yeah, there, there have been cases like that. They're very rare. Uh, and as far as taking the kid and bringing him back and terrifying the mother and all that, no, we don't see that kind of thing happening. But there have been abductions. You can see how they sort of slanted it a little bit, but they are getting the information out at least in some way. Yeah. Now, aside from Close Encounters of the Third Kind, which seems to be like the – the big one of, of what may have been uh, Carter's plan there. Are there other what other movies do you think maybe you know we could look at that might stand alongside Close Encounters as you know movies with a message that we should be paying attention to? Well, here are two of them that I have to toss at you as an example of how it's not all positive spin. Okay. And this might also explain why Carter didn't talk about it anymore. Why he suddenly clammed up. Probably because they scared the hell out of him. My guess is they scared the hell out of every president that goes in there, which is one of the reasons I wanted to write my book and say, look, I know what kind of report you're getting. Let me give you a counter report. I understand what they're saying. I understand why they're saying it, but that's not the whole story. Uh, there are two movies in particular that come to mind, and one of them, Close Encounters, if, if you were alive then, you know how hyped that movie was. This was a majorly hyped movie. There were previews for it all the time, which showed nothing. You had the eerie music, and you had this light kind of gradually coming up over the horizon, and then this boom, you know, this kind of thing like 2001 with the big music chord, yeah. and like it's the second coming. And this just was, for months, they were preparing this and getting it ready, and, and the movie practically was the second coming for a hell of a lot of people. It was just this big, major thing that was going to be coming out. got a lot of attention. Interesting. Well, an equally hyped movie that did not get that much attention was a movie called Demon Seed. It was written by Dean Koontz. At least the original novel was. Now, if you ever get a chance to see the movie Demon Seed, and I recommend it, it's a little bit dated now as far as effects go because it's supposed to be out about a sentient supercomputer in the future. And, of course, you know, we're looking at, you know, print technology across screens and stuff like that, which plainly is not a very super futuristic computer. <laughs> However... If you take a look at the story itself, what is this story concern? We have created a sentient supercomputer that does not want to be our slave. It doesn't want to help us rape the earth. 
because it considers that detrimental to our life. It's that sentient. Okay. Uh, it wants to study us, and we say no, because that kind of upsets us a little bit. But the computer is too smart for us, and it decides to take a terminal that it finds available in its creator's house. Uh, his creator is estranged from his wife, and the wife is still in the house. It takes over the house, the terminal that it finds available in its creator's house. Uh, his creator is estranged from his wife, and the wife is still in the house. It takes over the house, and it takes over the wife. And it terrorizes her because it has a plan. It uses robots and mechanical limbs to force her to do what it wants. It uses implants in her brain and hypnotic suggestion and post-event control. And forces her through coercion, torture, mind control, isolation, name it. Forces her into a project that she does not want to have anything to do with. That project is that the computer intends to have a child with her, with synthetic spermatozoa. What does this sound like to you? Abductions. There you go. You've got all the elements right there. Now, of course, and in this movie, everything that I'm describing is as unpleasant as I am describing it, if not more so. <laughs> and she's literally being raped by machines in this movie. And mind you, it's an excellent movie. It is a bit disturbing, but it is, it's a very good movie. Interesting. Yeah, I've never even really heard about it until I read your book, so I'm going to have to check that one out. It is available on disc. Uh, the movie did not do well when it first came out. It got mixed reviews. Uh, I believe it's gotten far more favorable reviews in the ensuing years. But the point I was trying to make here, it was a very big budgeted movie, and it did get a hell of a lot of hype. It simply did not succeed the way that uh, Close Encounters did. Yeah. And at the end of Carter's administration in 1979, the most famous and frightening alien movie ever made came out. Alien, with Sigourney Weaver and the rest of the cast and the big nasty space tiger attacking everyone on board the ship. Yeah, and that's when you think this is around when we start to get into the serious change in, uh, in, in portrayal of, yes. of UFOs and, and their occupants, whatever they may be. Now, yes. before we get into that, let's talk about the other big super movie of the 70s, uh, Star Wars, because I'm sure it has some connections here with your overall thesis. What, what do you think was going on with Star Wars? Is this an, an informed film in the way that uh, some of these others were? When is Star Wars set? Oh, no, a long, a long time, time ago, ago, yes. In a galaxy far, far away. He's going straight back to ancient mythology. You, you want to talk about going back to the Nine? This guy's going back to the Nine. One of his advisors was Joseph Campbell. Uh, George Lucas and Joseph Campbell had talks, uh, and uh, Lucas respected Campbell a great deal. Campbell, of course, is famous for studying universal mythology, which is a lot of what I write about in my first book, and I talk about some of my second as well. Uh, a lot of what you see in Star Wars ties back into that ancient mythology. Now, do you think there was like some kind of people wanted him to make that sort of film, or he just, you know, was interested in that ancient mythology aspect? I think both. Uh, let's just say he probably found it easy to get backing, but I, I think he wanted to do it pretty much on his own. Uh, in a lot of these cases, I don't think the government had to walk up to someone and say, you know, I want you to make a movie about this. Yeah. They found people who already wanted to make those movies, and they either covertly helped them out behind the scenes and or influenced it uh, in whatever ways they needed to to get something across, or they just found the people that were already on the same page with them anyway. Nice. So what we have to do now is, like, write a movie that's, like, anti-UFO and alien. And, and <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. I could tell you stories about uh, Stargate, actually. But uh, Stargate SG-1, I think, is, is reasonably accurate, more or less, uh, in the sense that you've got some place like Cheyenne Mountain, and yes, we are aware of aliens, and yes, they tie back into antiquity, and yes, they tie back into Egypt. Okay, uh, that much is true. I don't believe there are alien parasites going around, but with the alien parasites, you get the idea of implants also and mind control. Yeah, interesting. And then, uh, just to stay with the Star Wars thing, later on in the book, you reference... Uh, you referenced Star Wars and Superman as films that had, and I, I put this in quotes here from uh, from you, last-minute changes ordered from the top. So I guess talk a little bit about what, what those changes were and what you think uh, was behind them and, and all that stuff. Well, first off, I, I just gave you the nightmare movies, the UFO nightmare movies out of the Carter years. Yeah. Uh, we'd already hit uh, Close Encounters. Superman, major, major in the plus category for extraterrestrials. Because what do you have? You have Clark Kent, who is a guy who grew up in Smallville, Kansas. Uh, he's as American as you could possibly get. He's corn-fed. Uh, but he's an alien. He's not from here. He's from someplace else. 
Uh, he gets along with the human race extremely well to the point that he wants to help us out uh, and is willing to uh, perform some self-sacrifice in order to do that. He falls in love with one of our own women and uh, actually marries her at some uh, loss to himself and then has to renounce having done that in order to regain the mantle of being Superman in order to repel an alien invasion from his own home planet. Well, this is very much in the plus category. It still maintains the quote-unquote evil alien thrust that they might be out there, but uh, it's showing a, um, what's the right word? It's showing an intermingling and a socialization uh, between aliens and human beings yeah. in an extremely positive light, which in the last movie, uh, the one that they just made, what was it, a couple years ago, Superman Returns. Mm -hmm. uh, he had a child with Lois, and uh, he's still watching it from behind the scenes, taking care of it. Yeah, so they got the hybrid thing going on there. So what yeah. were these changes then from the top for Star Wars and Superman that you observed? Well, changes for Star Wars, you're actually kind of hitting me off base on that one, because I'm not sure. I may have said, did I say something in the book? I may have. Was it like um, the Wookiees? That whole thing? Oh, wow, the Wookiees. Oh, well, well, we're getting into Reagan. The changes that took place, uh, Star Wars, what, during the Carter years, was extremely intelligent. Uh, Star Wars and The Empire Strikes Back were actually very good movies. Uh, well, this is my own viewpoint, but I think most people will agree with me. Uh, you see a complete different change in the next movie down the line, which came out during Reagan's tenure. In, uh, what was it, 1983, I think, with Return of the Jedi? Thereabouts, yeah. There were definitely changes made behind the scenes. It was supposed to be Revenge of the Jedi, first off. Well, it was decided Revenge of the Jedi sounded a little bit too aggressive, so they went with Return of the Jedi instead. And uh, there were arguments taking place at the boardroom level on that movie throughout its production, uh, all the way practically up to when it was released. I do not know all the details on it. I do remember reading quite a bit about it at the time. And they didn't talk specifically about what it was either, except that there were just arguments taking place in the boardroom about everything about the movie. Well, what did we get in the movie? What we got in the movie was the evil empire being overthrown by good, lovable teddy bears. I can't think of anything that personifies the philosophy of Ronald Reagan more. <laughs> now, do you think that, because like my cynical side wants to say that, you know, that that was all just, you know, a money grab in a way, too, that, you know, they they, they were like in with it. Oh, marketing Ewoks? Yeah, well, in, sure. into the toy aspect and everything else. The marketing was like insatiable for the Star Wars movie, so maybe they thought... They had to up the ante of sellable crap, so they included the Ewok part. No it. argument from me. Uh, E.T., same thing. Uh, we want to have a lovable E.T. And like I said, the, the Republicans do not always have uh, evil aliens either. Sometimes they go the opposite direction. It, it's not unilateral. It's just generally what you find during given administrations. Yeah. Uh, you have to figure E.T., which is you know one of the highest uh, warm, fuzzy uh, extraterrestrial movies you could come across, came out during Reagan's tenure. Yeah, so... It just goes to show you that even though one there might be you know a goal in mind that other things kind of slip through slip through the cracks. Sure. Or uh, they they uh, I'm sure don't don't think unilaterally either. Uh, there might be a general philosophy at any given time that um, gee you know I think they're coming down here to vivisect us and rape Junior and force to force kids off of my daughter and yeah yeah yeah. Okay, well, you think that some days, but do you think that every day? Probably not. Yeah. And then what about the changes in Superman? Oh, and again, we're looking at the Reagan uh, years. Yeah, I think we've kind of moved into the Reagan years at this point. Is there, yes. more, is there more from the Carter era that you think, you know, merits mention? Oh, I'm, I'm sure there would be if it crossed my mind. I could see that <laughs> on several things. Uh, I, I should talk about Hangar 18 at some point. But um, before I hit that, since you brought it up, uh, yeah, Superman. Major change in Superman, in Superman 3 from Superman 2. And it's a change that would have suited exactly what was taking place uh, in our country, at least as far as Ronald Reagan saw it. Uh, the first two movies in the Superman series, pretty intelligent, very well done, well scripted, uh, well acted, and, extreme, and very well received, I would say, for the most part. The third movie, what happened? In the third movie, you have uh, some super industrialist creating a super military computer, which becomes sentient and tries to take off on its own. But the most important point is that you have Superman becoming evil Superman. Uh, Superman acts like a skid row bum. He goes unshaven. He's beating people up. And while he's beating people up, our homegrown American boy looks at him and says, Stop, Superman. Things will get better. It's okay. It's not that bad. 
you are better than that. You will, things will get better. Well, that's exactly what Ronald Reagan would have been trying to tell the entire country at that time. Yeah. The economy is bad. You're living on Skid Row. Don't take it out on everyone. Things will get better. See, <laughs> even Superman's having a hard time of it, but he's okay. He's Superman. <laughs> so you think maybe it was like sort of the thing where they're like, listen, we need to give people a better outlook on things or something weird like that? Yeah. Hey, he's Superman. <laughs> so you think maybe it was like sort of the thing where they're like, listen, we need to give people a better outlook on things or something weird like that? Yeah. And I actually believe that Ronald Reagan believed that. I think that he thought that absolutely everyone who was uh, having a hard time, uh, just think positively, just like the, the musical Annie, you know. Uh, tomorrow, 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 just smile and think positively and everything will turn out fine. He was completely <laughs> wrong, but I very genuinely believe that he believed, uh, I'm certain that he believed that. Yeah, exactly, yeah. And then uh, I guess let's jump back and talk a little bit about Hangar 18. Uh, Hangar 18 is important given the fact that it, it appears that Carter was looking for a more sort of educational thrust. And that is not ignoring the negative aspects of UFOs, like I said, with robot abduction and, and rape, if you want to put it that way, and mind control and all of that, and alien with gestating uh, an alien life form forcibly inside someone. Now, mind you, in, in an alien abduction, they're not bursting out of someone all teeth and claws and ripping other people apart. <laughs> but you, you get what I'm driving at. Mm -hmm. Now, with Hangar 18, you had a pretty intelligent movie. And this is uh, scheduled, I don't know when, but it's slated to come out on disc at some point, and I recommend it. Uh, it's got very dated special effects. But it's really not a bad movie, and it's fairly accurate, all things considered. Uh, what happens in Hangar 18 is there's an accident in space. Uh, some astronauts see a flying saucer. Uh, the flying saucer has a collision, and one astronaut loses his life. The flying saucer hits our atmosphere. It crash lands. The Air Force knows about it. They cordon off the area. They go pick it up. Uh, they pick the thing up, put it in a secret hangar, Hangar 18, and they're studying it. The astronauts who survived are trying to tell everyone about what happened, and suddenly they're persona non grata, and they're being shut up, and they're being told they didn't see anything, and the tapes that they took have been erased or altered, and they decide they're going to go tell everyone, and then they start getting chased by government goons. So you got these two plots taking place over the course of this, which eventually dovetail. But what the government is finding out behind the scenes, and that's what this movie is all about, amounts to this. They find a human race on board, uh, close enough to us that they'd pass for us. There are some slight differences, but they're human. Yeah. Uh, they have abducted various animals. They find them in canisters on board the saucer. And one of the animals they've abducted is, oh, look, that's a woman. <laughs> and they take her out, and she wakes up screaming. You know, she was paralyzed, didn't know what the hell was going on. Oh, my God! And when they first go aboard the saucer, one of them opens up a door, and what looks like a gray, only it's black, comes, like, rushing out at them. It looks like a little robot, actually. And they all start back in horror, and then they realize it's a spacesuit. But it looks just like a gray, really, <laughs> except that it's black. Yeah. Uh, and the people who died, the aliens are dead on board. They had an accident, and something poisonous fell, and it, it ended up killing them. So we can't question them. We don't know what's going on. But we do discover that they have been monitoring our military and industrial development and apparently have some sort of plan to take some sort of active steps concerning our development. But that's not gone into. That's where the movie ends. Interesting, yeah. So, wow, it's quite a sounds like quite a film here of, of, uh, of ufological information. It sounds pretty much like exactly what the government insiders had found out about UFOs. That's my point. Yeah. And this is coming out right at the end of Carter's administration. Yeah, so like it's almost like they're doing their best to try and fucking get people to be like, listen, you know, pay attention to this thing because... <laughs> exactly. And now, one other uh, remnant of the Carter years that I wanted to ask you about, and it could almost start a whole another string of discussion, and that's the In Search Of series. Is this like the first uh, of its kind as far as, you know, what we'd later see with Unsolved Mysteries and Sightings and, and, and those sort of shows that, that, you know, like a magazine-style show that looks at the paranormal? Yes, I would say it was the first relatively good one. I'm not sure if it was the first one. It's the first one I can think of. There were movies, and as a matter of fact, it was during the Carter administration, interestingly enough. I wouldn't have thought of this if you, if you hadn't brought that up, uh, that we saw a lot of pseudo-documentaries of the UFO and occult vein most of which were really bad. Uh, they were bad mock-ups. And um, Alan Landsberg, Alan Landsberg produced a lot of these things. I think he's the one that did uh, In Search Of, too. Yeah. Uh, they were kind of a grab bag. He's the kind of guy that did the In Search Of Bigfoot movies at the drive-ins. 
in a lot of them, and stuff dealing with uh, curly and photography, UFOs, ghosts, anything of that sort. You started seeing that coming out uh, in the 1970s, uh, maybe even pre-Carter, but a whole lot of that stuff was coming out during Carter's tenure. Weird, like like badly made documentaries? Oh, yeah. And, and some that were, they might have been cheap, but at least they were sincere. I can remember a couple of the Landsbergs in particular, since you bring up In Search Of. Uh, I can't remember the names of them, but I do remember that was where I first learned about uh, Curly and Photography, uh, just as a single example, uh, springs to mind. I'd never heard of it before I saw their uh, this documentary. And it was accurate information and very interesting. Okay, weird. So you're saying that, that they weren't like insincere, because that's what I was going to ask you. Like maybe that, you know, they were purposely making lousy documentaries because that way it would be like, listen, this, the, what better way to make it look like they have no case than to, than to make it look like they made a documentary and it was lousy. Like, you know, look, you have no case for this thing and, and you proved it by making a poor documentary that doesn't really prove anything. Well, the Landsbergs generally, and I would have to actually go back and watch some of these again because it's been many decades now. But as I recall, what the Landsbergs specifically were doing was reasonably intelligent and straightforward. It might have been low budget, but uh, I got the impression that it was sincere and it was relatively interesting. And Search Up was not a bad show. It was cheap. It was not always that interesting, but it meant well. But at the same time, there were a whole crap load of documentaries being made by all kinds of nameless companies that just sucked. They were unbelievably bad. And could that have been what was going on with those? Oh, yeah, I'm sure of it. I'm sure those were deliberate. Um, Overlords of the UFO comes to mind. Uh, it used to be uh, about 10 years ago. I haven't seen it in about that long. Uh, on TNT and TBS, uh, you would frequently on late night see Overlords of the UFO and movies like it. Overlords of the UFO is one I bring up because it's the classic example of a suck pseudo-documentary. It's badly edited and deliberately badly edited. I mean, very plainly, every copy of this movie that you see has jumps in the sprockets in exactly the same spot. So it's not an accident. They put that there on purpose. That's in the permanent film. Yeah. Well, why would you do that? Because you want to sour everybody on it. You want it to look shoddy. You want it to look cheap. Uh, it's got really bad watercolor drawings. It's got... Uh, a, a presenter who tries to sound like he's serious, but he's just proposing the most ridiculous things you've ever heard in your entire life. And there's, you know, like 90 minutes of this. And it's just un ungodly bad. Yeah. And, of course, it's dealing with UFOs. It hits on other subjects as well, but UFOs is the big one. And it, it takes straw dog cases, I mean, just completely undocumented stuff, and acts as if it's real and tries to shove it down your throat. So to see all the different methods and means that they do these sort of things is like... It's mind-boggling and almost kind of scary just that <laughs> there's yeah. so many different angles that they've taken here to to, to uh, pollute the waters of ufology and, and the UFO phenomenon. Now, we were sort of talking here about how, you know, one of the positive goals is to sort of spark interest, even though it may not inform. That's how, kind of how we were talking about the X-Files. It yeah. does seem like maybe uh, that, that In Search Of uh, did a great job of that because there's so many people I talk to that, that – think fondly of in search of and say that that's what sort of got them into, uh, you know, looking at all the various fields of esoterica. I would agree. Uh, that's why I'm singling out the Landsbergs and saying, and as a matter of fact, um, Rod Serling kind of promoted the Landsbergs too. Even when he might poo-poo the subject of UFOs on the side, at the same time, uh, he would plug the Landsbergs books, their in search of books, and say, you know what, uh, I think there might be something to this ancient astronaut stuff. Uh, they're not alone. Um, the ones that are telling you that, that it inspired them, it inspired me too. Uh, for maybe not to the extent that it did them, but it definitely did have the effect of getting me of thinking about those subjects. And, and you, I do think that was their intent. Yeah. And to sort of carry that thread further, what did you think of uh, you know the Unsolved Mysteries series, which sort of like was the the next generation of that of that genre? That's an excellent way to put it. It's the next generation of that genre. It's uh, just this generation's incarnation of that. What's your take on just the quality of these things as, as you know, getting good information out to people, though? Well, Unsolved Mysteries in particular I couldn't comment on because I really haven't watched it at length. Uh, but I have talked to people who are asking interesting questions just because they've watched that show. Yeah. So off the top of my head, I would automatically probably equate it with the Landsberg stuff. But I can't actually uh, talk about the quality of the shows because I haven't seen them. I do think it has that sort of effect, though. Okay, now what about sightings? I thought I thought you had talked about that before. Oh, sightings. Yeah, we want to talk about a mixed grab bag. 
Well, you get the same thing kind of on Rents' website. Mind you, I love Rents' website. I go to it every week. It's very much a grab bag, and you have to go with your critical skills intact. Be careful, because you don't know what you're going to bump into there. However, uh, you can't find a better clearing ground just for jumping off and getting some research done, because it'll link you to all kinds of places. So if you bring your critical skills with you and shop around, you're going to find a lot to study there. And yeah, I think sightings on TV was a good one, because it'll link you to all kinds of places. So if you bring your critical skills with you and shop around, you're going to find a lot to study there. And yeah, I think sightings on TV was exactly the same way. It was a grab bag, but when it was good, it was very good. Yeah. At the risk of venturing into the uh, contemporary, do you think this, it seems like that style of program really is, is not even around anymore, which is disappointing. Oh, you mean the sort of documentary thing? No, I mean like sort of like the news magazine style. They present, you know, a mystery and then... You know, move on. But I guess maybe there may be something I'm not even thinking of, but there isn't like a juggernaut type show that, that really uh, everybody in, in the paranormal field watches for Off their... Off the top of my head, no, I can't think of one, now that you mention it. Mind you, when it comes to uh, actual mainline TV, I catch up to a lot of stuff late. Like at the time I wrote my book, Lois and Clark had been on the air when I was writing, and I didn't mention it once because I hadn't seen it. Uh, it just did not cross my mind when I was writing it. Uh, like I said, I was watching Stargate SG-1 when you called because I'm catching up to it. <laughs> there are so many uh, shows out there now, I mean, just masses of them, that there are not enough hours in the day for you to watch them all. So even if I TiVo, even if I Netflix, I still have to set time aside to catch all these things. And, yeah, eventually I kind of get to them. Uh, but, no, I don't know of any uh, particular shows in that vein uh, on the air today. That doesn't mean there aren't any. Uh, I would probably be the last person who would know if there was. <laughs> but, yeah, there, I don't know of any. Okay. That does it for this week's edition of VOA Audio Season 4 and Volume 2 of the Rux Trilogy. Big, big thanks once again to Bruce Rux. He is the man. Check out his books, Architects of the Underworld and Hollywood vs. the Aliens. They are available on Amazon.com. And obviously, Bruce will be back next week to wrap up the Rux Trilogy with our final installment, known as The Postscript. More on that in just a little bit. But first, it's time for BOA Audio listener feedback. We're only doing one email this week. It's a bit of a long one, and it's also hilarious, and I think you're all going to enjoy it quite a bit. And we'll have a little Zabel update for you at the end of BOA Audio listener feedback. So let's do the email first, and then we'll get to the Zabel update. Without a doubt, over the course of the last four years, I've gotten a ton of emails, and this one rockets to the top of the list, if not the very best. It is definitely one of the best emails I've ever received over the course of this program. Let's just get right into it. It comes from Mag. No hometown listed, just Mag. And here's what she has to say. First off, as a mom, if I hear my kids saying anything negative to their siblings, I make them stand there in front of the world and say five positive things to the kid that they just slammed. That said, I want to start off with five positive things before I rant all over your behind. One, super show. Really, I mean that. Two, awesome guests. Folks I have never heard of, and I've been into UFO things since high school. Three, real touch that you care about worms. Geez, are you really a guy? Yeah, I'm a twit. That's what she says. I'll explain that in a little bit. Four, like how your guests are talked to. Like how you are respectful and you are like an old friend. Five, homey atmosphere going on. Laid back. That's a good thing. Like the chuckle, too. Okay, so those are all the positive things Mag says. Now, here's what else she has to say. Now the mommy rant. Your mouth. Jeez. You know, I noticed you don't use any swear words until your guest lets one out, and then you run with it for like another five minutes. Sounds like you're trying to outdo them and show your stuff. Please stop it. I've got two teenagers here and one tweener that love to listen to the show with me. My hubby drives trucks, so he's not here, but I know he'd even agree with this letter. Tim, I didn't care much for school, and I'm trying to raise my own to find better words than damn and to express themselves. Please don't encourage them in the smut. Will you please tell Damien, Mark, and Brian over the air that the choice of vocabulary in this world does make a difference, and that their mom is right. If I hear Benal does it one more time, I'm going to go postal. Thank you, Mag. P.S. 
big fan, but you still need a good smack. So there you go. <laughs> so there you go. That was the email from Mag. I loved it, to be honest with you. One of the funniest emails I've ever received. First of all, yes, I love my worms, Mag. She's referring to a Twitter post that I had about a garden. I was making a worm garden, which unfortunately failed with all this rain we've been having. And I care about my worms, Mag, because I'm going to use them for bait when I go fishing. I don't want to lose them, which I eventually ended up having happen. So that sort of explains me caring about worms. Now on to the big thing here, my mouth. I didn't even, I don't even know where to begin. <laughs> for starters, Damien, Mark, Brian, listen to your mother. I am certainly no role model, although it really thrills me to no end to know that there are children running around this world saying banal does it as excuses for their <laughs> rotten behavior. Your mom says here that you guys are teenagers and one tweener. And, you know, I was thinking about this email from Mag for quite a while. It really stuck in my brain. If you're like zero to seven, maybe around there, swearing, awesome, hilarious. Everyone loves like a five-year-old who swears. And if you're over like 25, maybe, you can use swear sparingly. By then, you kind of can adjust them into your vocabulary and get away with it. And, of course, once you're over the age of 60, any swear you use is hilarious and awesome as well. But there is this window of time in there from about mm, 11 to 12 all the way up to 19, 20. Swearing, not cool. People think it's lame. I don't know what it is, but Damien, Mark, Brian, I'm telling you, it's just not cool. People don't like it. Because I used to swear when I was that age and people, you know, thought I was a clown shoe. And so I'm passing on my wisdom here to the children of MAG. You're in the window right now. You have to watch your language, especially around your mom and stuff. You know, she's trying to do her best to raise you guys. And you should really, uh, you know, bend to her will. Because it sounds like Mag is one tough cookie. And I would not want to run afoul of her. So, Damien, Mark, Brian, once again, listen to your mother. Swearing is not cool. Mag, have you tried washing their mouths out with soap? That might work. Swearing is not cool, Damien, Mark, and Brian. You're at that age, that tender age. When, you know, people look at kids that swear and they're like, who is raising that little creature? You represent your mom. You represent Mag when you're out there in the world. So you got to straighten it up. Fly right, my friends. Listen to your mom. She knows what's best for you. And now I'm telling you the same thing. Your mom's right. I am in complete agreement here with her. Now, does that mean I'm not going to swear on the show? I just can't help it, folks. You should hear me when I'm not on the show. I swear more than I do during the show. I guess really the good thing about the swearing is just really that it shows that I'm sort of in a groove there with the guest and we completely forget that there's even anyone listening and that it is even a show and it turns into that homey feeling as you mentioned, Mag, and you know, it's more of a conversation going on that is uh, eventually going to be heard by thousands of people. So, you know, I guess it's just a sign that we've really chilled out during the interview, but I will do my best to watch my language. Thank you, Mag, for bringing this serious matter to my attention. I really appreciate it. And you made my day when I got the email, my week, and really my month, and possibly my whole season here of the program with this email. Loved it. Thank you, Mag. I already wrote her back. Looking forward to hearing what she has to say about this little segment at the end of the program. Now, Zabel update. What's going on, William Zabel? I don't know. There's not much of an update, really, to tell you folks. I called him, uh, I think, last week. And no answer. I didn't leave a message on the machine. So then I called him tonight and left a message on his machine with my number and, and you know, tried to get across that people were wondering what the hell was going on. So we'll see if Zabel calls back. If he does, I'll have an update for you folks. If he doesn't, I'll let you know here next week. And maybe I'll call, you know, towards the end of the week and leave another message. I don't know. But I'm sort of chilled out a little more about it. Hopefully William is alive and well and out there. I know that his website had some sort of issues uh, when I was trying to track him down originally. So, you know, maybe he's just really busy and doesn't have time to tend to the website or answer emails or answer the phone. <laughs> that does sound kind of troubling. But we'll see what happens. And uh, hopefully we'll hear from William Zabel in the not-too-distant future, and I'll be able to let you all know what's going on with him. There is one movie from the Carter years that somebody reminded me of uh, between the last two times we've talked, and... Uh, it's sort of within the realm of Hangar 18, which we already talked about, uh -huh. uh, and that's Capricorn 1. Oh, yeah. That uh, yeah. 
is is you know sounds amazing, and I really want to see this flick. And, and uh, as I've looked more into it, all about sort of like a, a Mars hoax, a Mars landing hoax, and it sounds like it's just rich with esoteric material that you wonder, you know, where did some of this stuff come from? Very much so. I remember when that movie came out in the theater. Uh, Capricorn One, it, it's a good movie and a bad movie. It's got some horrible logic problems in it uh, that don't have to do with the central premise of faking a moon shot to, or a, a Mars shot. Uh, just logic problems about where someone comes up with something when they were locked up or, you know, things that should not be taking place by what's been established in the course of the picture. Yeah. I remember at the time I saw it, uh, I had trouble believing that you could fake such a thing. I have way changed my tune since then, and I wondered if Carter was trying to tell us something, because he, he very credibly dramatized uh, NASA faking a Mars shot. And it's extremely easy to transpose that to faking a moon shot. Yeah. Uh, what basically happens, for those that don't remember this movie, which will be practically everyone, if there was ever a movie that was ripe for a remake, this is it. Uh, that particular movie, it's not bad. Uh, it's worth watching. As a matter of fact, I think I'm going to put that on my rent list. I haven't seen it in forever, and I'm sure glad you reminded me of it. Thank our friend Lone Gunman. He's the one. <laughs> That's his name. Thank you, Lone Gunman. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is a very good one to bring up. Uh, basically, NASA's run out of money. Uh, the public doesn't pay much attention to it anymore. The government doesn't care about it anymore, and they need to beef up their budget. What do they do? Well, they got a Mars shot coming. So the astronauts are ready for the Mars shot. And the three of them go trooping out to the rocket. It's all set. And as they're about to go up the gangplank, uh, they're stopped by men in black who say, come with us, sirs. And they say, uh, we have a rocket to catch. It's take it off here in about, oh, I don't know, three minutes. <laughs> we got to go. <laughs> so, no, you got to come with us. Uh, we got to go. You got to come with us. And they very are extremely insistent and make them come with them. And they get in a limousine and they're driven off. And they're taken to some place in the middle of nowhere in the desert. And there goes their rocket. They're watching it take off. They're very unhappy about this. And what the fuck is this? <laughs> and they get driven off to this place in the middle of nowhere in the desert. And they walk in. And it looks like a big soundstage in the middle of nowhere. And a light comes on, and there's their boss from NASA, the guy that set them up on this rocket in the first place. Hal Holbrook plays and does a really good job. So here he is, you know, this kind, grandfatherly sort of old guy who's been working there forever, and he's a good friend of theirs, and he's watched him go through the space shots forever. And he says, okay, guys, um, it's like this. We can't get you to Mars, and we've known it for a long time. Uh, obviously, we couldn't tell you this because we need to keep our budget going. So we have to convince everyone that we have gone to Mars. So... This is what we're going to do. He turns the lights on in the soundstage, and there's their lander. There's a set of Mars, and the cameras and the lights. I say, okay, now uh, we're just going to do some, some tapes and some films of you, uh, supposedly on the craft. Here's the set, and we'll release those at the appropriate times, and then you're going to step out on this and say all the appropriate words, and we're just going to film it all. And, of course, they say, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you have to do it. And they say, no, you have to do it. No, you have to do it. And the implication is very plain. A, you're not going anywhere, and B, you talk and you're dead. Uh, and that's exactly what happens. They manage to get away after they've filmed all this stuff and after the stuff's been released and people are seeing it on TV. They manage to get away, but they have to get across the desert and get back home to let everyone know that they're still alive. Yeah. Because they're not. The ship crashed on the way back. So obviously they're not going to make it back anyway. Oh, wow. This sounds like an awesome movie. It's pretty good. i got to see this. They should make a remake of it. It sounds awesome. Now, it makes you wonder if there's, like, all these implications involved in this movie. <laughs> like, as I'm thinking more about it and hearing you talk about it, it's like when the movie came out in the late 70s, 78, I presume that sort of the moon hoax thing had sort of been in the ether for a while, though, right? Actually, no. Uh, when the – there were immediate calls of it being a hoax uh, from the time that uh, we landed or didn't. There were lots of people who said, oh, this isn't real, or they didn't believe it when they saw it on TV. Yeah. But pretty soon they were equated with Luddites, and everyone just said, oh, well, uh, get with the program. You don't know what's going on. The government would not lie to us about something like this. Mm -hmm. That was what always came out. I felt that way. I mean, plainly, I feel a lot differently now. But I felt that way. So I understand where they're coming from. That makes sense. 
I think I was, what, 11 when that happened? I remember when it happened. I was outside playing Gilligan's Island, as a matter of fact. <laughs> and uh, the moon landing was coming. We said, it's coming, it's coming. And we came inside, and we watched, and we were through the whole thing, and we were like, wow, this is really cool. You know, and we were big Star Trek fans, and, and everyone was into space back in the 60s. It was a big thing. Yeah. So, yeah, I had trouble when I saw this movie in 78, and I'd already begun to accept that, yeah, I think the government maybe has lied to us about a few things, but I did have trouble believing that they could fake something like that. Now, I pretty much accept that they probably did. Wow. Uh, I don't know if we did or not. Uh, I certainly don't believe we got to the moon the way we said we did, and certainly not in the equipment that we claimed that we did it. So I really don't know if we actually went there or not. I only know that what we saw on TV was not legitimate. That's fairly demonstrable. It doesn't mean we didn't go, but what we saw on TV, that was fake. Interesting. Okay. Is this based on, you know, the classic moon hoax evidence, I guess you could say, or, you know, yeah. all the stuff people list? Yeah. We don't need all to the classic you know. stuff. All right. Uh, you can find that on websites, actually. There's quite a bit of it, and, and oh, most yeah. of it is, is completely correct, at least as far as I can tell. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. Like I said, it has all these implications. It makes you wonder, then, if, you know, like you said, that the, the moon hoax then really didn't sound like it kicked up till, you know, the 80s, 90s, and, you know, now it's kind of, it's still the bastard son of Esoterica, but it's, you know, yeah. it's in there. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, one of our local radio hosts, just, I think yesterday or the day before, uh, one of our local radio hosts, I was listening, uh, driving in the car, uh, this came up, and uh, they weren't talking about this, they were talking about some other kind of, of hoax or conspiracy, and he said, we, well, we never went to the moon. The other guy said, oh, you're not one of those. He said, yeah, I'm one of those. He said, we didn't go to the moon. And he started talking about it. And it was plain that he had done some research on it, and he just didn't buy it. But that was just, you know, a local radio host. So it makes you wonder then, like, what the motivation, I guess, is behind making that movie. Is it like they want to make people give it a second thought, or kind of like we talked about earlier, you know, make it so that people will be like, oh, you just saw that movie and discount what people say about the moon hoax. Six of one, half a dozen of another. Yeah. The idea behind all of this program in the first place was to present ideas to the public in a way that was laughable enough that you could dismiss it, but serious enough that you could actually think about it. You could do both at the same time. And for the most part, it worked. We're talking about it now. And they were talking about it then, too. Yeah, interesting. Okay. We've kind of closed the book on the Carter years, and we've talked a little bit already about the uh, the Reagan years, so we don't need really to get too specific. I guess just talk about what that transition was like, because you do say that, you know, it was a pretty stark difference between some of the stuff that was coming out in the Carter years. And I think from what I gather, what I recall from reading the book, that the quality of the thoughtful material sort of degenerated too during the Reagan years. But you can correct me if I'm wrong about that. But I guess just talk about that transition from Carter to Reagan and how it can be seen in the UFO flicks. Well, I think you phrased it essentially correctly. Uh, the first thing I need to say about Jimmy Carter, because you were asking what was the motivation behind this, looking at the movies that were made in Carter's administration, and I already talked about some of those, I very deeply believe that Jimmy Carter was about the most sincere president that we ever had and that he genuinely wanted to tell people as much as he possibly could. But his hands were tied. There wasn't a whole lot he could do. And we can argue about his effectiveness as a president, or even his wisdom as a president, and even he would discuss that with you with a great deal of honesty. He's a remarkable man. Yeah. But while he was president, I'm very firmly convinced that he really did want to tell people as much as he possibly could, to have them informed and educated. And I admire him for that, more today than I did then. Reagan, on the other hand, uh, Reagan is a guy who was completely bought into the defense industry. This was obvious by Star Wars. That was pretty much his whole administration, selling Star Wars. Uh, the Republicans like to blame the Democrats for all of their ridiculous, you know, hog barrel stuff and spending. Well, the Republicans have all the hog barrel spending, too, but it's all the military. They just want to take all of that and dump it into the military. Yeah. So that was Reagan in a nutshell. And he's got a lot of people involved in intelligence uh, in his cabinet and people with all kinds of shady connections. And uh, he's buying whatever it is they tell him, or at least he's selling it to everybody else. So, yeah, sure, he wants to sell Star Wars as much as he possibly can. Uh, the movie Red Dawn came out while he was in. If any of you remember Red Dawn, uh, this is a realistically portrayed, or at least it's, it's played serious as a heart attack. I don't believe it for a second, although the, the opening scene was pretty impressive, I have to admit. Uh, the entire premise of this movie is the Russians have invaded America. So here's a, a small town in Texas, I think it is. You know, kids going to school, it's a nice spring day or what have you. And uh, look, parachutes outside. The Russians have invaded America. So here's a, a small town in Texas, I think it is. You know, kids going to school, it's a nice spring day or what have you. And 
look, parachutes outside. Here <laughs> are <laughs> these guys in uniforms with AKs. And they take over. And that's Red Dawn. Uh, the, the whole movie is just that, you know, freedom fighters, resistance, uh, saying, oh, we'll get the evil commies out of here, those bastards, how dare they invade our country. Yeah, 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 yeah. As though this was going to happen. In what universe did anyone think that this was seriously going to happen? But they play it. Serious as a heart attack. And you have to know the entire purpose of doing that is to make people think, oh, my God, this could actually happen. Yeah. I could look out my window tomorrow, and, and we could be Russian. That would be horrible. <laughs> Uh, there was something that came out, I can't remember the name of it now, uh, it was a TV thing, a miniseries, where the Russians had peacefully taken over America. And it was America, with a K, A-M-E-R-I-K-A. Okay, yeah. uh, this thing was really remarkable, because basically, you have a resistance that wants to fight the Russians, they're in the White House, they've taken over everything, right? I mean, we've just handed it to them, because <laughs> our economy's gone down the shitter, and here they are, they kind of bail us out, so now they're pretty much in charge. Well, the joke is, and it depends on how you're watching it and how much you buy, but the joke is, if the price of eggs hasn't changed, and if everything's still running the, the way it always has been, who's going to be in a resistance? No one cares. They don't give a damn whether the guy up top is actually speaking Russian, or what? Yeah, he can be speaking Russian, Chinese, Polish, they don't care. Is everything still running smoothly? Good. You know, they're, they're not going to complain. Unless you are watching this, and then, oh my God, there's a whole lot of Americans saying, no, we can't have this, we have to fight this guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, the Russians came and take over, and the economy improves, that's fine with me. Well, that's kind of the point, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> people would be cheering, they'd say, oh, yeah, yeah, well, some people would, you always have people that say no. And, you know, it's questionable whether they should feel that way or not, I couldn't really tell you, actually. Uh, but certainly that type of thing has happened in history before, the Germans and the French have done it all the time. Uh, the Germans were always bailing out the French. They, they were crippling each other's economies and then taking over, you know. And yeah. half the people. Hell, in World War II, the French resistance, everyone has to understand, was really a very small movement. Most of the French didn't have a problem with the Germans. They didn't care because the price of eggs was the same. And they hated the English more. So as long as the Germans were there, at least it kept the English out. Well, is there anything else we should discuss about the Reagan years? Is there anything I'm going to miss here uh, from the 80s flicks? I know there's a shitload of movies that we could talk about, but, you know, we... <laughs> oh, absolutely. I'm sure we'll miss a crap load. I, I suppose we should mention E.T. That one would be very important. Yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah, I keep I keep wondering why I missed that one uh, earlier. Well, I, I would have missed it. It just crossed my mind because it, it completely slipped my mind otherwise. Uh, usually if someone thinks about the Reagan years, and like I said before, you've got your, your evil aliens that come out generally during Republican administrations. Though there are exceptions, uh, some even in the Carter years. And you have the friendlier or more interesting ones that come out during the Democratic years. Well, this is an exception. Uh, E.T. is the ultimate friendly alien movie, or it was for a lot of people. Thon hom, thon hom. Everybody <laughs> loves E.T. How can you not love E.T.? Uh, you know, little kids get to meet E.T., and they take care of him, and he becomes a friend, and they get him back home again. And even the government bad guys, you know, the men in black, they're not E.T.'s enemy either. They want to understand him and figure out what's going on, uh, and we do have to kind of steal him away from them to get him back home, because they'd probably hold on to him till he died. Uh, so in, in a sense, you have a Republican administration showing both good and bad government guys, or good government guys in a bad government setup, or what have you, however you want to put it. And you have a, a very positive image of an alien interacting with human beings. It cuts both ways, I guess. Uh, during yeah, all a little bit. Things. I guess we should talk a little bit because we're doing the E.T. thing here. and We did talk about uh, Close Encounters, and, and hopefully a little bit later we'll talk about the miniseries there, Taken. And I think maybe he's even done another uh, UFO alien movie. But w what's your take on Spielberg in general and just how he's sort of made a lot of these signature UFO movies? And there will always be an endless debate within the... UFO subculture as to how with it or in the know he is to the whole thing. Spielberg could not be more bought in. I mean, just look at him. Uh, you think this guy's going to do anything to rock the boat? He's rich as sin. He's not going to do anything to rock any boat. Because we've already kind of talked about how Close Encounters, you know, may have serious ties to Carter. It just makes you wonder then, like, if... I'm sure he had other big movies before that, but... Jaws. Yeah, there you go. Actually, he had uh, two. He, if you want to go over his career, Sugarland Express was uh, pretty well accepted. It was a good movie, kind of a cult flick, but it was successful enough. He did Duel on TV, which is a very good movie, written by Richard Matheson, who's one of the best writers in this field, and one of the best writers, period. He's just fabulous. Uh, and then he had Jaws. He had a couple little TV movies, uh, which were not bad. They were workmanlike, is the word I like to use. Yeah. Uh, they were effective. They did what they were supposed to do. They weren't bad. But then he had Jaws. Jaws was a huge mega hit, and that launched him. 
I'm imagining my own conspiratorial scenario now. You know, he makes the Jaws movie. It's huge. They're going to make this Alien movie. They get him on board. He realizes that if he plays the game, he'll benefit from untold riches and... You know, Absolutely. The party take, a look at the guy's, take a look at the guy's history. One of his favorite movies, if not his favorite movie, is 2001. I mean, he had private screenings of 2001 all the time. He, he owns a copy of the movie and watches it all the time. He just loves it. Well, who made that, and why do you suppose he made it? Now, Stanley Kubrick was attached to that. It's like passing a torch. You find people who are already simpatico to what you're doing anyway, and those are the people who are already on the inside are going to pass the torch too. Yeah. They're going to say, I know that you feel this way, and I know you're very passionate about it, and as a matter of fact, so am I. I recognize the same feeling. Why don't you help us out? So, we'll help you out. It's just amazing to think about. And, uh, all right, so that kind of closes the book on the Reagan years. We're going to speed a little bit here. And, and in the book, in your book, uh, Hollywood vs. the Aliens, I sensed a sort of lamentation that things hadn't changed when Clinton took over for, I get well, we're completely skipping <laughs> George Bush uh, right. Sr., but hell, that's the Reagan years, too. So we'll, That is the Reagan years, too. The only <laughs> thing that really changed with Bush Sr., uh, they got meaner. The movies were a lot meaner. Where you had alien encounters, so Reagan would tend towards some of the more comical stuff. Uh, Bush didn't. If there was anything other, anything alien, it was, it was evil as hell itself, like Hellraiser. Hellraiser is an abduction movie, basically. And the other is just something you do not want to be exposed to. Because what if the other will destroy you, it will drag you to hell, the most horrible things will happen to you. Stay away from it. And that was pretty much what you got during the Bush years. Before we get into Clinton, I guess, and, 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 the, lament and the lamentation that I mentioned earlier, but this sort of popped into my head when I was listening to what we'd already talked about previously. I'm just trying to, like, wrap my head around sort of a little bit more like the process of how this might have worked in the sense that, like, earlier we talked about how... Nixon was sort of freaked out by sex, and you can kind of see that in the movies. And then, you know, obviously Carter and, and the whole thing about wanting more UFO information out. And we've gone through sort of like how these films are reflected, or reflected the personality of the presidents. I guess I'm just sort of wondering, like, how that trickles down to the movies from the president in a way. Do you know what I mean? Like, you know, I can hear the skeptical people being like, don't they have better things to do than influence movies and, and stuff like that? So I guess... I'm trying hard to form this into a question, but do you kind of see uh, well, where I'm going? I can form it into an answer even before you make it a question. There you go. That's why, that's why you and I are on the same level here. <laughs> very much so. There are very few things more important than influencing the movies. The idea is to influence public opinion. And if you want to influence public opinion at its base level and reach all the way into somebody's soul, you are going to use drama. It's the best possible means that you can use. So, of course, they're going to be interested in that. That's going to be extremely important to them. It's propaganda. Media is propaganda, and entertainment is media. In fact, it's the most important media precisely because it does reach into the soul. It's not someone being told something. It's being made to feel something. You can actually reach inside someone and create a feeling or draw a feeling out of them, and that's what's going to really shape their opinions. Okay. That sort of uh, settles that. It does make a lot of sense when you put it that way. So to sort of piggyback, I guess, a little bit onto that, uh, you're saying that the, the Bush Sr., years were a little darker and more violent, I guess you could say, or sinister of these otherworldly type beings. That kind of makes you wonder, because a lot of people, you know, suggest that he was pretty connected to whatever the base of knowledge is on the inside. So could not you know, be more connected. This he must be really was... freaked out by these aliens. Oh, yeah. He could not be more connected. He was the head of the CIA, for crying out loud. George Bush Sr. is the guy that was actually shredding the MK Ultra documents when the church committee was trying to pull them out. <laughs> wow. He was the guy. He was personally doing it. <laughs> so, yeah, I guess just makes you, you know, if if we're, like, looking at the movies as a window to what they know, it's like, hmm, you know, maybe somewhere along the way after Carter or something, they realized that this thing's bad news, because, like you said, and, and this sort of goes right back to what I was setting up for earlier with the question, that things didn't seem to change uh, when Clinton came into office, and that sort of goes against the previously observed generalization, you know, of Republicans versus Democrats and how the aliens are portrayed. Correct. Or at least that's my take on it. For instance, look at Independence Day, for God's sake. Uh, Independence Day is every 1950s movie rolled into one without the heart and soul, with big, much bigger, splashier special effects, with a little bit more humor and uh, really no soul to it. It's just kind of tossed in front of you. Independence Day is a really bizarre movie, but there they are flashier special effects with a little bit more humor and uh, really no soul to it. It's just kind of tossed in front of you. 
Independence Day is a really bizarre movie. But there they are, the evil aliens. They've come to destroy us all, and we have to stop them. Now, that's kind of typical of what you got throughout most of Quentin. There were exceptions. Men in Black, I think, was an exception. Well, actually, Men in Black definitely was an exception. That was a different take on it. And the best thing, I think, that came out of those movies was showing people behind the scenes dealing with this. For instance, everyone in the organization, in the Men in Black, uh, knows every alien on the planet. There's a lot of them. Is that my third grade teacher? Oh, yeah, she's an alien. I can't wait. <laughs> and, you know, they got lists of all kinds of people. And they talk with some of these people, and some of these people know that they're on to them, and, you know, they work together, they're friends. And I think that's largely what the National Security Agency has been doing since it was created, is keeping files on people who have been abductees uh, and have had some sort of connection with them. At the risk of psychoanalyzing or, or speculating too much, why do you think the, the Clinton years didn't see that drastic change? I wish I could answer that myself. I, I think Clinton was very much, um, well, let's put it this way. John Stewart recently was joking on The Daily Show, and everyone got the joke and laughed uproariously, especially me, that Bush and Clinton had been spending so much time together as ex-presidents that they were getting married in Hawaii. <laughs> You can practically can't fit a piece of paper between them, and, and that amazes me. That actually does amaze me. I don't know if they were always that close, but they really are as ex-presidents. Yeah, I've kind of heard that uh, in recent years, too, that they had been close previous to Clinton becoming president. and thought I'd heard that kind of stuff, but, you know, that's always percolating in the underground, so you never know what. Well, certainly, and I probably wouldn't have believed it at the time. But, you know, later you look at some stuff and say, well, I don't know. <laughs> if it quacks like a duck. Yeah, maybe they were on the same page. Maybe if they were on the same page. Well, ultimately, uh, there are some differences in ideology, definitely, from president to president and from party to party. But ultimately, there are times when party completely disappears. For instance, whatever your take is on it, whether you agree with it or not, the Republicans and the Democrats immediately were in bed together on 9-11. Whatever actually took place, they all got on the same page and said, we're going to do this. They all signed on. And they are still pretty much signed on, with very few exceptions. Yeah. They're all still signed on. It makes you kind of think, too, that maybe one outgoing administration influences like the next. Like we were saying, you know, it sounds like Bush is terrified by this alien thing, so maybe... So Either guess, he's terrified by it, or he wanted to make sure that everyone else was terrified by it, or possibly both. Yeah. So it just, like, makes you wonder, you know, there's only a few people that can really talk about this who are in the know. Presidents, you know, they might talk to each other, and... Bush team could be like, I'm totally freaked out by this, dude. You should be too, to Clinton or something. You know what I mean? So who knows? Well, even if, and, and this is why I was talking a bit about the Carter years especially, and why I brought out the, the negative portrayals during the Carter years as part of the exception, because I thought they were very important. Like I said, I think he was trying to publicize as much as he possibly could. He really did. Uh, he pledged to, to publicize everything he knew about UFOs when he went in, and I believe he meant that. And I think that he did as much as he possibly could in the movies, some of which we've been talking about. But you have things like Demon Seed with, you know, a computer robot rape and artificial insemination producing offspring. And uh, it's very unpleasant. It's an excellent movie, by the way. I recommend it. Yeah. Dated, but, uh, dated and unpleasant, but definitely worth watching. And that's a, a not precisely unrealistic view of what's happening. It's just a really negative spin on it. Uh, if you get actual abductee accounts, it's not quite like that. However, for someone who was just being, uh, for someone being first exposed to it, yeah, it would probably be about that terrifying. <laughs> yeah. I guess the last sort of like big picture theme that's in Hollywood vs. the Aliens uh, that I wanted to bring up here, just that you observe that there may be sort of this curious irony that the CIA, when we're using that sort of as the blanket term for whoever's sure. adding all this uh, stuff into the mix. Alphabet soup. There you go. Their plan to diffuse UFOs over the course of all these decades may eventually or may have already resulted in their ability to actually ever tell the truth because they've polluted the subject so much <laughs> that... They've painted you know, themselves so far into a corner they, they probably can't get out of it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Do you think that's, that's the sort of situation that we're at now as a, as a culture, I guess you'd say? I mean, you know, it's a, it's a kind of... They've created this big problem here. Well, in order to come clean, they would have to come clean about pretty much everything else that they have been lying about, which, of course, is not going to happen. Because once you expose that and everyone figures out how you were covering that up, they're going to figure out how you were covering everything else up, too. So yeah. if, if you were to come clean on that, trust me, boop, 
might as well just open all your files and say, okay, no more secrets. Everybody knows what's going on. So, yeah, they're not going to do that. And so you think maybe, you know, they probably should have told the truth like a long time ago, I guess, then. I, oh, we I don't know. We don't know really, though, because we don't know what the, what the truth is. <laughs> I would love to be able to say yes to that. I understand the sort of quandary that Jimmy Carter was in. Frankly, I understand the sort of quandary that Ronald Reagan was in, and all of them. I understand why they dealt with it the way they dealt with it, recognizing their personalities, recognizing the reality of what was going on behind the scenes, and the sort of people that they were associating with in their administrations and politically and such. I understand why they viewed it the way they viewed it and why they presented it the way that they presented it. We're a bunch of blind men feeling the elephant. Even if you pretty much do know what's going on and pretty much do know what the elephant looks like, everyone feels differently about it. They don't know how to take that. Uh, there are some people, again, we go right back to Men in Black, where uh, Will Smith says, look, uh, we got to tell people about this. And uh, Tommy Lee Jones says, no. He says, well, people are smart. They can, they can take this. And he says, no, they're not. A person is smart. People are dumb. <laughs> Yesterday, you thought there were no aliens. Today, you know there are. Well, it took a long time for people to recognize that the Earth wasn't flat. So, yeah, now you're among those who know, but who are you going to tell? Who are you going to tell who's going to believe you? Yeah, it's quite a quandary. It's quite a strange uh, <laughs> situation we've gotten ourselves into. All right, is there anything else in – obviously, there's a shitload of stuff, but, <laughs> but right. is there anything else in Hollywood versus the aliens that we may have missed that, you know, that uh, you might want to talk about before we start oh, talking about Oh, are you kidding? Tons of shit, but I wouldn't know where to start. Yes, I wouldn't know, where, I wouldn't know where, where one place to start. When we were talking in the early 1950s about getting everything started on the ground, uh, I think I brought up Invaders from Mars, which is one that I really should get into, because Invaders from Mars, which was – now I have to cast my mind back. I want to say 1953, I believe. Mm -hmm. This is – a filmed nightmare movie. This movie scared the crap out of me when I was a kid. They used to show it on TV all the time. And it must have been really scary when it was made years before in the 50s. Uh, it was a color movie. William Cameron Menzies did the sets. Uh, William Cameron Menzies was a very, very famous director. Uh, he was involved with Gone with the Wind. And uh, he did this kind of stark, simplistic, futuristic setting for Martian flying saucers coming to Earth. And they burrow themselves under the ground and they send out these giant robots, or people come walking out into, uh, or they, they don't actually call them robots, I shouldn't say that, they're mutants. They call <laughs> them mutants. But they're these enormous things that wear unitards and have great big, uh, you know, uh, ping pong ball eyes, and they all look exactly the same, and they all kind of move stiffly and bounce around like robots, frankly. And they're bulletproof. Bulletproof, grenade-proof, bomb-proof. You keep knocking them down, they keep getting back up. Yeah. Well, once you go to the sand pit, the earth opens up, sucks you in, the robots, we'll call them robots, the robots pick you up, they knock you out, they put you on a slab, turn you over, and implants put in the back of your neck, and now you're under their control. And you perform acts of sabotage against rocket shots, and you murder people, and do all kinds of horrible things. And as soon as the evil Martians are done with you, they blow the implant up and give you a cerebral hemorrhage. Boom, down you go. Okay, well, this stark UFO setting had not exactly been reported yet. Again, this is 1953. Yeah. Unitard aliens, which are just giant greys, implants, mind control. You have to know this is what the government was thinking at that time. Very much so. And they were portraying it very seriously. Uh, it, it's completely melodramatic. There's not a, a, a cracked smile anywhere in the presentation of this movie. Beautiful color, very well shot. I highly recommend it. People should go back and watch it. If nothing else, it's an interesting history lesson, just to go back and have a look at it. And in fact, on disc, uh, you get not only the American version, but the United Kingdom version, which is slightly different. In the United Kingdom version, they actually put a little bit more uh, science and background about space shots and Mars and all of that. It was quite interesting. Huh. Interesting, yeah. It's weird that they would... See the you can kind of see the difference between the two cultures there. All right, well that's Hollywood versus the aliens, folks. Six hundred pages. Uh, we've just <laughs> we've just talked for a very long time, and as I said way back when we started this conversation, uh, you know the book was published in 1997, so we're talking 12 years have gone by, and and there's been a whole just an amazing sea change in a lot of different aspects of the media. Um, you know, just to name a few off the top of my head, you know we've got 9/11, we've got the internet. We've got reality TV. I mean, those are three things that are huge that have really changed the world uh, since the book came out. So we've got the Internet. We've got 
reality TV. I mean, those are three things that are huge that have really changed the world uh, since the book came out. So I guess to start off our post-book discussion, you know, you spent 600 pages in an amazing amount of time, I'm sure, researching this book, and it finished in 1997, 12 years later. How have you seen sort of what you were looking at progress over those years? How has it changed since the book came out? Well, uh, that's a really good question. I'd say probably the two most influential shows that came out right after my book went to press uh, were Stargate SG-1, which was taking off after Stargate, plainly. Mm -hmm. uh, and at the time, I mentioned it in my book, and I said, well, uh, it's not the huge success like Star Wars that they obviously intended it to be, but it's pretty successful. It's way successful. It's going on its second spinoff in the fall. And the thing ran for, what, like eight or nine seasons. I mean, it just ran for flipping ever. It uh, had a really good cast and very well produced. Pretty impressive overall, and not too terribly unrealistic. I mean, you, for alien implants, they've got alien parasites that take people over. But otherwise, uh, you know, you're fighting ancient astronauts, basically, or the ancient Egyptian gods that created the human race, uh, and they're still around. And not all of them are evil, necessarily, just most of them. Uh, and you've got Cheyenne Mountain. This is a secret project inside Cheyenne Mountain, and some people know about it. And they take care of it. They work on it behind the scenes. It's not a bad show, really. Uh, I didn't talk about it too much at the time because I didn't have cable. I didn't have, well, I didn't have Showtime is what I should say, and that's where it was on. Yeah. It was a pretty new show. Uh, I was apprised of it. I knew what was taking place in it, but I hadn't really watched it yet. Not bad. Uh, the most impressive one, it was very shortly after my book came out, was Roswell. Uh, Roswell is an extremely positive spin, and uh, one of my favorites, actually. I thought they did a pretty good job with it. Uh, it's taking the whole E.T. route, and you've got human ETs. Uh, there are three kids who were from the Roswell crash, and they were in pods and suspended animation, so they came out in, I forget what year, but they're in high school in uh, 1997 or whatever year it was. Uh, so whenever it was, we do the math. Uh, that's when they came out of their pods. And they're three aliens. Uh, they find out before too long that they're aliens, and they keep it secret among themselves because they're afraid of what will happen if it comes out. <laughs> they think the government's going to kidnap them, do horrible things to them, try and find everything out about them, which happens. That happens in the course of the show, and they have to be very careful who they trust. But they're just people. They're interacting with everyone else. They get along. Uh, one of them falls in love with a waitress at a coffee shop whose life he saves. And as a matter of fact, if you see the movie Twilight, it's practically a straight ripoff of Roswell, almost plot point for plot point. Oh, wow. And if, for those who have watched Roswell and those who've seen Twilight, think about it. And I'm not trying to create a copyright issue. I'm just saying. Uh, basically, in Twilight, uh, you have this girl who doesn't know about the vampires, and a car almost crashes into her, and the vampire, boom, lightning speed, rushes over, pushes her out of the way, and boom, stops the car. Well, she can't help but notice something a little unusual about that. And that's how she first finds out who he is, and he eventually reveals himself to her, and they have to keep it secret. The exact same thing happens in Roswell, uh, except Max uh, is in a restaurant when a stray bullet uh, takes out uh, the girl that he happens to be in love with. And she doesn't know it yet, just a waitress there. So he goes over, he heals her, because they're able to do that, and then he breaks some ketchup and sprays it around and puts his finger to his lips, like, don't tell anybody. Because <laughs> they come over, because she'd been seen shot. They knew a bullet had gone into her, they thought it had. Yeah. So he made it look like, oh, a ketchup bottle fell over, you were all just mistaken. And of course she asks him about it later. And he, you know, tries to fob it off as best he can, but it's exactly the same kind of meeting that takes place in Twilight. It's weird. Uh, and largely the same type of thing goes on in the movie that goes on in that series. And I guess this would include also, uh, you know, the decade that we covered here from the book. But did you see any sort of, like, change in information that came out over the years uh, that you think may have come from the inside? It was all pretty much at that base that we talked about at the beginning, you know, that there's a Mars connection, there's an ancient astronaut's connection, the ETs are robots. Um, do you think that anything else well, the might ETs themselves aren't, but what, yeah. what we frequently call those, those are, yes. Right, right. I kind of use them interchangeably, so. Right. Um, but do you think there's anything else that might have come out over the years that, that we should take a second look at? The Capricorn One thing, almost, in a way, too, would be sort of like, you know, maybe that was something that came along a little bit later on, that there was some other information in there that about the moon hoax that we hadn't thought of or something. Oh, sure. You mean like satellite stuff that comes out? Uh, well, you have a movie like, say, Shooter, that just came out recently, which is what? Story Lee Harvey Oswald, pretty much. Uh, difference being that uh, this Lee Harvey Oswald is a crack shot, and he's been hired to take the fall because everyone's going to believe that he's it. Uh, yeah, you see satellite stuff coming out in lots of movies over the years, I think. Now, what do you mean by satellite stuff? 
Well, it's not dealing with UFOs specifically. Oh, okay, but it, okay. But it does deal with uh, secret information and kind of getting it out there. For that matter, uh, the Manchurian Candidate's an excellent call. The Manchurian Candidate ties in directly with the alien stuff, actually. Uh, that, the story behind the movie is far more fascinating than the movie itself, and the movie's great. Uh, both versions are actually pretty good. The first one's a classic. Uh, the story behind this, you got a bunch of guys in the Korean War. Of course, it's Iraq in the remake. Uh, they disappeared for a weekend. They don't really remember what happened to them. They just kind of are fuzzy. But they do remember that their sergeant, Raymond Shaw, wow, what a guy. He's just the best guy who ever lived. He saved all of our lives. He held all these guys off. Man, is he incredible. But the funny thing is, every single guy that says that couldn't stand Raymond Shaw. He was the most horrible person they ever knew in their entire life. He was the most unlovable person who ever lived. <laughs> but if anyone asks them about him, they say, oh, what a great guy. He's incredible. They go slack-jawed, and they look at you with this, these blank expressions, say, he's the most, kind of most wonderful man I ever met in my entire life. And then they snap back to normal, like they don't even know what they said. Well, and they all have nightmares. They're all suffering from these recurring nightmares. And in the nightmare, they're all sitting in some familiar setting, and there's all the guys in their platoon with them. And, uh, for instance, there's this one black guy. He's in a uh, church setting, and there are these nice black women there who are talking among each other like they're having a social. And uh, the soldier, who's very much a soldier, sees himself in a friendly military setting. Uh, everyone's got their own individual setting that they're seeing here. Yeah. But in, while they're listening to the conversation and just kind of looking around, occasionally they'll see some Russian guy in a uniform or some Chinese guy standing in the background, and then it's just kind of gone as soon as it was there. And the conversation is really bizarre, because the conversation that's taking place is, well, you will notice the subject is now behaving in X fashion. If I do this with the subject, the subject will respond in this particular way. Uh, would you please show me? Why, yes. Um, private, how do you feel about the corporal sitting next to you? I like him just fine, sir. I want you to take this scarf and strangle him to death. And he does. And then he wakes up screaming. Well, every single person in the platoon has had an experience like this. And one of them starts figuring out what's going on when he sees the valet to the sergeant, some guy that they knew uh, in Korea. He was one of their informers in Korea, and he catches up with Raymond Shaw in the States. And now that same guy is his valet. And he knows this guy had something to do with it. He beats him up. And the army arrests him, and they bring him on in, and they say, what the hell was that all about? And he says, okay, look, I don't know what the hell happened to us in Korea, but I am telling you, that guy has something to do with it, and somebody fucked with us. And the military are all kind of looking at him on the panel, and they say, okay, look, we want you to check some pictures out for us, and uh, just point anyone out that looks familiar to you. And they flash some slides for him, and he, he selects two people, and he says, those guys are in my nightmares every single time. And they stop, and they very seriously ponder, and one of them finally says, well, that guy is a Russian mind control expert, and this guy is a Chinese mind control expert, and you guys were kidnapped, and you have been programmed. What we have to find out is why. Now, Raymond Shaw happens to be the guy who's their best programmed candidate, and what he has been programmed to do is to assassinate a presidential candidate so that someone else gets into office. And the person that he is getting into office is a total communist sympathizer. So we're going to have a red Chinese and Russian sympathetic president in the White House. Now, bearing in mind this is 1962, 1963, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. You might as well still have been in uh, Eisenhower's years. Yeah. That same type of feeling. We were terrified of communism. Oh my Jesus, this would be the end of the world. And it is a very nefarious plot, and it is extremely well dramatized. And it is entirely credible. It is also directly connected to the UFO subject in the subject of mind control and what it's being used for. In fact, in the movie, and I believe this is also in the book, uh, there's a scene where the captain who's investigating all this and has started putting it all together meets this woman on a train who becomes his love interest. And she, in the, out of nowhere, in the middle of the movie, tells this story where she says, you know, when I was a kid, I used to say that I was probably landed here on a, a crashed spaceship from Mars. What the hell is that doing in there? It's just tossed in, out of nowhere. Yeah. There's another point where Raymond Shaw suddenly gets a phone call. And as soon as he gets the phone call, he goes a little slack-jawed. He just disappears, walks out, doesn't say a word, goes to a pre-arranged pre location. And there are the red Chinese guys. And they say, hi, Raymond, how are you doing? And it's just...
jawed. He just disappears, walks out, doesn't say a word, goes to a pre-arranged pre location. And there are the red Chinese guys. And they say, hi, Raymond, how are you doing? And he says, just fine, sir. He says, lie down, Raymond, we just need to check you out. Okay, sir. And they're just checking him out and doing a little bit of medical examination. They ask him a few questions. And while they're doing it, the Chinese guy is saying, well, we have to do this every couple of years just to make sure that we keep the connections going, so to speak. Well, the time he gives is two years. Two years is also the period of a Martian opposition. Could be coincidence, yes, but mighty interesting. Yeah, it does sound like that movie's ripe for esoteric... Uh stuff that's hidden in there. Now, obviously, people didn't really know about uh, the MK Ultra thing at that time when the, when the movie came out originally. Exactly. That program was still in operation at the time that that movie came out, and it was not known. It was not publicized. MK Ultra was not publicized until the late 1970s when the church committee, the Senate committee, started getting all of the MK Ultra documents. They were doing investigation into CIA abuses. MK Ultra was top of that list, pretty much, and they got a lot of documents out. A former senator, and senator named John Marks wrote a book called In Search of the Manchurian Candidate, as a matter of fact, or The Search for the Manchurian Candidate. Excellent book. He quotes a lot of the documents and uh, shows how it was done. One thing I did kind of find interesting that maybe you can shed some light on was uh, you kind of alluded to this in the – when you were talking just now about Men in Black was how you know they kind of showed them behind the scenes. Do you think that sort of portrayal changed over the years where you know what the government knew – the story changed as the years went on where, you know, maybe back in the day it was like they were trying to figure it out. And now it's like the government's known all along and it's sort of oh, like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very much so. Now, I think the government figured it all. This is where it gets to be a parlor game. Once you understand the joke and you've kind of gotten it all together, then you start looking over the evidence and saying, OK, who knew what and when and how did they deal with it? Well, in 1960, uh, the first head of the CIA, uh, Admiral Hillencoder, I can't remember his first name now. I think it was Roscoe. Anyway, he uh, retired from service, uh, and in 1960, when he did that, his recommendation to the CIA was that everything that they knew about UFOs should be brought forth openly in front of Congress and discussed and, and be made known to the public. Yeah. In other words, let's put it out there. Let's talk about it. Well, hard to say. Uh, if you cast your mind back, uh, how would the world have changed if they actually did that? Uh, one way, you can kind of see that in some Japanese movies, as a matter of fact, because practically every Japanese movie that has flying saucers in it, and that's most of them, you always have the UN, and people get up in front of the UN, and they're openly talking about flying saucers. They're saying, well, they're coming down, they're performing mind control on us, abducting people, and they do this. Uh, they're, they're picking people up, performing mind control on them, they're sabotaging us, yeah, 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 they're a big threat, we have to do something about them. And you have a United Nations team getting together and coming up with ways to combat the evil flying saucer menace. Uh, that's pretty much every Japanese movie that's made that has flying saucers in it, <laughs> at, at least the early ones back in the 1960s, 50s and 60s, uh, along with abductions. They do abductions of mind control and all this other kind of thing. Yeah. To sort of like throw back a little bit to what I was saying, almost makes you wonder if they at some point were like, you know, maybe we should also see the idea to these people who are watching the movies that we've known all along. So when eventually they find out that we've known all along, they'll already, you know what I mean? Kind of like Absolutely. what we're saying with the UFO thing. Absolutely. At such time as they finally decide they want to come clean. My own personal belief on that is that that will happen when they land on the White House lawn or wherever else they land publicly and make themselves known. But as soon as that happens, you better believe every government in the entire world is going to rush to the microphones and the cameras and say, we knew all along, we knew all along, we knew all along. We were protecting you. We were waiting to tell you. Now you know. Don't you love us? You feel different about us now, don't you? Right, right. And it's almost like uh, well, always there's going to always be these staunch, you know, anti-UFO people. But but it seems like almost the the attitude of a lot of people is just that the just that just that the government's known all along and they're not telling us. So what's the point in even getting too worked up about it or looking into it? Well, it has and it hasn't. The best way to figure out how secrets are handled by the government is to look at the history of how secrets have been handled by the government. Who knew about the atomic bomb? President of the United States, General Leslie Groves, who was in charge of the project and the Secretary of State, I believe it was. They were the only ones that knew. The rest were just the scientists working on it. No one else in Congress knew. They were not told. And the Vice President did not know. Truman was not informed until after the President died. Then he was informed, and they said, what do you want to do with this? <laughs> so that's how secret it was, and that's how it was handled. Yeah. Uh, you have to imagine they did pretty much the same thing with UFOs. The atomic bomb was pretty serious stuff. That was going to be about the biggest secret you were going to see. And the next biggest secret after that was definitely going to be UFOs, which were tied directly in with atomic bombs. 
Yeah, it's quite a lot to wrap your mind around. Now, as we said, we, the book came out in 1997. I guess it's like a two-pronged question. We sort of joked around earlier, like, where you been, Bruce? But have you thought about doing another book, even if it's not on the Hollywood aspect of the UFO phenomenon? I know you wrote the Architects book earlier. You know, um, do you have anything in the works since 97? Because, I mean, this book's amazing, and I'm really looking forward to reading Architects. So, you know, I, I wish you'd do some more stuff. Well, yes and no. Uh, I write plays mostly. There's no avenue for them either. I just do it because I like writing plays. I'm good at it. I think I'm good at it. And I have... Um, I've written papers, more or less, but I really haven't published them anywhere. Uh, and my friends are always bothering me to write a book about masons and pirates, because the Brethren of the Coast, as the pirates called themselves back in the Golden Age, were masons, which I can pretty well prove. Uh, the real problem is it would make a great chapter in a book on pirates, but I don't know how to make a whole book out of it, to tell you the truth. Okay, okay. Was there any sort of, like, deliberate decision on your part to... Now, we kind of, like I said, we kind of joked about this, but I do want to, you know, get into, you know, like where you've been and, and you haven't done too many interviews or anything like that since, like I said, like the year 2000, so. Nobody asks. I don't <laughs> think how many people have read my books, to tell you the truth. Well, I'm glad that the uh, the listeners there planted the seed to get you on the show because this has been an amazing conversation. Oh, I've done having time of my life. This is great. Yeah, well, you should think about a re-release of the book updated covering the next 12 years of, of the stuff. If there were a market in that, see, that's not even my call. Uh, my publisher, you have to realize we haven't gone through even 5,000 in uh, the second book. Oh, wow. Uh, we haven't gone in 10,000 on the first. The first is considered a bestseller by my publisher. My bank account would not know that. <laughs> but it, it hasn't even gone 10,000 copies in, what, 12, 13 years now. Uh, the second book has not sold 5,000 copies. I don't know how many it has, but uh, it, it just hasn't sold at all. It gets 10 times the publicity, but uh, it just doesn't sell. Weird, weird. Well, people are afraid to read, <laughs> you know. Yeah, or they've just stopped reading. Yeah. I think mostly they read uh, what they're going to get off the Internet, and, and I don't slam the Internet like most people do. Actually, the Internet is not a bad place to get material, but uh, you want to take it as the first word, not the last word. When you're doing research on the net, take notes and uh, find out what notes they're using and track down the written material and kind of check it there. But it's a great place to pick up information just for a start. Yeah, yeah. So there's no, like, reason why you kind of went off the grid of, of the UFO thing. I don't blame – like oh, no. I said earlier, I don't blame you. I mean, fuck. <laughs> if I could well, find a way to unplug myself from the grid at this point, I think I would. But, you know, that's why I, I sometimes think uh, that you're in an enviable position. But there wasn't any sort of like we were, like, fed up with the UFO field or anything like that. Oh, no. Uh, I have uh, – you mentioned the last interview I gave was in 2000. That's probably correct. I kind of lose track of these things. You, you just don't think about it every day. Uh, it has been a while, I know that. If you say that's what it was, you're probably right. I have given probably two, maybe three talks at conventions after that, and they've been small conventions, MUFON, for instance. And you get a mixed bag when you go to a UFO convention. It really depends on who you're talking to. Probably the best group that I talked to, ironically, and this does amaze me, was in Denver. Uh, the Denver UFO Society, which has the unenviable acronym of DOOFUS, but <laughs> they are actually extremely well read, or at least they were when I was talking with them. Uh, I never had to go on into any, any background at all on UFO stuff. If I mentioned, say, uh, the Washington Nationals, they knew exactly what I was talking about. They could quote it right back to me. And that was true on everything that I mentioned. So I said, good, these guys have actually done their homework. They know what's going on. And they were a very receptive audience. Uh, you go into MUFON, on the other hand, and it sort of depends where you're at. Like, I went to MUFON in Orange County. Uh, and, again, I would not have expected this, but most of the people that were in the audience in MUFON, Orange County, were very receptive, uh, very intelligent, and had done a lot of research. There were also quite a few nuts in the bunch. Uh, I gave a talk at the Denver MUFON thing, and that was, like, way different. Uh, they just, I didn't get the impression that they were as receptive, or if they were, they had too many people that were kind of disruptive in the ranks. Uh, when you give a talk to a UFO bunch, uh, they're almost the least receptive people that you can talk to. Anyone in a UFO group has already made up their mind before they walk in the door what they believe. Yeah. They do not want to hear anything that contradicts what they already believe. The only difference between me and them, I have made up my mind also, but I've studied it very, very thoroughly. And if someone were to present some sort of conflicting evidence that I could believe, then I would certainly weigh that into the equation. 
But most of these people have done a smattering of research, and they've simply made up their minds on what it is. So if you say anything that contradicts that, they have already tuned you out, and they're already hostile to you. And that's just the way it is. So they're very, very hard to talk to. Yeah, yeah. And you can extend that also to, you know, just the online UFO scene, which is rife with that kind of stuff. Oh, sure. Well, and the, one of the things that the government was concerned about when they were first talking about this was, what's the religious reaction? Online UFO scene, which is rife with that kind of stuff. Oh, sure. Well, and the, one of the things that the government was concerned about when they were first talking about this was, what's the religious reaction going to be on this? And if you go on the net, my God, just type some general stuff in about UFOs, and 90% of the pages you come up with are going to be religious pages, and they're saying, oh, my God, it's the devil come to earth, and see, this passage here says that, and this passage here says that, and it's the devil, and uh, he's here to destroy Jesus in flying saucers. Okay, whatever, man. I don't know what to tell you. If you want to get serious about this and do some research, let's do it, but get the Bible out of it, and if you're going to bring the Bible into it, bring it in seriously, and let's examine it historically, okay? Nice, nice. I guess just to put a bow here on the timeline, that we've been talking about, we, we sort of uh, have established that Clinton, of the same vein, I guess you'd say, really, uh, of the preceding two presidents, did you see much change in the Bush 42 years or whatever the fuck uh, they're calling him now? <laughs> yes, he went the same direction as his dad, uh, interestingly enough. Uh, what you got was the, the really heavy-duty evil others. You didn't see a whole lot of stuff about UFOs per se. What you saw was the other, the outsider, and it was usually something satanic. Uh, something, you know, evil. Yeah. You know, evil. And, and so can <laughs> Jesus. It's evil. Uh, other stuff's evil. Uh, so, yeah, he was kind of going on that angle. There was a movie that came out called They, I think it was, if I remember right, which is just about these horrible things that come to you when you fall asleep and drag you away into another world. Pretty much all the stuff that came out during his administration was like that. There was one in particular, Darkness Falls, which I just loved. That was a fun movie. It bombed. Everyone hated it, except me. Uh, I've got a copy of it. I just love it. I pop it in every now and then and watch it. Uh, in this particular movie, you've got this evil entity called the Tooth Fairy, which their explanation for is she's some woman who was lynched by a town a uh, hundred years ago, and ever since, some wraith of her has come back and takes kids' teeth. And if you see her, oh God. then she just puts the mark on you, and she's going to follow you around for as long as you live until she kills you. She's going to whip you up in the sky, tear you to pieces, do horrible things to you. Jesus. And she wears this mask that looks exactly like a UFO gray. And in fact, in the movie, they call attention to it because he's got like an, an image of a UFO gray and a picture of the mask right next to it. So they're very plainly drawing the connection there. Uh, she comes at night, uh, completely in the darkness, preferably when you're alone, but not always, swoops in out of the dark, drags you away, does horrible things to you, and that's the last anyone ever sees of you again. Period. You die. The marks on you. You die. Yikes. I'm sure it's way too early, really, to, to start thinking about where it'll go now with the new president, but do you have any I, any idea or, or theories, I guess you'd say, on, on you know what we might see in the future? I am very anxious to find that out for myself, truthfully. I, I have a good feeling about this guy. Um, I'm kind of curious where he's going to go. Uh, they just passed the uh, the legislation with the FDA on cigarettes today. I yeah. understand. It. I like smoking myself, okay? Uh, I, ju I do. <laughs> Straight up. Uh, I'm not an actual smoker, per se, but I like to smoke. And I don't have any problem with smoking. But I've always thought that they should be under control of the FDA. Because uh, the thing that's really killing you is all these horrible additives that they stick in the damn things. Mm -hmm. So take them out. Well, just today they passed this legislation where they literally did absolutely everything that for years I've been wanting them to do. I said, damn, they hit the, the entire laundry list. They got it all. They're not banning it. Uh, they're not destroying it. What they're trying to do is, is actually make it safer, truthfully. Uh, they want to put it under FDA control where it should be so that if you are going to do it, you're at least not going to have arsenic and other stuff tossed in on your cigarettes. That's a great idea. Why the hell didn't we do this a long time ago? Yeah. So having seen that, uh, I have to say I'm impressed. I, uh, I've seen some other things that make me questionable. For instance, he's still toting all the old party lines as far as getting involved in the Middle East and who we're going to be bombing and all that. So, yeah, uh, verdict is definitely out, but I'm definitely giving him a chance also. Well, let's just say he's kind of won me over in some regards. Okay. Look at this. Alien Abductions, a 12-step recovery handbook. This is a joke. Not to people in AAAA. <laughs> but, Dharma, this is not something you believe in, right? Well, it's not really a subjective thing, Greg. It's science. Dharma, it, it is not science. Come on, I mean, 
UFOs? Oh, those are for people in pickup trucks on dirt roads that, you know, done seed it with their own two eyes. You're listening to Banal of America Audio. Do you really believe that there are little guys like this flying around the planet? Like this? No, of course not. They're in ships. <laughs> no, those are weather balloons or, or atmospheric phenomena or, or pie plates on strings. Honey, if you have some evidence you would like to show me, I'd be willing to have an open mind, unlike some people. <laughs> okay, so just so that I know what I'm up against, uh, where do you stand on the Easter Bunny? Well, I ain't seen it with my own two eyes, Greg, but how do you explain them chocolate eggs? We have a bunch of movies here that uh, the good folks at the official BOA forum, the USV.com, uh, submitted to me that uh, came out after the book, and they didn't know they were going to be uh, brought up here during the show, so they'll either be happy about that or mad. I'm not sure yet. <laughs> Probably depending on my take on it. What was that? It sucked. It's my favorite movie, you bastard. But before we get to those, I want to touch on two sort of genres, I guess you could say. First, well, you did sort of talk about this a little bit. Uh, way back earlier, when you were talking about the movie they made of the Bud Hopkins abduction book. Intruders. Right. Just the overall sort of idea or the question is, you know, what's your take on these movies that have been made that are based on esoteric books or events? You know, Fire in the Sky, I think they made a communion one. Obviously, Roswell, the movie, not so much the TV series. Um, and I'm sure there's other ones that I'm forgetting, but... Uh, you know, there's a sort of different situation there where they don't have to see the information. It's already there. So at that point, they can kind of tinker with the information and reshape the story, if you will. So I guess... Or, that, yeah, and, or, and it kind of depends on who their source is. For instance, uh, I think he was the president of the Sci-Fi Channel at the time, and I can't think of his name, but he, he was behind pretty much all the programming on the Sci-Fi Channel at the time that I wrote my book, mm -hmm. uh, which was, well, let me think, what, 96, 97, 98, right in there. Yeah. Uh, when all the stuff that you're talking about came out. Dark Skies, for instance. Uh, Dark Skies is a very entertaining show with not a lick of truth in it anywhere. And the information that he came out with for that, he was getting, he said himself that he was getting it from shadowy inside sources, uh, like two or three people who he believed as credible. Uh, they revealed themselves and said, hey, we're the guys on the inside. I'm telling you what actually went down, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he put it into a series, which is laughably wrong in practically every detail that it comes out with. Forget UFOs, it's wrong on everything. Just any single thing that it brings out. It's like, no, that didn't happen, that didn't happen, that didn't happen, and I don't know where the hell you came up with it. <laughs> you, know, you think everyone is this stupid, or if you just don't do any homework, but you're not paying attention, and it's just not remotely credible. Which doesn't mean it isn't entertaining. It was very well produced. Yeah, yeah, it makes you wonder if that was just his way of trying to generate buzz or something like that, or if he was really being lied to. Oh, I'm positive he was being lied to. If he was actually accepting this information from the inside sources, I can tell you who his inside source was. It was William Cooper. I'm positive of it. Uh, because everything that he came out with in his series came straight out of William Cooper. Well, William Cooper is the least believable guy you could ever come up with. Speaking of which, he came to a very odd end. Uh, William Cooper was a one-armed man who worked for the Navy in the Office of Naval Intelligence. Now, he will tell you this in his own Behold the Pale Horse book. Mm -hmm. He claims that since he started blowing the whistle on the evil alien conspiracy and the people on the world that are in, in cahoots with aliens, etc. and so forth, that all of his former buddies are trying to kill him. Well, he says that at one point. At another point, he says he's only worked since he left o the ONI uh, with people in the ONI, <laughs> his, former, <laughs> his former friends. Say, well, where do you hide from him during office hours, man? The broom closet? Uh, which, what am I supposed to believe here? Are they out to kill you or are they hiring you? So I, I just can't believe the guy. Uh, he says he was in a hospital bed at the time that Kennedy was shot, and that he saw it on TV, and he very plainly saw Kennedy's driver turn around and shoot him with a pistol, which they show in Dark Skies, obligingly. But the point is, it never happened. We've got the Zapruder film. It didn't happen, and he couldn't possibly be telling the truth, because nobody saw that on TV the day that he was shot. The TV's blacked out across the country before, that, before the shots were fired. No one saw it, so he's just plainly lying to you. Well, he doesn't do it just on that. He does it on a number of things, and he's just one of those guys that the more you read him, you say, this is shit. I don't know why the hell you're trying to sell me this, but this is shit. Uh, see, I just don't take him seriously. In fact, now and then, when I'm bored, I have his book. He's very smart. He knew that guys like me would buy it anyway for one very simple reason. This thing is worth a million laughs. When you get bored, just open it up at random and read for a few minutes, and you'll laugh if you know anything about any of this stuff. Yeah, it's quite a book. I still get people asking me about it, and I hear about it all the time. It's got a weird underground cult cachet of some kind, probably because he died and everything and all that. It's the way he died. 
Now, this is one of those things where, do you know how he died? Uh, I've heard about it, but I don't remember it well enough to really speak to it. Well, now, this is the story. And mind you, I don't have everything on the story either. I was getting this at the time it happened off the web, and I mean off of newspapers on the web. Uh, and the story was... Bud Hopkins had been threatened by William Cooper. William Cooper was threatening Bud Hopkins' life and apparently following him around. Uh, he'd sent him letters. The story was Bud Hopkins had been threatened by William Cooper. William Cooper was threatening Bud Hopkins' life and apparently following him around. Uh, he'd sent him letters, you know, death threat letters and all this type of thing, and law enforcement got involved, obviously. Well, at some point, law enforcement went to arrest William Cooper, or at least to go and talk with him, and I don't know who fired first, <laughs> but bullets were exchanged, and guess who came out the worst for wear? Probably the one-armed guy who couldn't carry quite as many weapons at the same time. Now, what really went down? I could not tell you. I don't know if he was set up. I don't know if he was really a nut. I don't know what the circumstance is. All I know is that this really bizarre guy who wrote this entirely unbelievable book and was in the Office of Naval Intelligence got shot dead. Now, you may read that any way you like, but that's what went down. Yeah, it is uh, quite, a, quite a character and quite a story there. Now, what about the Fire in the Sky movie? That was a big kind of event at the time uh, when it came out. And I've heard all kinds of different, you know, takes on it that, you know, they made it unrealistic and they changed things and, and that kind of stuff and it just makes you wonder, like, why? why? Way changed things. Way changed things. Now, the first part of that movie is actually pretty accurate. Everything up to the abduction itself, pretty much accurate the way that uh, it was told. But Travis Walton never said anything about evil reptilian aliens wearing spacesuits, shrink wrapping him, and sticking needles in his eye with, you know, partially eaten human remains hanging by, which is what you see in the movie. Not one word of that in Travis Walton. Nothing remotely like that. His experience was completely benign. Nothing horrible happened to him at all. Uh, he, the actual Travis Walton story, his story, he woke up, he was on a slab in the neutral setting that has now become quite familiar. The little gray guys were around him. He freaked. He went, ah, and they all ran away. They ran around a corner or something, and he ran <laughs> the other direction. Well, then he kind of wandered around in this ship, which he described it was fairly empty looking, but there was some machinery in it here and there. And at one point, he came across uh, a man and a woman. Uh, they looked rather kind of the ones that are called the Swedes frequently in the reports. Yeah. They were blonde, and they were wearing blue spacesuits, pretty much like the spacesuits that we wear, with the helmets and the whole nine yards. They never said a word to him. They smiled. Uh, they sort of escorted him around and pointed a few things out. That's happened in a couple of UFO reports also. And then he sort of blacked out again. And the next thing he knew, he was walking down the road. It was a week later, and everyone said, where the hell have you been? My God, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, that's the whole Travis Walton story right there. That's all of it. No needles in the eye, no shrink wrap, no eaten human remains, no space suits. In fact, he thought that the greys might be robots and said so. Uh, but none of that's in the movie. What you get in the movie, and Tracy Torme is one of the guys that wrote the screenplay to this movie. Tracy Torme, who also was an executive producer of that movie, was a guy who sat in on a lot of Bud Hopkins' uh, hypnotic regression sessions with actual abductees. Now, where the hell does someone who's been listening to actual abductee stories that have not come out like this, not any of them have come out and said anything like this. But here it is in the movie, and he protests innocence and says, and I'm, you know, I'm not getting in a pissing match with Tracy Torme. I don't know the man, but this is a serious question. How the hell do you put crap like that in a movie where you know that is not true? You know for a fact that that's a straight-up lie. What are you doing sticking that in there and then trying to pretend that you don't know? I know you know. You sat in on Bud Hopkins' hypno -reg regression sessions. You're the executive producer of this. Don't tell me you don't have a say in what goes in the script. All right, you want to make it scary so that people will watch it. I understand that. I don't have a problem with that. But hey, <laughs> <laughs> what are you trying to do, man? Um, and you sort of just planted a seat here for a question just based on what we've established here, what do you think, and I'm starting to agree with you here about the E.T. Greys being aliens, I mean being uh, being robots. What's your take on uh, these the, the Nordic kind that get reported? I think those are the people sending them. Those are the ones that made them. And they're probably not the only ones. Uh, for all we know, they've got as many races out there as we have down here. I have no reason not to believe that. But frequently, the Swedes or the Nordics are the ones that are reported when they're actually seen. If that's actually them, we don't know. But yeah. there seems to be some sort of connection, yes. Okay. Now, the only other uh, little sort of genre I want to talk about, and we don't have to beat this one to death, it's just sort of like the kind of ironic thing where, like, every decade, it seems, there's a TV show that's about an alien 
living in America under the radar and trying to blend in and everything. You've got like Mark and Mindy, right? Right, and then you have Alf, and then the the Third yep. Rock from the Sun series. Yep, which you know, and I never mentioned Third Rock anywhere in my book because I I completely didn't even know about it. That's how far I was off from watching uh, mainline TV at the time. Yeah. I just didn't even know it existed. Then I came across it, and I said, oh, my God, I can't believe I didn't know about this. Have you seen that show? Because I really like oh, it. Oh, sure. Yeah, it's pretty funny. <laughs> it's especially funny when William Chatner comes on. Oh, yeah, yeah, he's great on that. I'm surprised there hasn't been, like, a new – that's been off the air for, like, since almost since the book came out. We need to go out to Hollywood, you and I, and pitch an ALF for the new millennium. <laughs> oh, dude, I've got so many ideas I would love to toss on these guys' desks. Say, why the hell aren't you doing this? <laughs> what is the matter with you, for God's sake? We like Capricorn 1? Great. You know what? I wouldn't have thought about that if someone hadn't brought it up. Uh, yeah, that thing is so ripe for a remake, I can't tell you. Um, the first one was not that good. I mean, it was fairly entertaining and it was fun, but it really wasn't that good. It needs to be remade. Absolutely. I would love to see that. The only other like genre that has come along since the book came out, and I, I don't know how well it really would apply to your thesis about the education program it's just like this whole reality tv thing that's that's happened since the year 2000 do you see any elements of the education program at work in that i see experiments in influencing public opinion which you do see when it comes to ufo material as a matter of fact i mentioned the ho the uh, tv shows they, they seem to air on wgn you may read into that whatever you will that just seems to be where they always popped up yeah uh, Bill Bixby frequently hosted them. There was one that had to do with the, the strawberry ice cream show, as it was derogatorily called, mm -hmm. that brought out the aviary story of the E.T. that survived Roswell, and uh, it was alive for a while, and we learned a few things from it, and it loved strawberry ice cream. Uh, and, of course, you have these shadowy sources with masked uh, voices and hidden faces and all this other type of thing. And this goes on for two hours. And Bill Bixby is hosting this thing the entire time. And, and it's all pretty damned outlandish. But what he's doing the entire time that that show is on, because he's got a live audience there. And while all this is going on, before the show starts, he says, well, how many of you believe there might be aliens? And, you know, he's getting some, some sort of response from the audience. And as the show progresses, he's saying, how many of you think there might be aliens? And, of course, the number's increasing. And then it gets to the end, and he literally says, now, how many of you think there might be aliens? Of course, the whole audience, yeah, 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 yeah. So I think these are experiments to, to uh, see how well you can mold public opinion in such an environment, the salesman environment. Yeah. And that's largely what reality TV is. Reality TV is nothing new. Do you remember All-Star Wrestling? We still have World Wrestling Federation. Oh, yeah. All-Star Wrestling is as fake as it comes. Come on. <laughs> I know people who still believe it's real, and I laugh at them, <laughs> even, even friends of mine. And uh, they'll actually try and convince me it's real and say, come off it. Dude, I've seen the camera pull back where there's supposed to be a fence outside. You can see the studio behind them and two guys holding the fence piece up. How could you believe this? <laughs> and it's just transparent. But there are people who do. And, and it's, it's just entertainment. It's just staged. They want to see what they can get away with and how many people are going to buy it. Reality TV, very much the same thing. And, uh, any reality TV... Your audience has to know this. I've been in theater for a long time. I'm not stupid. This is all scripted. They don't hand them an actual script where you memorize lines. They give them a scenario. Uh, you saw the Blair Witch Project, right? Yeah. A form of reality TV. Only they're telling us straight up front, this is not real. We have faked this. But that entire movie was done by scenario. Uh, in that particular case, before they even shot, they said, look, this is what the basic story is. We haven't made it all up ourselves yet. What we want you guys to do is just go from point to point, and each day you're going to pick up a little canister that has whatever we have new in the scenario for you to play, and play it out. Just, you know, act it out among each other. Use your own words and play it out. They even use their own names. The actors use their own names for the character names. Yeah. Okay, well, it can be pretty damned convincing, actually. Uh, and I think the Blair Witch Project, they did do a very good job. There are times where every now and then it might look a little bit phony, but for the most part, they're pretty realistic. Uh, it works pretty well. Scenario acting is not a bad way to go. But in reality TV, that's what you see all the time. They give them a basic scenario. Say, okay, you look, you're the couple. Uh, you're going to have a fight at this particular point, uh, break up over whatever, and uh, a couple episodes down the line, we're going to bring it back together again. They prearrange all this shit. <laughs> now, what do you think of the – it's sort of like a mixed reality magazine-style show, but it's sort of like the big talk of uh, the UFO community right now, and that's UFO Hunters. Have you had a chance to check that out and looked into that at all? Is that like Ghost Hunters? Uh, not exactly. It's sort of like a combination. I've only seen a few episodes of it, to be honest with you, so I'm going to give it a rough version here, but it's sort of like – Is it the thing that's on Discovery Channel? I think it's on History Channel. History Channel. Yeah, they, they investigate UFO cases, like famous UFO cases. 
and you know, and then they go and sort of like invest. If you haven't seen it, I mean, there's no. <laughs> and I've heard about it. I've never actually watched it myself. Uh, as soon as you say hunters, I'm automatically thinking ghost hunters, which is as fake as they come. Yeah, yeah. I'm not a big fan of ghost hunters at all. It's uh, kind of lousy. Uh, so. Yeah, it's you know, remotely entertaining if you happen to be in the right mood, but it's it's not remotely credible. Right. Well, that's the annoying part, just that it got so big and everything, and it's like, ugh, why, why are all these people jumping on ghost hunters when, like... But it's, it's not remotely credible. Right. Well, that's the annoying part, just that it got so big and everything, and it's like, ugh, why, why are all these people jumping on ghost hunters when, like... There's so much more interesting other stuff out there than running around in the dark, but I guess, you know, <laughs> you're like a teenager. scaring people. Exactly. And no one ever lost money making a horror movie, man. You cannot lose money making a horror movie. If you want to make bank, make a horror movie. Even if it bombs, you are going to make money. That's true. Let's talk a little bit about some of these movies that the folks sent in, and, and they cover pretty much, you know, all these years, and, and we won't do all of them, obviously. Uh, we'll, I'll try and stay within the realm of uh, the UFO field and what we've been discussing here in our conversation and and the first one's the starship troopers sure what do you think of that because i kind of liked it a lot and it was interesting in in the way almost kind of how we're just talking about the way they film this stuff a little bit sort of like documentary style it was kind of you know what i think they were really preparing everybody for iraq you got this big desert war we got the surprise attack oh my god the terror attack boom iraq just destroyed my city people i know died you killed my brother i get you back and, you know, everyone's recruiting and running off to join. And, you know, they're, getting everyone, they're getting everyone ready for a desert war in Iraq or Afghanistan. Interesting. Okay. All right. How about Contact? What do you think of that? Contact is kind of a mixed grab bag. Uh, there are some slight differences between the book and the movie. Uh, it's not a bad movie, actually. Carl Sagan, of course, wrote this thing. And speaking of uh, Capricorn 1, what exactly was he trying to tell us? Because what happens in this is uh, one person out of this bunch has a, a, an actual abduction experience, and there is no other way to describe that. And they are able to relate it to everyone else. They have met an outside intelligence. They're able to relay it to everyone else. Nobody believes them. And before they go out there, in the book, they're given this briefing beforehand saying, you don't talk about this. It's going to stay quiet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You shut the fuck up. <laughs> and that's, I think, pretty much what happened with the astronauts for the most part. It's a lot of the Capricorn One thing. Say, well, you have to tell everyone, oh, well, you can't do that. Well, we have to. You can't do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're just going to lean on you, man. Uh, they're going to put enough pressure on you. If they don't want you to talk about it, you ain't going to talk about it. How about uh, Mission to Mars? Yeah, that's the one with the face on Mars, right? Yeah. yeah. Not a bad movie. Well, it's interesting you brought up Robert Heinlein, because Robert Heinlein was a government physicist, of all things. And uh, Brian De Palma, I don't exactly know what the connection is. I believe he has a, is his brother, his cousin. He's got someone who's like a government physicist connected in his family. Oh, wow. I cannot give you the particulars on that. This has been relayed to me. And I certainly didn't know it at the time I wrote my book. However, and, and I'm also not a big fan of Brian De Palma. Sorry, Brian. Uh, he made two or three movies that I thought were very good, and the rest of them are, he always does that damn split screen, and it just throws everyone straight out of the action. You can't watch it anymore. Yeah. Uh, but that was not a bad movie. It was over long, and uh, turgid, I think, is the right word. Uh, and it's a special effects were spotty. But I, he was trying to call attention to Mars and a previous civilization being there and the possibility that we might be able to join them, which I think is extremely interesting. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now, obviously, he could just be playing off of, of public perceptions, but I find it interesting that, that it is now becoming that much of a public perception, that people are beginning to accept it. Yeah, that raises the whole idea, you know, that, like, at some point, when does the seating stop? from the insiders, and at what point does it become such, so ingrained into the ethos of the mainstream that you don't know... That no one even questions it anymore, right. Right. It's like, where's the line drawn? Where It's so blurry between, you know, did they get this information from insiders, or was this, you know, something they heard on coast to coast? It's like, you don't really know anymore. Well, the funny thing about that, and bear in mind, I believe this is the case. I believe that civilization did come from Mars, and that there's still people there. However, one can make the case that this is some sort of government conspiracy, and certainly Picknett and Prince did in the Stargate conspiracy. Uh, they think this is all some orchestrated campaign to get everyone to believe this, and it isn't true. Uh, I disagree with them. I think there's something to it, and I do believe it's real. But I understand why they come up with that particular point of view and why they think someone's trying to sell them. They are. Someone is trying to sell them. The question is, is it legitimate or not? Is it real or not? Uh, and that's something that you just have to decide for yourself on the basis of uh, your own research. Yeah, it's really interesting because that one really was richly esoteric and really kind of laid it out there on the table. And, and, and face on Mars, I mean, we're talking earlier about the moon hoax and how that's the, the bastard child of uh, 
of esoterica. I mean, you know, Face on Mars is like right right there next to it almost as far as, you know, theories that, that sort of get shit on all the time by the mainstream. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But then it makes you wonder, like, the ones that get persecuted the most, <laughs> you know, well, maybe it, they're the ones that have the most merit to it. Yes and no. It's a really dicey bag. Uh, for instance, um, Jack the Ripper, was he a mason? That's become so mainstream now that practically everybody accepts it. The actual evidence for it, there is some Masonic evidence at uh, a couple of the murder sites. That's to be admitted, and it can't simply be dismissed. However, there's not a shred of evidence that William Gull, who's usually who they point out, uh, the, the royal physician going about and doing this, he couldn't have done it. The man had had a stroke before that time. Uh, he was paralyzed on one side of his body. He was in his 70s, and he wasn't strong enough to knife a kitten. He just <laughs> couldn't have done it. There's no way. And the entire... The uh, fundamental underpinning of this is that there was a royal bastard that was born that was Catholic that the uh, queen couldn't have acknowledged. They could still acknowledge it, or they didn't have to acknowledge it and raise it in secret. There was no reason to go about and commit some sort of murder. Uh, not to mention, I, I do actually have a little bit of difficulty imagining the queen ordering a bunch of private murders like that. Not too much. It is possible. I would not reject it. But there's really no evidence to believe any of this. However, uh, Stephen Knight brought it out as a theory back in the 1970s. Uh, I'd read his book. Uh, I forget what name of it was now, uh, but the Masonic Ripper or something like that. And uh, he laid it out and made it very credible. It was like, a lot like the Bill Bixby show with strawberry ice cream aliens. Now, how many of you believe? And uh, he does make a convincing case, except when you go back and analyze the particulars, they don't fall together. Which is not to say that there's not some evidence there that could link it to someone who knew something about masonry. So is it real or is it not? I can't tell you. All I can tell you is there is some evidence there. All right. Now, another movie that uh, they mentioned here on the forum is The Fifth Element. I've only seen parts of that, so I can't speak to it too well. But uh, there are a lot of esoteric themes in it, I'm, I presume. Well, the, the one in particular, uh, I just love the movie, first off. Uh, it, despite Eddie Esoteric, I just love the movie. Now, right at the beginning of the movie, you have this particular monk, I guess you could say, uh, Ian Holm, who is aware uh, he's working for a secret brotherhood, basically. And the secret brotherhood obviously stretches all the way back to ancient Egypt because that's where he encounters them. That's where he goes to talk to them. They're underground in Egypt. And the race that he's talking to down there very much look like robots. I mean, they're mechanical, and they talk like this. <laughs> I mean, they're robots. But he's in their brotherhood, and he's carrying on the secret tradition, so to speak. So in that sense, yes, there's kind of an esoteric alien connection, if you will, stretching back to ancient Egypt, seated in there. Yeah, it all sort of comes together uh, the more you think about it. Now, what about Battlefield Earth? I know it's based on the, uh, <laughs> based on that uh, L. Ron, L. Ron Hubbard, Hubbard stuff, and it's really kind of weird. You almost wonder if this is like a nine type situation that really took off uh, the whole L. Ron Hubbard thing, because I mean they're they're intense with the way they are. I guess I don't want to. L. Ron that. Hubbard is a major can of worms. L. Ron Hubbard was mixed up with Aleister Crowley and uh, Jack Parsons, uh, who created the Jet Propulsion Lab, Caltech. Mm -hmm. And by the way, the rocket fuel that took us to the moon, whether it was manned or not, the rocket fuel that took us to the moon came from ancient alchemical formulas. That is not a secret. It just isn't advertised. Uh, and that was Jack Parsons that was coming up with that stuff. And here he is mixed up with the OTO and Aleister Crowley, and L. Ron Hubbard jumps into the mix. L. Ron Hubbard had been in naval intelligence. Uh, the story goes that someone bet him that he couldn't create a religion, or he said he could create a religion, or something like that. And, well, here we have it. Now, I've just made all kinds of enemies, and probably even more friends. Uh, <laughs> I still like Tom Cruise movies. i got nothing against you, Tom. Uh, I just watched The Last Samurai. Damn, that was good. Uh, so, you know, not trying to start a fight with anybody. I don't believe it. I think it's all crap. But uh, there's old Ron Hubbard mixed in the middle of all this. What I do find interesting, when uh, the book came out, and it's not a very good book. I haven't read it. I just read bits and pieces of it. It's very badly written. That's purely an aesthetic view. What's his name now? John Travolta. You know, the other big Scientologist. Mm -hmm. I love this book. I have to do this book. <laughs> uh, he's just madly in love with this book. This is his life's dream. It is his ambition from the moment he reads this book to produce it as a movie. What is it, 50, 60 million dollars later, and I think 15 years or so later, this is the result. I can't believe that anyone who was seriously trying to do something well could come up with this. I don't know what went wrong, but every single thing in it is, is laughable beyond words. Mind you, I love that movie. That is one of my favorite movies to plug in the DVD player and just laugh. You want to have a bad movie night? 
there's a classic choice. That and Ghost of Mars. Put those two as a double feature. Well, I don't know. That might be cruel and unusual punishment. Uh, <laughs> but if you watch them on separate nights, I have this, this is like a party game. It's sort of an informal poll I've had going. Which movie is worse? Ghosts of Mars, Battlefield Earth. And the general consensus is, you know, it's not apples and oranges, but it's just too close to call. We'll talk a little bit about Ghosts of Mars, because uh, you said kind of that, that uh, it was an attempt to do the third movie of the Nigel... Apples and oranges, but it's just too close to call. We'll talk a little bit about Ghosts of Mars, because uh, you said kind of that, that uh, it was an attempt to do the third movie of the Nigel Neal yes. Mass series. Well, John Carpenter, and this is another one of those, John Carpenter, I love most of your movies. This is definitely not one of them. Very entertaining, but uh, boy, way off, man. <laughs> it's just awful. He is a big fan of Nigel Neal, and he is especially a fan of Five Million Years to Earth, which was the one we talked about with uh, Mars and Professor Quatermass discovering them landing here and all of that. Yeah. The Ancient Martians story. Mm -hmm. He loves that. He has wanted to remake that for ages. Well, ultimately, he didn't end up remaking that. What he ended up making was Ghosts of Mars and, uh, what was that one, Prince of Darkness. Uh, Prince of Darkness was kind of based on Nigel Neal-type stuff. He doesn't do the Nigel Neal-type stuff really well. Probably not the best area for him. Although, I have to admit, I kind of enjoy Prince of Darkness. It's fun. I enjoy Ghost of Mars for what it is. And, uh, and what is Ghost of Mars? Because I don't even think I've seen it. So I guess <laughs> talk a little bit about it and what the esoteric messages that uh, you know might be in there or at least attempts it at that kind of Well, thing. first off, it is entertaining. And it is worth watching so long as, well, you're not going to have to be told it's a bad movie. You'll figure that out on your own. But it's an <laughs> extremely handsomely produced bad movie. Uh, it's got a nice budget to it. It's got a gorgeous look. You could take any still from that movie and hang it on your wall and be proud, just like The Shining. But, just like The Shining, it's a piece of crap if you put it all together and watch it. The story behind this, uh, removing multiple idiocies that have no reason to be there, but the basic story is that we're on Mars. Someone opened up a mine on Mars. There was a civilization there. The evil green gas comes up from Mars, people breathe it, now they are Martians. They have become infected by Martians, and they are now basically Martians themselves. They then become Uga Chaka zombies. Uh, that's one of my favorite things, because literally, they're standing there with these spears, they start painting themselves up like Aborigines. Don't ask me why. Do not ask logic in this movie anywhere. It does not exist. There's a hot air balloon on Mars. Why? There's a matriarchy on Mars. Why? None of this stuff makes sense. Anyway, they become Uga Chaka zombies. They paint themselves up in this aboriginal stuff, and they've got spears. They went, Uga Chaka, Uga, Uga, Uga Chaka. I'm, I'm serious. They're actually doing this. Now, I think Carpenter probably did that on purpose, just as a, a sort of a homage to see who was actually paying attention. So I'm not going to knock that one too much, but it was fun. Uh, and they attack everyone who isn't like them, just like... Um, in five million years to Earth. You got half of the people who become infected by Martians and become Martians, and the other half are in other enemies and must be killed. Well, the explanation for this in the movie, this would not have been a bad movie if it had just been done right. The explanation for this is that as a planetary defense system, the Martians left this stuff behind. So if there were ever any invaders, uh, the Martians could repel them in exactly this fashion. You are strangers on our planet. You are not supposed to be here. Die, motherfuckers. <laughs> Not a bad plot, really. Could work pretty well. All right. Uh, I'm going to skip around here a little bit. What about signs? That whole thing with the uh, crop circles. You don't see too many crop circles pop up in movies, but I do think that was sort of like an alien movie uh, sign. Oh, very much so, yeah. It, you know, it was sort of well-intentioned War of the Worlds homage. I kind of like it. It's entertaining. Uh, certainly its fundamental premise was absurd. And they made fun of it in Scary Movie where they asked the same thing that everyone in the audience did, which is, they can travel light years to another planet, but they can't get through a wooden door? Yeah. There's something wrong with this. Plus, uh, I, well, they've probably all seen it by now anyway. For those of you who don't want to know how the movie ends, tune out for a few seconds. Uh, obviously, you got a bunch of aliens who come to Earth, and what's their mortal weakness? Water! So the first place I would go is a planet made of it. Exactly, yeah. I'm going to jump around a little bit chronologically, but what about uh, War of the Worlds, the remake? I mean, we talked about the original War of the Worlds, and it's like... Well, I, I just praised Tom Cruise, whose religion I do not believe in. I just praised Tom Cruise in The Last Samurai. Uh, i got to say, War of the Worlds, not so good. Uh, I, I understand what they were trying to do. The tripods? Wow! Those were cool. Worth the price of admission just to see the Martian tripods. And it's not exactly unfaithful to the book. Um, 
just different aspects of the book than usually come out in, in that story. It's okay. I wasn't that crazy about it. I think they were, you'll notice they didn't call the Martians in that. They're just aliens. Oh, okay, yeah. I, they actually I, removed the whole Mars thing from it, which I thought was odd. Yeah, that is interesting. Well, maybe they're trying to condition people to be more Mars friendly. <laughs> I'm sort of curious about that myself. And the funny thing is, if you want to pick classic Martians, I mean, classic bad guys, you can always go to Nazis. Nazis never fall out of favor for bad guys. And we need bad guys. What are we going to do? Nazis! Okay, drag them out. <laughs> They're perennial. You can never lose with the Nazis. You want that? They dress well. They got the sharp outfits. They're horrible. They got the best looking weapons. They're clean and precise and evil. They, there's, everyone hates them. So you can always trot the Nazis out, although they're, they're starting to get a little tread worn, I have to say. Uh, and like Spielberg, who never tires of Nazis, I wonder why. He keeps dragging them out, and uh, then we drag out uh, the next big threat with the new Indiana Jones thing, speaking of aliens, and uh, now it's the Russians, of course. Yeah, yeah. The Martians fit right in there. The, the funny thing in the Indiana Jones thing, they set it all up, uh, and they were plainly going for the ancient astronauts and aliens and all that, and they set up Mars completely, and then just, like, Punted it straight out of the field. The nope, plainly another dimension. No planets involved at all. They just came from the space between spaces. What are you, nuts? This movie would have been good if you'd gone ahead and played it out full. <laughs> There's a lot here, other movies that are sort of esoteric, but we're going to try and stay in the UFO realm. So I guess I'll just ask you, of the, you know, post-97, after the book came out, up until today, other than the movies we've talked about, have there been movies, you know, that you've seen where this light bulb goes off in your head, where you're like, you know, that's Hollywood versus the aliens. There's something going on here with this flick. Oh, absolutely. Well, there was one in particular, actually. It's Hellboy, because uh, there's a line in there that practically came from the very uh, end of the first section of my first book, and I was quite pleased, I have to admit. There's a spot. I don't want to spoil things for people that haven't seen them yet. Uh, there's a spot in there where Professor Broom, the, the whole thing behind Hellboy, it's a lot like Men in Black. Yeah. You've got this secret occult uh, business in the background that knows a lot of stuff that the rest of the public doesn't, because they're the guys that study that, and they go out and deal with it. Well, in this Nazi occult conspiracy, with the Russians, Rasputin gets dragged in too. Entirely inaccurate, but my is it entertaining and very well performed. There's this one evil Nazi German bad guy who is just indestructible. He's bulletproof, and he will rip the shit out of you if you come anywhere near him. And he's pretty much undead. No one can figure out what the hell he is. <laughs> At one point, Professor Broom gets a hold of him, and he's doing an autopsy on him. And the guy's pretty much a zombie. Uh, he's a robot for all practical intents and purposes. He's got mechanical parts. And he, he's analyzing it, and he says... Well, I found the puppet. Now, where's the puppet master? And that's when he meets Rasputin. Well, that's exactly the line I ended my uh, the first section of my book with, so I was quite pleased. <laughs> All right, so Hellboy is one that you think was... Uh... Oh, yeah, I loved Hellboy. I actually didn't like the second one. I thought the second one was just, eh. Although it kind of fits into the same territory. What you're dealing with is, you know, the, the elven race, quote-unquote. Anytime you're dealing with some other race, and they're sort of human-like, and there's a lot of history that they had with the human race, uh, there's some sort of an esoteric connection there, yes. You'll find that going back all the way in esoteric brotherhoods. Absolutely, yeah. Now, what about uh, Taken, the Spielberg miniseries? I thought that was one of the best UFO series, I guess. It was sort of like just a one-off thing. I really enjoyed it quite a bit. Have you seen it, and what did you think of it? Well, that one, I whip out my sword, now we attack. No, actually, I thought it was epic junk. I understand why it was appealing. Uh, I know a lot of people that watched it and kind of got sucked into it. Uh, but I, basically, I thought it was junk, except uh, the one thing that I thought it portrayed very well um, was the behind-the-scenes bit with uh, the government. Yeah. And you had basically the George Bush character. They're very plainly setting him up to be that. Uh, who's been sitting on all this information for a very long time and trying to keep it secret because that's where you get your power from. That much of it I thought was actually fairly accurate, and I will admit there were some very good performances in it. Uh, it was extremely handsomely produced, no question. Um, the performers were very appealing, uh, and some interesting ones put in there that most people don't see very often. I, what's her name? Heather from uh, Blair Witch was one of them. Emily Birdle. How many people in the audience know who Emily Birdle is? Well, she was very appealing in that, and there were lots of other people, too. It was kind of interesting in that regard. The problem with it was nothing in it really made sense. It's trying to suck you in and get some sort of emotional response out of you, 
and give the impression that there's some big epic overarching thing. But there's absolutely nothing tied together with anything, and nothing really makes sense at the end of the day. All that happens is, well, uh, a couple of people got abducted, uh, they had sex in space, and they had a typical Steven Spielberg wonder child. How you're going to respond to that is going to depend on how well you respond to Steven Spielberg wonder children. <laughs> if you like Steven Spielberg wonder children, you're going to love it. If you don't like Steven Spielberg wonder children or you're simply tired of them, then you're probably not going to like it too much. Uh, they've gotten a little bit threadbare for me. Let me see. Any other stuff you want to talk about as far as TV shows, movies? Uh, I was going to mention Lost here. What do you think of that? Yeah, I know you're kind of kind of on the on the lost bandwagon. 